Desperate Remedies By Thomas Hardy Part 1 I The Events of Thirty Years December and January In the long and intricately inwrought chain of circumstance which renders worthy of record some experiences of Cytheria Gray, Edward Springrove, and others, the first event directly influencing the issue was a Christmas visit. In the above-mentioned year, Ambrose Gray, a young architect who had just begun the practice of his profession in the Midland town of Hosbridge, to the north of Christminster, went to London to spend the Christmas holidays with a friend who lived in Bloomsbury. They had gone up to Cambridge in the same year, and, after graduating together, Huntway, the friend, had taken orders. Gray was handsome, frank, and gentle. He had a quality of thought which, exercised on homeliness, was humor, on nature, picturesqueness, on abstractions, poetry. Being, as a rule, broadcast, it was all three. Of the wickedness of the world he was too forgetful. To discover evil in a new friend is to most people only an additional experience, to him it was ever a surprise. While in London he became acquainted with a retired officer in the Navy named Bradley, who, with his wife and their daughter, lived in a street not far from Russell Square. Though they were in no more than comfortable circumstances, the captain's wife came of an ancient family whose genealogical tree was interlaced with some of the most illustrious and well-known in the kingdom. The young lady, their daughter, seemed to Gray by far the most beautiful and queenly being he had ever beheld. She was about nineteen or twenty, and her name was Cytherea. In truth she was not so very unlike country girls of that type of beauty, except in one respect. She was perfect in her manner and bearing, and they were not. A mere distinguishing peculiarity, by catching the eye, is often read as the pervading characteristic, and she appeared to him no less than perfection throughout transcending her rural rivals in very nature. Gray did a thing the blissfulness of which was only eclipsed by its hazardousness. He loved her at first sight. His introductions had led him into contact with Cytherea and her parents two or three times on the first week of his arrival in London, an accident and a lover's contrivance brought them together as frequently the week following. The parents liked young Gray, and having few friends for their equals in blood were their superiors in position, he was received on very generous terms. His passion for Cytherea grew not only strong, but ineffably exalted, she, without positively encouraging him, tacitly assented to his schemes for being near her. Her father and mother seemed to have lost all confidence in nobility of birth, without money to give effect to its presence, and looked upon the budding consequence of the young people's reciprocal glances with placidity, if not actual favor. Gray's whole impassioned dream terminated in a sad and unaccountable episode. After passing through three weeks of sweet experience, he had arrived at the last stage a kind of moral Gaza before plunging into an emotional desert. The second week in January had come round, and it was necessary for the young architect to leave town. Throughout his acquaintanceship with the lady of his heart there had been this marked peculiarity in her love, she had delighted in his presence as a sweetheart should do yet from first to last she had repressed all recognition of the true nature of the thread which drew them together, blinding herself to its meaning and only natural tendency, and appearing to dread his announcement of them. The present seemed enough for her without cumulative hope, usually, even if love is in itself an end, it must be regarded as a beginning to be enjoyed. In spite of evasions as an obstacle, and in consequence of them as a spur, he would put the matter off no longer. It was evening. He took her into a little conservatory on the landing, and there among the evergreens, by the light of a few tiny lamps, infinitely enhancing the freshness and beauty of the leaves, he made the declaration of a love as fresh and beautiful as they. My love my darling, be my wife. She seemed like one just awakened. Ah we must part now she faltered, in a voice of anguish. I will write to you. She loosened her hand and rushed away. In a wild fever Gray went home and watched for the next morning. Who shall express his misery and wonder when a note containing these words was put into his hand? Goodbye, goodbye forever. As recognized lovers something divides us eternally. Forgive me I should have told you before, but your love was sweet never mention me. That very day, and as it seemed, 
to put an end to a painful condition of things, daughter and parents left London to pay off a promised visit to a relative in a western county. No message or letter of entreaty could wring from her any explanation. She begged him not to follow her, and the most bewildering point was that her father and mother appeared, from the tone of a letter Grey received from them, as vexed and sad as he at this sudden renunciation. One thing was plain, without admitting her reason as valid, they knew what that reason was, and did not intend to reveal it. A week from that day Ambrose Grey left his friend Huntway's house and saw no more of the love he mourned. From time to time his friend answered any inquiry Grey made by letter respecting her. But very poor food to a lover is intelligence of a mistress filtered through a friend. Huntway could tell nothing definitely. He said he believed there had been some prior flirtation between Cytheria and her cousin, an officer of the line, two or three years before Grey met her, which had suddenly been terminated by the cousin's departure for India and the young ladies travelling on the continent with her parents the whole of the ensuing summer, on account of delicate health. Eventually Huntway said that circumstances had rendered Gray's attachment more hopeless still. Cytheria's mother had unexpectedly inherited a large fortune in estates in the west of England by the rapid fall of some intervening lives. This had caused their removal from the small house in Bloomsbury, and, as it appeared, a renunciation of their old friends in that quarter. Young Grey concluded that his Cytheria had forgotten him and his love. But he could not forget her. From two. Eight years later, feeling lonely and depressed a man without relatives, with many acquaintances but no friends Ambrose Grey met a young lady of a different kind, fairly endowed with money and good gifts. As to caring very deeply for another woman after the loss of Cytheria, it was an absolute impossibility with him. With all. The beautiful things of the earth become more dear as they elude pursuit, but with some nature's utter illusion is the one special event which will make a passing love permanent forever. This second young lady and Grey were married. That he did not, first or last, love his wife as he should have done, was known to all, but few knew that his unmanageable heart could never be weaned from useless repining at the loss of its first idol. His character to some extent deteriorated as emotional constitutions will under the long sense of disappointment at having missed their imagined destiny. And thus, though naturally of a gentle and pleasant disposition, he grew to be not so tenderly regarded by his acquaintances as it is the lot of some of those persons to be. The winning and sanguine receptivity of his early life developed by degrees a moody nervousness, and when not picturing prospects drawn from baseless hope he was the victim of indescribable depression. The practical issue of such a condition was improvidence, originally almost an unconscious improvidence, for every debt incurred had been mentally paid off with a religious exactness from the treasures of expectation before mentioned. But as years revolved, the same course was continued from the lack of spirit sufficient for shifting out of an old groove when it has been found to lead to disaster. In the year his wife died, leaving him a widower with two children. The elder, a son named Owen, now just turned seventeen, was taken from school, and initiated as pupil to the profession of architect in his father's office. The remaining child was a daughter, and Owen's junior by a year. Her Christian name was Cytheria, and it is easy to guess why. October the 12th We pass over two years in order to reach the next cardinal event of these persons' lives. The scene is still the Grey's native town of Hosbridge but as it appeared on a Monday afternoon in the month of October. The weather was sunny and dry, but the ancient borough was to be seen wearing one of its least attractive aspects. First on account of the time. It was that stagnant hour of the twenty-four when the practical garishness of day, having escaped from the fresh long shadows and enlivening newness of the morning, has not yet made any perceptible advance towards acquiring those mellow and soothing tones which grace its decline. Next. It was that stage in the progress of the week when business which, carried on under the gables of an old country place, is not devoid of a romantic sparkle was well nigh extinguished. Lastly, the town was intentionally bent upon being attractive by exhibiting to an influx of visitors the local talent for dramatic recitation, and provincial towns trying to be lively are the dullest of dull things. Little towns are like little children in this respect that they interest most when they are enacting native peculiarities unconscious of beholders. 
discovering themselves to be watched they attempt to be entertaining by putting on an antic, and produce disagreeable caricatures which spoil them. The weather-stained clock face in the low church tower standing at the intersection of the three chief streets was expressing half-past two to the town hall opposite, where the much-talked-of reading from Shakespeare was about to begin. The doors were open, and those persons who had already assembled within the building were noticing the entrance of the newcomers silently criticizing their dress questioning the genuineness of their teeth and hair estimating their private means. Among these later ones came an exceptional young maiden who glowed amid the dullness like a single bright red poppy in a field of brown stubble. She wore an elegant dark jacket, lavender dress, hat with grey strings and trimmings, and gloves of a colour to harmonise. She lightly walked up the side passage of the room, cast a slight glance around, and entered the seat pointed out to her. The young girl was Cytheria Gray, her age was now about eighteen. During her entry, and at various times whilst sitting in her seat and listening to the reader on the platform, her personal appearance formed an interesting subject of study for several neighbouring eyes. Her face was exceedingly attractive, though artistically less perfect than her figure, which approached unusually near to the standard of faultlessness. But even this feature of hers yielded the palm to the gracefulness of her movement, which was fascinating and delightful to an extreme degree. Indeed, motion was her speciality, whether shown on its most extended scale of bodily progression, or minutely, as in the uplifting of her eyelids, the bending of her fingers, the pouting of her lip. The carriage of her head motion within motion a glide upon a glide was as delicate as that of a magnetic needle. And this flexibility and elasticity had never been taught her by rule, nor even been acquired by observation, but, nullo cultu, had naturally developed itself with her years. In childhood, a stone or stalk in the way, which had been the inevitable occasion of a fall to her playmates, had usually left her safe and upright on her feet after the narrowest escape by oscillations and whirls for the preservation of her balance. At mixed Christmas parties, when she numbered but twelve or thirteen years, and was heartily despised on that account by lads who deemed themselves men, her apt lightness in the dance covered this incompleteness in her womanhood, and compelled the self-same youths in spite of resolutions to seize upon her childish figure as a partner whom they could not afford to contemn. And in later years, when the instincts of her sex had shown her this point as the best and rarest feature in her external self, she was not found wanting in attention to the cultivation of finish in its details. Her hair rested gaily upon her shoulders in curls and was of a shining corn yellow in the highlights, deepening to a definite nut brown as each curl wound round into the shade. She had eyes of a sapphire hue, though rather darker than the gem ordinarily appears, they possessed the affectionate and liquid sparkle of loyalty and good faith as distinguishable from that harder brightness which seems to express faithfulness only to the object confronting them. But to attempt to gain a view of her or indeed of any fascinating woman from a measured category, is as difficult as to appreciate the effect of a landscape by exploring it at night with a lantern or of a full chord of music by piping the notes in succession. Nevertheless it may readily be believed from the description here ventured, that among the many winning phases of her aspect, these were particularly striking. During pleasant doubt, when her eyes brightened stealthily and smiled as eyes will smile as distinctly as her lips, and in the space of a single instant expressed clearly the whole round of degrees of expectancy which lie over the wide expanse between yet and nay. During the telling of a secret, which was involuntarily accompanied by a sudden minute start, an ecstatic pressure of the listener's arm, side, or neck, as the position and degree of intimacy dictated. When anxiously regarding one who possessed her affections, she suddenly assumed the last mentioned bearing in the progress of the present entertainment. Her glance was directed out of the window. Why the particulars of a young lady's presence at a very mediocre performance were prevented from dropping into the oblivion which their intrinsic insignificance would naturally have involved why they were remembered and individualized by herself and others through after years was simply that she unknowingly stood, as it were, upon the extreme posterior edge of a tract in her life, in which the real meaning of taking thought had never been known. 
It was the last hour of experience she ever enjoyed with a mind entirely free from a knowledge of that labyrinth into which she stepped immediately afterwards to continue a perplexed course along its mazes for the greater portion of twenty-nine subsequent months. The town hall, in which Cytheria sat, was a building of brown stone, and through one of the windows could be seen from the interior of the room the housetops and chimneys of the adjacent street, and also the upper part of a neighbouring church spire now in course of completion under the superintendence of Miss Gray's father, the architect to the work. That the top of this spire should be visible from her position in the room was a fact which Cytheria's idling eyes had discovered with some interest, and she was now engaged in watching the scene that was being enacted about its airy summit. Round the conical stonework rose a cage of scaffolding against the blue sky, and upon this stood five men four in clothes as white as the new erection clothes beneath their hands the fifth in the ordinary dark suit of a gentleman. The four working men in white were three masons and a mason's laborer. The fifth man was the architect, Mr. Gray. He had been giving directions as it seemed, and retiring as far as the narrow footway allowed, stood perfectly still. The picture thus presented to a spectator in the town hall was curious and striking. It was an illuminated miniature, framed in by the dark margin of the window, the keen-edged shoddiness of which emphasized by contrast the softness of the objects enclosed. The height of the spire was about 120 feet, and the five men engaged thereon seemed entirely removed from the sphere and experiences of ordinary human beings. They appeared little larger than pigeons, and made their tiny movements with a soft, spirit-like silentness. One idea above all others was conveyed to the mind of a person on the ground by their aspect, namely, concentration of purpose, that they were indifferent to even unconscious of the distracted world beneath them, and all that moved upon it. They never looked off the scaffolding. Then one of them turned, it was Mr. Gray. Again he stood motionless, with attention to the operations of the others. He appeared to be lost in reflection, and had directed his face towards a new stone they were lifting. Why does he stand like that? The young lady thought at length up to that moment as listless and careless as one of the ancient Tarentines, who, on such an afternoon as this, watched from the theatre the entry into their harbour of a power that overturned the state. She moved herself uneasily. I wish he would come down, she whispered, still gazing at the sky-backed picture. It is so dangerous to be absent-minded up there. When she had done murmuring the words her father indecisively laid hold of one of the scaffold poles, as if to test its strength, then let it go and stepped back. In stepping, his foot slipped. An instant of doubling forward and sideways, and he reeled off into the air, immediately disappearing downwards. His agonized daughter rose to her feet by a convulsive movement. Her lips parted, and she gasped for breath. She could utter no sound. One by one the people about her, unconscious of what had happened, turned their heads and inquiry and alarm became visible upon their faces at the sight of the poor child. A moment longer, and she fell to the floor. The next impression of which Cytheria had any consciousness was of being carried from a strange vehicle across the pavement to the steps of her own house by her brother and an older man. Recollection of what had passed evolved itself an instant later and just as they entered the door through which another and sadder burden had been carried but a few instants before her eyes caught sight of the southwestern sky, and, without heeding, saw white sunlight shining in shaft-like lines from a rift in a slaty cloud. Emotions will attach themselves to scenes that are simultaneous however foreign in essence these scenes may be as chemical waters will crystallize on twigs and wires. Even after that time any mental agony brought less vividly to Cytheria's mind the scene from the town hall windows than sunlight streaming in shaft-like lines. October the 19th When death enters a house, an element of sadness and an element of horror accompany it. Sadness, from the death itself, horror, from the clouds of blackness we designedly labor to introduce. The funeral had taken place. Depressed, yet resolved in his demeanor, Owen Gray sat before his father's private escritoire, engaged in turning out and unfolding a heterogeneous collection of papers forbidding and inharmonious to the eye at all times most of all to one under the influence of a great grief. 
Lamini of white paper tied with twine were indiscriminately intermixed with other white papers bounded by black edges these with blue fool's cap wrapped round with crude red tape. The bulk of these letters, bills, and other documents were submitted to a careful examination, by which the appended particulars were ascertained. First, that their father's income from professional sources had been very small, amounting to not more than half their expenditure, and that his own and his wife's property, upon which he had relied for the balance, had been sunk and lost in unwise loans to unscrupulous men, who had traded upon their fathers too. Open-hearted trustfulness. Second, that finding his mistake, he had endeavored to regain his standing by the illusory path of speculation. The most notable instance of this was the following. He had been induced, when it Plymouth in the autumn of the previous year, to venture all his spare capital on the bottomry security of an Italian brig which had put into the harbour in distress. The profit was to be considerable, so was the risk. There turned out to be no security. Whatever the circumstances of the case tendered it the most unfortunate speculation that a man like himself ignorant of all such matters could possibly engage in. The vessel went down, and all Mr. Gray's money with it. Third, that these failures had left him burdened with debts he knew not how to meet, so that at the time of his death even the few pounds lying to his account at the bank were his only in name. Fourth, that the loss of his wife two years earlier had awakened him to a keen sense of his blindness, and of his duty by his children. He had then resolved to reinstate by unflagging zeal in the pursuit of his profession, and by no speculation, at least a portion of the little fortune he had let go. Cytheria was frequently at her brother's elbow during these examinations. She often remarked sadly, Poor Papa failed to fulfill his good intention for want of time, didn't he, Owen? And there was an excuse for his past, though he never would claim it. I never forget that original disheartening blow, and how that from it sprang all the ills of his life everything connected with his gloom, and the lassitude in business we used so often to see about him. I remember what he said once, returned the brother, when I sat up late with him. He said, Owen, don't love too blindly, blindly you will love if you love at all, but a little care is still possible to a well-disciplined heart. May that heart be yours as it was not mine, father said. Cultivate the art of renunciation. And I am going to, Cytheria. And once Mama said that an excellent woman was Papa's ruin, because he did not know the way to give her up when he had lost her. I wonder where she is now, Owen? We were told not to try to find out anything about her. Papa never told us her name, did he? That was by her own request, I believe. But never mind her, she was not our mother. The love affair which had been Ambrose Gray's disheartening blow was precisely of that nature which lads take little account of, but girls ponder in their hearts. From October the 19th to July the 9th. Thus Ambrose Gray's good intentions with regard to the reintegration of his property had scarcely taken tangible form when his sudden death put them forever out of his power. Heavy bills, showing the extent of his obligations, tumbled in immediately upon the heels of the funeral from quarters previously unheard and unthought of. Thus pressed, a bill was filed in chancery to have the assets, such as they were, administered by the court. What will become of us now, thought Owen continually. There is in us an unquenchable expectation, which at the gloomiest time persists in inferring that because we are ourselves, there must be a special future in store for us, though our nature and antecedents to the remotest particular have been common to thousands. Thus to Cytheria and Owen Gray the question how their lives would end seemed the deepest of possible enigmas. To others who knew their position equally well with themselves the question was the easiest that could be asked like those of other people similarly circumstanced. Then Owen held a consultation with his sister to come to some decision on their future course, and a month was passed in waiting for answers to letters, and in the examination of schemes more or less futile. Sudden hopes that were rainbows to the sight proved but mists to the touch. In the meantime, 
unpleasant remarks, disguise them as some well-meaning people might, were floating around them every day. The undoubted truth, that they were the children of a dreamer who let slip away every farthing of his money and ran into debt with his neighbors that the daughter had been brought up to no profession that the son who had, had made no progress in it, and might come to the dogs could not from the nature of things be wrapped up in silence in order that it might not hurt their feelings, and as a matter of fact, it greeted their ears in some form or other wherever they went. Their few acquaintances passed them hurriedly. Ancient pot wallopers, and thriving shopkeepers, in their intervals of leisure, stood at their shop doors their toes hanging over the edge of the step, and their obese waists hanging over their toes and in discourses with friends on the pavement, formulated the course of the improvident, and reduced the children's prospects to a shadow-like attenuation. The sons of these men who wore breastpins of a sarcastic kind, and smoked humorous pipes stared at Cytherea with a stare unmitigated by any of the respect that had formerly softened it. Now it is a noticeable fact that we do not much mind what men think of us, or what humiliating secret they discover of our means, parentage, or object, provided that each thinks and acts thereupon in isolation. It is the exchange of ideas about us that we dread most, and the possession by a hundred acquaintances, severally insulated, of the knowledge of our skeleton closet's whereabouts, is not so distressing to the nerves as a chat over it by a party of half a dozen exclusive depositaries though these may be. Perhaps, though Hossbridge watched and whispered, its animus would have been little more than a trifle to persons in thriving circumstances. But unfortunately, poverty, whilst it is new, and before the skin has had time to thicken, makes people susceptible inversely to their opportunities for shielding themselves. In Owen was found, in place of his father's impressibility, a larger share of his father's pride, and a squareness of idea which, if coupled with a little more blindness, would have amounted to positive prejudice. To him humanity, so far as he had thought of it at all, was rather divided into distinct classes than blended from extreme to extreme. Hence by a sequence of ideas which might be traced if it were worthwhile, he either detested or respected opinion, and instinctively sought to escape a cold shade that mere sensitiveness would have endured. He could have submitted to separation, sickness, exile, drudgery, hunger, and thirst, with stoical indifference, but superciliousness was too incisive. After living on for nine months in attempts to make an income as his father's successor in the profession attempts which were utterly fruitless by reason of his inexperience Gray came to a simple and sweeping resolution. They would privately leave that part of England, drop from the sight of acquaintances, gossips, harsh critics, and bitter creditors of whose misfortune he was not the cause, and escape the position which galled him by the only road their great poverty left open to them that of his obtaining some employment in a distant place by following his profession as a humble underdraftsman. He thought over his capabilities with the sensations of a soldier grinding his sword at the opening of a campaign. What with lack of employment, owing to the decrease of his late father's practice, and the absence of direct and uncompromising pressure towards monetary results from a pupil's labor which seems to be always the case when a professional man's pupil is also his son, Owen's progress in the art and science of architecture had been very insignificant indeed. Though anything but an idle young man, he had hardly reached the age at which industrious men who lack an external whip to send them on in the world, are induced by their own common sense to whip on themselves. Hence his knowledge of plans, elevations, sections, and specifications, was not greater at the end of two years of probation than might easily have been acquired in six months by a youth of average ability himself, for instance amid a bustling London practice. But at any rate he could make himself handy to one of the profession some man in a remote town and there fulfill his indentures. A tangible inducement lay in this direction of survey. He had a slight conception of such a man a Mr. Gradfield who was in practice in Budmouth Regis, a seaport town and watering place in the south of England. After some doubts, Gray ventured to write to this gentleman, asking the necessary question, shortly alluding to his father's death, and stating that his term of apprenticeship had only half expired. He would be glad to complete his articles at a very low salary for the whole remaining two years, provided payment could begin at once. The answer from Mr. Gradfield stated that he was not in want of a pupil who would serve the remainder of his time on the terms Mr. Gray mentioned. But he would just add one remark. 
he chanced to be in want of some young man in his office for a short time only, probably about two months to trace drawings, and attend to other subsidiary work of the kind. If Mr. Gray did not object to occupy such an inferior position as these duties would entail, and to accept weekly wages which to one with his expectations would be considered merely nominal, the post would give him an opportunity for learning a few more details of the profession. It is a beginning, and, above all, an abiding place, away from the shadow of the cloud which hangs over us here I will go, said Owen. Cytheria's plan for her future, an intensely simple one, owing to the even greater narrowness of her resources, was already marked out. One advantage had accrued to her through her mother's possession of a fair share of personal property, and perhaps only one. She had been carefully educated. Upon this consideration her plan was based. She was to take up her abode in her brother's lodging at Budmouth, when she would immediately advertise for a situation as governess, having obtained the consent of a lawyer at Old Brickham who was winding up her father's affairs, and who knew the history of her position, to allow himself to be referred to in the matter of her past life and respectability. Early one morning they departed from their native town, leaving behind them scarcely a trace of their footsteps. Then the town pitied their want of wisdom in taking such a step. Rashness, they would have made a better income in Hosbridge, where they are known there is no doubt that they would. But what is wisdom really? A steady handling of any means to bring about any end necessary to happiness. Yet whether one's end be the usual end a wealthy position in life or no, the name of wisdom is seldom applied but to the means to that usual end. To the events of a fortnight. The 9th of July. The day of their departure was one of the most glowing that the climax of a long series of summer heats could evolve. The wide expanse of landscape quivered up and down like the flame of a taper, as they steamed along through the midst of it. Placid flocks of sheep reclining under trees a little way off appeared of a pale blue color. Clover fields were livid with the brightness of the sun upon their deep red flowers. All wagons and carts were moved to the shade by their careful owners, rainwater butts fell to pieces, well buckets were lowered inside the covers of the well hole, to preserve them from the fate of the butts, and generally, water seemed scarcer in the country than the beer and cider of the peasantry who toiled or idled there. To see persons looking with children's eyes at any ordinary scenery, is a proof that they possess the charming faculty of drawing new sensations from an old experience a healthy sign, rare in these feverish days the mark of an imperishable brightness of nature. Both brother and sister could do this, Cytheria more noticeably. They watched the undulating corn lands, monotonous to all their companions, the stony and clayey prospects succeeding those, with its angular and abrupt hills. Boggy moors came next, now withered and dry the spots upon which pools usually spread their waters showing themselves as circles of smooth bare soil, overrun by a network of innumerable little fissures. Then arose plantations of firs, abruptly terminating beside meadows cleanly mown, in which high-hipped, rich-colored cows, with backs horizontal and straight as the ridge of a house, stood motionless or lazily fed. Glimpses of the sea now interested them, which became more and more frequent till the train finally drew up beside the platform at Budmouth. The whole town is looking out for us, had been Gray's impression throughout the day. He called upon Mr. Gradfield the only man who had been directly informed of his coming and found that Mr. Gradfield had forgotten it. However, arrangements were made with this gentleman a stout, active, grey-bearded burger of sixty by which Owen was to commence work in his office the following week. The same day Cytheria drew up and sent off the advertisement appended. A young lady is desirous of meeting with an engagement as governess or companion. She is competent to teach English, French, and music. Satisfactory references address, C.G. Post Office, Budmouth. It seemed a more material existence than her own that she saw thus delineated on the paper. That can't be myself, how odd I look, she said, and smiled. July the 11th. On the Monday subsequent to their arrival in Budmouth, Owen Gray attended at Mr. Gradfield's office to enter upon his duties, and his sister was left in their lodgings alone for the first time. Despite the sad occurrences of the preceding autumn, an unwanted cheerfulness pervaded her spirit throughout the day. 
change of scene and that to untraveled eyes conjoined with the sensation of freedom from supervision, revived the sparkle of a warm young nature ready enough to take advantage of any adventitious restoratives. Point blank grief tends rather to seal up happiness for a time than to produce that attrition which results from griefs of anticipation that move onward with the days, these may be said to furrow away the capacity for pleasure. Her expectations from the advertisement began to be extravagant. A thriving family, who had always sadly needed her, was already definitely pictured in her fancy, which, in its exuberance, led her on to picturing its individual members, their possible peculiarities, virtues, and vices, and obliterated for a time the recollection that she would be separated from her brother. Thus musing, as she waited for his return in the evening, her eyes fell on her left hand. The contemplation of her own left fourth finger by symbol loving girlhood of this age is, it seems, very frequently, if not always, followed by a peculiar train of romantic ideas. Cytheria's thoughts, still playing about her future, became directed into this romantic groove. She leant back in her chair, and taking hold of the fourth finger, which had attracted her attention, she lifted it with the tips of the others, and looked at the smooth and tapering member for a long time. She whispered idly, I wonder who and what he will be. If he's a gentleman of fashion, he will take my finger so, just with the tips of his own, and with some fluttering of the heart and the least trembling of his lip, slip the ring so lightly on that I shall hardly know it is there looking delightfully into my eyes all the time. If he's a bold, dashing soldier, I expect he will proudly turn round, take the ring as if it equaled Her Majesty's crown in value, and desperately set it on my finger thus. He will fix his eyes unflinchingly upon what he is doing just as if he stood in battle before the enemy though, in reality, very fond of me, of course and blush as much as I shall. If he's a sailor, he will take my finger and the ring in this way, and deck it out with a housewifely touch and a tenderness of expression about his mouth, as sailors do, kiss it, perhaps, with a simple air, as if we were children playing an idle game, and not at the very height of observation and envy by a great crowd saying, ah they are happy now. If he should be rather a poor man noble-minded and affectionate, but still poor. Owen's footsteps rapidly ascending the stairs, interrupted this fancy-free meditation. Reproaching herself, even angry with herself for allowing her mind to stray upon such subjects in the face of their present desperate condition, she rose to meet him, and make tea. Cytheria's interest to know how her brother had been received at Mr. Gradfield's broke forth into words at once. Almost before they had sat down to table, she began cross-examining him in the regular sisterly way. Well, Owen, how has it been with you today? What is the place like do you think you will like Mr. Gradfield? Oh yes. But he has not been there today, I have only had the head draftsman with me. Young women have a habit, not noticeable in men, of putting on at a moment's notice the drama of whosoever's life they choose. Cytheria's interest was transferred from Mr. Gradfield to his representative. What sort of a man is he? He seems a very nice fellow indeed, though of course I can hardly tell to a certainty as yet. But I think he's a very worthy fellow, there's no nonsense in him, and though he is not a public school man he has read widely, and has a sharp appreciation of what's good in books and art. In fact, his knowledge isn't nearly so exclusive as most professional men's. That's a great deal to say of an architect, for of all professional men they are, as a rule the most professional. Yes, perhaps they are. This man is rather of a melancholy turn of mind, I think. Has the managing clerk any family, she mildly asked, after a while, pouring out some more tea. Family, no. Well, dear Owen, how should I know? Why, of course he isn't married. But there happened to be a conversation about women going on in the office, and I heard him say what he should wish his wife to be like. What would he wish his wife to be like, she said, with great apparent lack of interest. Oh, he says she must be girlish and artless, yet he would be loath to do without a dash of womanly subtlety, tis so piquant. Yes, he said, that must be in her, she must have womanly cleverness. 
and yet I should like her to blush if only a cock sparrow were to look at her hard, he said, which brings me back to the girl again, and so I flit backwards and forwards. I must have what comes, I suppose, he said, and whatever she may be, thank God she's no worse. However, if he might give a final hint to Providence, he said, a child among pleasures, and a woman among pains was the rough outline of his requirement. Did he say that? What amusing creature he must be! He did, indeed. From the 12th to the 15th of July. As is well known, ideas are so elastic in a human brain, that they have no constant measure which may be called their actual bulk. Any important idea may be compressed to a molecule by an unwanted crowding of others, and any small idea will expand to whatever length and breadth of vacuum the mind may be able to make over to it. Cytherea's world was tolerably vacant at this time, and the young architectural designer's image became very pervasive. The next evening this subject was again renewed. His name is Springrove, said Owen, in reply to her. He is a thorough artist, but a man of rather humble origin, it seems, who has made himself so far. I think he is the son of a farmer, or something of the kind. Well, he's none the worse for that. I suppose. None the worse. As we come down the hill, we shall be continually meeting people going up. But Owen had felt that Spring Grove was a little the worse nevertheless. Of course he's rather old by this time. Oh no. He's about six and twenty not more. Ah, I see. What is he like, Owen? I can't exactly tell you his appearance, tis always such a difficult thing to do. A man you would describe as short. Most men are those we should describe as short, I fancy. I should call him, I think, of the middle height, but as I only see him sitting in the office, of course I am not certain about his form and figure. I wish you were, then. Perhaps you do. But I am not, you see. Of course not, you are always so provoking. Owen. I saw a man in the street today whom I fancied was he and yet, I don't see how it could be, either. He had light brown hair, a snub nose, very round face, and a peculiar habit of reducing his eyes to straight lines when he looked narrowly at anything. Oh no! That was not he, Cytherea. Not a bit like him in all probability. Not a bit. He has dark hair almost a Grecian nose, regular teeth and an intellectual face as nearly as I can recall to mind. Ah, there now, Owen, you have described him but I suppose he's not generally called pleasing, or handsome. I scarcely meant that. But since you have said it, is he handsome? Rather. His tout ensemble is striking. Yes oh no, no I forgot, it is not. He is rather untidy in his waistcoat, and neckties, and hair. How vexing, it must be to himself, poor thing. He's a thorough bookworm despises the pap and daisy school of verse knows Shakespeare to the very dregs of the footnotes. Indeed, he's a poet himself in a small way. How delicious, she said. I have never known a poet. And you don't know him, said Owen dryly. She reddened. Of course I don't. I know that. Have you received any answer to your advertisement? he inquired. Ah oh, no she said, and the forgotten disappointment which had showed itself in her face at different times during the day, became visible again. Another day passed away. On Thursday, without inquiry, she learnt more of the head draftsman. He and Gray had become very friendly, and he had been tempted to show her brother a copy of some poems of his some serious and sad some humorous which had appeared in the poet's corner of a magazine from time to time. Owen showed them now to Cytherea, who instantly began to read them carefully and to think them very beautiful. Yes Springrove's no fool, said Owen sententiously. No fool I should think he isn't, indeed, said Cytherea, looking up from the paper in quite an excitement, to write such verses as these. What logic are you chopping, Cytherea? Well, I don't mean on account of the verses, because I haven't read them, but for what he said when the fellows were talking about falling in love. Which you will tell me. 
He says that your true lover breathlessly finds himself engaged to a sweetheart, like a man who has caught something in the dark. He doesn't know whether it is a bat or a bird, and takes it to the light when he is cool to learn what it is. He looks to see if she is the right age, but right age or wrong age, he must consider her a prize. Some time later he ponders whether she is the right kind of prize for him. Right kind or wrong kind he has called her his, and must abide by it. After a time he asks himself, has she the temper, hair and eyes I meant to have, and was firmly resolved not to do without. He finds it is all wrong, and then comes the tussle. Do they marry and live happily? Who? Oh, the supposed pair. I think he said well, I really forget what he said. That is stupid of you said the young lady with dismay. Yes. But he's a satirist I don't think I care about him now. There you are just wrong. He is not. He is, as I believe, an impulsive fellow who has been made to pay the penalty of his rashness in some love affair. Thus ended the dialogue of Thursday, but Cytheria read the verses again in private. On Friday her brother remarked that Springrove had informed him he was going to leave Mr. Gradfield's in a fortnight to push his fortunes in London. An indescribable feeling of sadness shot through Cytheria's heart. Why should she be sad at such an announcement as that, she thought, concerning a man she had never seen, when her spirits were elastic enough to rebound after hard blows from deep and real troubles as if she had scarcely known them. Though she could not answer this question, she knew one thing, she was saddened by Owen's news. July the 21st A very popular local excursion by steamboat to Lulstead Cove was announced through the streets of Budmouth one Thursday morning by the weak-voiced town crier, to start at six o'clock the same day. The weather was lovely, and the opportunity being the first of the kind offered to them, Owen and Cytheria went with the rest. They had reached the cove, and had walked landward for nearly an hour over the hill which rose beside the strand, when Gray recollected that two or three miles yet further inland from this spot was an interesting medieval ruin. He was already familiar with its characteristics through the medium of an archaeological work, and now finding himself so close to the reality, felt inclined to verify some theory he had formed respecting it. Concluding that there would be just sufficient time for him to go there and return before the boat had left the shore, he parted from Cytheria on the hill, struck downwards, and then up a heathery valley. She remained on the summit where he had left her till the time of his expected return, scanning the details of the prospect around. Placidly spread out before her on the south was the open channel, reflecting a blue intenser by many shades than that of the sky overhead, and dotted in the foreground by half a dozen small craft of contrasting rig, their sails graduating in hue from extreme whiteness to reddish-brown, the varying actual colors varied again in a double degree by the rays of the declining sun. Presently the distant bell from the boat was heard, warning the passengers to embark. This was followed by a lively air from the harps and violins on board, their tones, as they arose, becoming intermingled with, though not marred by, the brush of the waves when their crests rolled over at the point where the check of the shallows was first felt and then thinned away up the slope of pebbles and sand. She turned her face landward and strained her eyes to discern, if possible, some sign of Owen's return. Nothing was visible save the strikingly brilliant, still landscape. The wide concave which lay at the back of the hill in this direction was blazing with the western light adding an orange tint to the vivid purple of the heather, now at the very climax of bloom, and free from the slightest touch of the invidious brown that so soon creeps into its shades. The light so intensified the colors that they seemed to stand above the surface of the earth and float in mid-air like an exhalation of red. In the minor valleys, between the hillocks and ridges which diversified the contour of the basin, but did not disturb its general sweep, she marked breaks of tall, heavy-stemmed ferns, five or six feet high, in a brilliant light green dress a broad ribbon of them with the path in their midst winding like a stream along the little ravine that reached to the foot of the hill, and delivered up the path to its grassy area. Among the ferns grew holly bushes deeper in tint than any shadow about them, whilst the whole surface of the scene was dimpled with small conical pits, and here and there were round ponds, now dry, and half overgrown with rushes. The last bell of the steamer rang. Cytheria had forgotten herself, 
and what she was looking for. In a fever of distress lest Owen should be left behind, she gathered up in her hand the corners of her handkerchief, containing specimens of the shells, plants and fossils which the locality produced, started off to the sands, and mingled with the knots of visitors there congregated from other interesting points around, from the inn, the cottages and hired conveyances that had returned from short drives inland. They all went aboard by the primitive plan of a narrow plank on two wheels the women being assisted by a rope. Cytheria lingered till the very last, reluctant to follow, and looking alternately at the boat and the valley behind. Her delay provoked a remark from Captain Jacobs, a thick-set man of hybrid stains, resulting from the mixed effects of fire and water, peculiar to sailors where engines are the propelling power. Now then, Missy, if you please. I am sorry to tell E.E. our time's up. Who are you looking for, Miss? My brother he has walked a short distance inland, he must be here directly. Could you wait for him just a minute? Really, I am afraid not, M.M. Cytheria looked at the stout, round-faced man, and at the vessel, with the light in her eyes so expressive of her own opinion being the same, on reflection, as his, and with such resignation, too, that, from an instinctive feeling of pride at being able to prove himself more humane than he was thought to be works of supererogation are the only sacrifices that entice in this way and that at a very small cost, he delayed the boat till some among the passengers began to murmur. There, never mind, said Cytheria decisively. Go on without me I shall wait for him. Well, tis a very awkward thing to leave you here all alone, said the captain. I certainly advise you not to wait. He's gone across to the railway station, for certain, said another passenger. No here he is, Cytheria said, regarding, as she spoke, the half-hidden figure of a man who was seen advancing at a headlong pace down the ravine which lay between the heath and the shore. He can't get here in less than five minutes, a passenger said. People should know what they are about, and keep time. Really, if... You see, sir, said the captain, in an apologetic undertone, since tis her brother, and she's all alone, tis only Nader to wait a minute, now he's in sight. Suppose, now, you were a young woman, as might be, and had a brother, like this one, and you stood of an evening upon this here wild lonely shore, like her, why you'd want us to wait, too, wouldn't you, sir? I think you would. The person so hastily approaching had been lost to view during this remark by reason of a hollow in the ground, and the projecting cliff immediately at hand covered the path in its rise. His footsteps were now heard striking sharply upon the flinty road at a distance of about twenty or thirty yards, but still behind the escarpment. To save time, Cytheria prepared to ascend the plank. Let me give you my hand, miss, said Captain Jacobs. No please don't touch me said she, ascending cautiously by sliding one foot forward two or three inches, bringing up the other behind it, and so on alternately her lips compressed by concentration on the feet, her eyes glued to the plank, her hand to the rope, and her immediate thought to the fact of the distressing narrowness of her footing. Steps now shook the lower end of the board, and in an instant were up to her heels with a bound. Oh, Owen, I am so glad you are come she said without turning. Don't, don't shake the plank or touch me, whatever you do. There, I am up. Where have you been so long, she continued, in a lower tone, turning round to him as she reached the top. Raising her eyes from her feet, which, standing on the firm deck, demanded her attention no longer, she acquired perceptions of the newcomer in the following order, unknown trousers, unknown waistcoat, unknown face. The man was not her brother, but a total stranger. Off went the plank, the paddles started, stopped, backed, pattered in confusion, then revolved decisively, and the boat passed out into deep water. One or two persons had said, How do ye do, Mr. Springrove, and looked at Cytheria, to see how she bore her disappointment. Her ears had but just caught the name of the head draftsman, when she saw him advancing directly to address her. Miss Gray, I believe, he said, lifting his hat. Yes, 
said Cytheria, colouring and trying not to look guilty of a surreptitious knowledge of him. I am Mr. Springrove. I passed Corfsgat Castle about an hour ago, and soon afterwards met your brother going that way. He had been deceived in the distance, and was about to turn without seeing the ruin, on account of a lameness that had come on in his leg or foot. I proposed that he should go on, since he had got so near, and afterwards, instead of walking back to the boat, get across to Angleberry Station a shorter walk for him where he could catch the late train, and go directly home. I could let you know what he had done, and allay any uneasiness. Is the lameness serious, do you know? Oh no, simply from overwalking himself. Still, it was just as well to ride home. Relieved from her apprehensions on Owen's score, she was able slightly to examine the appearance of her informant Edward Springrove who now removed his hat for a while, to cool himself. He was rather above her brother's height. Although the upper part of his face and head was handsomely formed, and bounded by lines of sufficiently masculine regularity, his brows were somewhat too softly arched, and finely penciled for one of his sex, without prejudice, however to the belief which the sum total of his features inspired that though they did not prove that the man who thought inside them would do much in the world, men who had done most of all had had no better ones. Across his forehead, otherwise perfectly smooth, ran one thin line, the healthy freshness of his remaining features expressing that it had come there prematurely. Though some years short of the age at which the clear spirit bids goodbye to the last infirmity of noble mind, and takes to house hunting and investments, he had reached the period in a young man's life when episodic periods, with a hopeful birth and a disappointing death, have begun to accumulate, and to bear a fruit of generalities, his glance sometimes seeming to state, I have already thought out the issue of such conditions as these we are experiencing. At other times he wore an abstracted look, I seem to have lived through this moment before. He was carelessly dressed in dark grey, wearing a rolled-up black kerchief as a neckcloth, the knot of which was disarranged, and stood obliquely a deposit of white dust having lodged in the creases. I am sorry for your disappointment, he continued, glancing into her face. Their eyes having met, became, as it were, mutually locked together, and the single instant only which good breeding allows as the length of such a look, became trebled, a clear penetrating ray of intelligence had shot from each into each giving birth to one of those unaccountable sensations which carry home to the heart before the hand has been touched or the merest compliment passed, by something stronger than mathematical proof, the conviction, a tie has begun to unite us. Both faces also unconsciously stated that their owners had been much in each other's thoughts of late. Owen had talked to the young architect of his sister as freely as to Cytheria of the young architect. A conversation began which was none the less interesting to the parties engaged because it consisted only of the most trivial and commonplace remarks. Then the band of harps and violins struck up a lively melody, and the deck was cleared for dancing, the sun dipping beneath the horizon during the proceeding, and the moon showing herself at their stern. The sea was so calm, that the soft hiss produced by the bursting of the innumerable bubbles of foam behind the paddles could be distinctly heard. The passengers who did not dance, including Cytheria and Springrove, lapsed into silence, leaning against the paddle boxes, or standing aloof noticing the trembling of the deck to the steps of the dance watching the waves from the paddles as they slid thinly and easily under each other's edges. Night had quite closed in by the time they reached Budmouth Harbour, sparkling with its white, red and green lights in opposition to the shimmering path of the moon's reflection on the other side which reached away to the horizon till the flecked ripples reduced themselves to sparkles as fine as gold dust. I will walk to the station and find out the exact time the train arrives, said Springrove, rather eagerly, when they had landed. She thanked him much. Perhaps we might walk together, he suggested hesitatingly. She looked as if she did not quite know, and he settled the question by showing the way. They found, on arriving there, that on the first day of that month the particular train selected for Gray's return had ceased to stop at Angleberry Station. I am very sorry I misled him, said Springrove. Oh, I am not alarmed at all, replied Cytheria. Well, it's sure to be all right he will sleep there, and come by the first in the morning. 
but what will you do, alone? I am quite easy on that point, the landlady is very friendly. I must go indoors now. Good night, Mr. Springrove. Let me go round to your door with you, he pleaded. No, thank you, we live close by. He looked at her as a waiter looks at the change he brings back. But she was inexorable. Don't forget me, he murmured. She did not answer. Let me see you sometimes, he said. Perhaps you never will again I am going away, she replied in lingering tones, and turning into Cross Street, ran indoors and upstairs. The sudden withdrawal of what was superfluous at first, is often felt as an essential loss. It was felt now with regard to the maiden. More, too, after a meeting so pleasant and so enkindling, she had seemed to imply that they would never come together again. The young man softly followed her, stood opposite the house and watched her come into the upper room with the light. Presently his gaze was cut short by her approaching the window and pulling down the blind Edward dwelling upon her vanishing figure with a hopeless sense of loss akin to that which Adam is said by logicians to have felt when he first saw the sun set, and thought, in his inexperience, that it would return no more. He waited till her shadow had twice crossed the window, when, finding the charming outline was not to be expected again, he left the street, crossed the harbour bridge, and entered his own solitary chamber on the other side, vaguely thinking as he went for undefined reasons. One hope is too like despair. For prudence to smother. Three the events of eight days. From the 22nd to the 27th of July. But things are not what they seem. A responsive love for Edward Springrove had made its appearance in Cytherea's bosom with all the fascinating attributes of a first experience, not succeeding to or displacing other emotions, as in older hearts, but taking up entirely new ground, as when gazing just after sunset at the pale blue sky we see a star come into existence where nothing was before. His parting words, don't forget me, she repeated to herself a hundred times, and though she thought their import was probably commonplace, she could not help toying with them looking at them from all points, and investing them with meanings of love and faithfulness ostensibly entertaining such meanings only as fables wherewith to pass the time, yet in her heart admitting, for detached instance, a possibility of their deeper truth. And thus, for hours after he had left her, her reason flirted with her fancy as a kitten will sport with a dove, pleasantly and smoothly through easy attitudes, but disclosing its cruel and unyielding nature at crises. To turn now to the more material media through which this story moves, it so happened that the very next morning brought round a circumstance which, slight in itself, took up a relevant and important position between the past and the future of the persons herein concerned. At breakfast time, just as Cytherea had again seen the postman pass without bringing her an answer to the advertisement, as she had fully expected he would do, Owen entered the room. Well, he said, kissing her. You have not been alarmed, of course. Springrove told you what I had done, and you found there was no train. Yes, it was all clear. But what is the lameness owing to? I don't know nothing. It has quite gone off now. Cytherea, I hope you like Springrove. Springrove's a nice fellow, you know. Yes. I think he is, except that. It happened just to the purpose that I should meet him there, didn't it? And when I reached the station and learnt that I could not get on by train my foot seemed better. I started off to walk home, and went about five miles along a path beside the railway. It then struck me that I might not be fit for anything today if I walked and aggravated the bothering foot, so I looked for a place to sleep it. There was no available village or inn, and I eventually got the keeper of a gatehouse where a lane crossed the line, to take me in. They proceeded with their breakfast. Owen yawned. You didn't get much sleep at the gatehouse last night, I'm afraid, Owen, said his sister. To tell the truth, I didn't. I was in such very close and narrow quarters. Those gatehouses are such small places, and the man had only his own bed to offer me. Ah, by the by, Scythe. I have such an extraordinary thing to tell you in connection with this man by Jove, I had nearly forgotten it but I'll go straight on. As I was saying, 
he had only his own bed to offer me, but I could not afford to be fastidious, and as he had a hearty manner, though a very queer one, I agreed to accept it, and he made a rough pallet for himself on the floor close beside me. Well, I could not sleep for my life, and I wished I had not stayed there, though I was so tired. For one thing, there were the luggage trains rattling by at my elbow the early part of the night. But worse than this, he talked continually in his sleep, and occasionally struck out with his limbs at something or another, knocking against the post of the bedstead and making it tremble. My condition was altogether so unsatisfactory that at last I awoke him, and asked him what he had been dreaming about for the previous hour, for I could get no sleep at all. He begged my pardon for disturbing me, but a name I had casually let fall that evening had led him to think of another stranger he had once had visit him, who had also accidentally mentioned the same name, and some very strange incidents connected with that meeting. The affair had occurred years and years ago, but what I had said had made him think and dream about it as if it were but yesterday. What was the word? I said. Cytherea, he said. What was the story? I asked then. He then told me that when he was a young man in London he borrowed a few pounds to add to a few he had saved up, and opened a little inn at Hammersmith. One evening, after the inn had been open about a couple of months, every idler in the neighbourhood ran off to Westminster. The Houses of Parliament were on fire. Not a soul remained in his parlour besides himself, and he began picking up the pipes and glasses his customers had hastily relinquished. At length a young lady about seventeen or eighteen came in. She asked if a woman was there waiting for herself Miss Jane Taylor. He said no, asked the young lady if she would wait, and showed her into the small inner room. There was a glass pane in the partition dividing this room from the bar to enable the landlord to see if his visitors, who sat there, wanted anything. A curious awkwardness and melancholy about the behavior of the girl who called, caused my informant to look frequently at her through the partition. She seemed weary of her life, and sat with her face buried in her hands, evidently quite out of her element in such a house. Then a woman much older came in and greeted Miss Taylor by name. The man distinctly heard the following words pass between them. Why have you not brought him? He is ill, he is not likely to live through the night. At this announcement from the elderly woman, the young lady fell to the floor in a swoon, apparently overcome by the news. The landlord ran in and lifted her up. Well, do what they would they could not for a long time bring her back to consciousness, and began to be much alarmed. Who is she? the innkeeper said to the other woman. I know her, the other said, with deep meaning in her tone. The elderly and young woman seemed allied, and yet strangers. She now showed signs of life, and it struck him he was plainly of an inquisitive turn, that in her half-bewildered state he might get some information from her. He stooped over her, put his mouth to her ear, and said sharply, What's your name? To catch a woman napping is difficult, even when she's half dead, but I did it, says the gatekeeper. When he asked her her name, she said immediately. Cytherea and stopped suddenly. My own name said Cytherea. Yes your name. Well, the gateman thought at the time it might be equally with Jane a name she had invented for the occasion, that they might not trace her, but I think it was truth unconsciously uttered, for she added directly afterwards, oh, what have I said and was quite overcome again this time with fright. Her vexation that the woman now doubted the genuineness of her other name was very much greater than that the innkeeper did, and it is evident that to blind the woman was her main object. He also learned from words the elderly woman casually dropped, that meetings of the same kind had been held before, and that the falseness of the Swatis on Miss Jane Taylor's name had never been suspected by this dependent or confederate till then. She recovered rested there for an hour, and first sending off her companion peremptorily which was another odd thing, she left the house, offering the landlord all the money she had to say nothing about the circumstance. He has never seen her since, according to his own account. I said to him again and again, did you find any more particulars afterwards? Not a syllable, he said. Oh, he should never hear any more of that too many years had passed since it happened. At any rate, 
you found out her surname. I said. Well, well, that's my secret, he went on. Perhaps I should never have been in this part of the world if it hadn't been for that. I failed as a publican, you know. I imagine the situation of Gateman was given him and his debts paid off as a bribe to silence, but I can't say. Ah, yes he said, with a long breath. I have never heard that name mentioned since that time till tonight, and then there instantly rose to my eyes the vision of that young lady lying in a fainting fit. He then stopped talking and fell asleep. Telling the story must have relieved him as it did the ancient mariner for he did not move a muscle or make another sound for the remainder of the night. Now isn't that an odd story? It is indeed, Cytherea murmured. Very, very strange. Why should she have said your most uncommon name, continued Owen. The man was evidently truthful, for there was not motive sufficient for his invention of such a tale, and he could not have done it either. Cytherea looked long at her brother. Don't you recognize anything else in connection with the story, she said. What, he asked. Do you remember what poor Papa once let drop that Cytherea was the name of his first sweetheart in Bloomsbury, who so mysteriously renounced him? A sort of intuition tells me that this was the same woman. Oh no not likely, said her brother skeptically. How not likely, Owen? There's not another woman of the name in England. In what year used Papa to say the event took place? 1835. And when were the Houses of Parliament burnt? Stop, I can tell you. She searched their little stock of books for a list of dates, and found one in an old school history. The Houses of Parliament were burnt down in the evening of the 16th of October, 1834. Nearly a year and a quarter before she met Father, remarked Owen. They were silent. If Papa had been alive, what a wonderful absorbing interest this story would have had for him, said Cytherea by and by. And how strangely knowledge comes to us. We might have searched for a clue to her secret half the world over, and never found one. If we had really had any motive for trying to discover more of the sad history than Papa told us, we should have gone to Bloomsbury, but not caring to do so, we go two hundred miles in the opposite direction and there find information waiting to be told us. What could have been the secret, Owen? Heaven knows. But our having heard a little more of her in this way if she is the same woman is a mere coincidence after all a family story to tell our friends if we ever have any. But we shall never know any more of the episode now trust our fates for that. Cytherea sat silently thinking. There was no answer this morning to your advertisement, Cytherea, he continued. None. I could see that by your looks when I came in. Fancy not getting a single one, she said sadly. Surely there must be people somewhere who want governesses. Yes, but those who want them, and can afford to have them, get them mostly by friends' recommendations, whilst those who want them, and can't afford to have them, make use of their poor relations. What shall I do? Never mind it. Go on living with me. Don't let the difficulty trouble your mind so, you think about it all day. I can keep you, Scythe, in a plain way of living. Twenty-five shillings a week do not amount to much truly, but then many mechanics have no more, and we live quite as sparingly as journeyman mechanics. It is a meager narrow life we are drifting into, he added gloomily, but it is a degree more tolerable than the worrying sensation of all the world being ashamed of you, which we experienced at Hosbridge. I couldn't go back there again, she said. Nor I oh, I don't regret our course for a moment. We did quite right in dropping out of the world. The sneering tones of the remark were almost too labored to be real. Besides, he continued, something better for me is sure to turn up soon. I wish my engagement here was a permanent one instead of for only two months. It may, certainly, be for a longer time, but all is uncertain. I wish I could get something to do, and I must too, she said firmly. Suppose, as is very probable, you are not wanted after the beginning of October the time Mr. Gradfield mentioned what should we do if I were dependent on you only throughout the winter. 
They pondered on numerous schemes by which a young lady might be supposed to earn a decent livelihood more or less convenient and feasible in imagination, but relinquished them all until advertising had been once more tried, this time taking lower ground. Cytheria was vexed at her temerity in having represented to the world that so inexperienced a being as herself was a qualified governess, and had a fancy that this presumption of hers might be one reason why no ladies applied. The new and humbler attempt appeared in the following form. Nursery governess or useful companion. A young person wishes to hear of a situation in either of the above capacities. Salary very moderate. She is a good needlewoman address G, Cross Street. Budmouth. In the evening they went to post the letter, and then walked up and down the parade for a while. Soon they met Springgrove, said a few words to him, and passed on. Owen noticed that his sister's face had become crimson. Rather oddly they met Springgrove again in a few minutes. This time the three walked a little way together, Edward ostensibly talking to Owen though with a single thought to the reception of his words by the maiden at the farther side, upon whom his gaze was mostly resting, and who was attentively listening looking fixedly upon the pavement the while. It has been said that men love with their eyes, women with their ears. As Owen and himself were little more than acquaintances as yet, and as Springgrove was wanting in the assurance of many men of his age, it now became necessary to wish his friends good evening or to find a reason for continuing near Cytheria by saying some nice new thing. He thought of a new thing, he proposed a pull across the bay. This was assented to. They went to the pier, stepped into one of the gaily painted boats moored alongside and sheered off. Cytheria sat in the stern steering. They rowed that evening, the next came, and with it the necessity of rowing again. Then the next, and the next. Cytheria always sitting in the stern with the tiller ropes in her hand. The curves of her figure welded with those of the fragile boat in perfect continuation, as she girlishly yielded herself to its heaving and sinking, seeming to form with it an organic whole. Then Owen was inclined to test his skill in paddling a canoe. Edward did not like canoes, and the issue was, that, having seen Owen on board, Springgrove proposed to pull off after him with a pair of skulls but not considering himself sufficiently accomplished to do finished rowing before a parade full of promenaders when there was a little swell on, and with the rudder unshipped in addition, he begged that Cytheria might come with him and steer as before. She stepped in, and they floated along in the wake of her brother. Thus passed the fifth evening on the water. But the sympathetic pair were thrown into still closer companionship, and much more exclusive connection. July the 29th it was a sad time for Cytheria the last day of Springgrove's management at Gradfields, and the last evening before his return from Budmouth to his father's house, previous to his departure for London. Gray had been requested by the architect to survey a plot of land nearly twenty miles off, which, with the journey to and fro, would occupy him the whole day, and prevent his returning till late in the evening. Cytheria made a companion of her landlady to the extent of sharing meals and sitting with her during the morning of her brother's absence. Midday found her restless and miserable under this arrangement. All the afternoon she sat alone, looking out of the window for she scarcely knew whom, and hoping she scarcely knew what. Half past five o'clock came the end of Springgrove's official day. Two minutes later Springgrove walked by. She endured her solitude for another half hour and then could endure no longer. She had hoped while affecting to fear that Edward would have found some reason or other for calling, but it seemed that he had not. Hastily dressing herself she went out, when the farce of an accidental meeting was repeated. Edward came upon her in the street at the first turning, and, like the great Duke Ferdinand in the statue and the bust, he looked at her as a lover can. She looked at him as one who awakes. The past was asleep, and her life began. Shall we have a boat, he said impulsively. How blissful it all is at first. Perhaps, indeed, the only bliss in the course of love which can truly be called Eden-like is that which prevails immediately after doubt has ended and before reflection has set in at the dawn of the emotion, when it is not recognized by name, and before the consideration of what this love is, has given birth to the consideration of what difficulties it tends to create, when on the man's part, 
the mistress appears to the mind's eye in picturesque, hazy, and fresh morning lights, and soft morning shadows, when, as yet, she is known only as the wearer of one dress, which shares her own personality, as the stander in one special position, the giver of one bright particular glance, and the speaker of one tender sentence, when, on her part, she is timidly careful over what she says and does, lest she should be misconstrued or underrated to the breadth of a shadow of a hair. Shall we have a boat, he said again, more softly, seeing that to his first question she had not answered, but looked uncertainly at the ground, then almost, but not quite, in his face, blushed a series of minute blushes, left off in the midst of them, and showed the usual signs of perplexity in a matter of the emotions. Owen had always been with her before, but there was now a force of habit in the proceeding, and with Arcadian innocence she assumed that a row on the water was, under any circumstances, a natural thing. Without another word being spoken on either side, they went down the steps. He carefully handed her in, took his seat, slid noiselessly off the sand, and away from the shore. They thus sat facing each other in the graceful yellow cockle shell, and his eyes frequently found a resting place in the depths of hers. The boat was so small that at each return of the skulls, when his hands came forward to begin the pull, they approached so near to her that her vivid imagination began to thrill her with a fancy that he was going to clasp his arms round her. The sensation grew so strong that she could not run the risk of again meeting his eyes at those critical moments, and turned aside to inspect the distant horizon, then she grew weary of looking sideways, and was driven to return to her natural position again. At this instant he again leant forward to begin, and met her glance by an ardent fixed gaze. An involuntary impulse of girlish embarrassment caused her to give a vehement pull at the tiller rope, which brought the boat's head round till they stood directly for shore. His eyes, which had dwelt upon her form during the whole time of her look askance, now left her, he perceived the direction in which they were going. Why, you have completely turned the boat, Miss Gray, he said, looking over his shoulder. Look at our track on the water a great semicircle, preceded by a series of zigzags as far as we can see. She looked attentively. Is it my fault or yours, she inquired. Mine? I suppose. I can't help saying that it is yours. She dropped the ropes decisively, feeling the slightest twinge of vexation at the answer. Why do you let go? I do it so badly. Oh no, you turned about for sure in a masterly way. Do you wish to return? Yes, if you please. Of course, then, I will at once. I fear what the people will think of us going in such absurd directions and all through my wretched steering. Never mind what the people think. A pause. You surely are not so weak as to mind what the people think on such a matter as that. Those words might almost be called too firm and hard to be given by him to her, but never mind. For almost the first time in her life she felt the charming sensation, although on such an insignificant subject, of being compelled into an opinion by a man she loved. Owen though less yielding physically, and more practical, would not have had the intellectual independence to answer a woman thus. She replied quietly and honestly as honestly as when she had stated the contrary fact a minute earlier. I don't mind. I'll unship the tiller that you may have nothing to do going back but to hold your parasol, he continued, and arose to perform the operation, necessarily leaning closely against her to guard against the risk of capsizing the boat as he reached his hands astern. His warm breath touched and crept round her face like a caress, but he was apparently only concerned with his task. She looked guilty of something when he seated himself. He read in her face what that something was she had experienced a pleasure from his touch. But he flung a practical glance over his shoulder, seized the oars, and they sped in a straight line towards the shore. Cytheria saw that he noted in her face what had passed in her heart, and that noting it, he continued as decided as before. She was inwardly distressed. She had not meant him to translate her words about returning home so literally at the first, she had not intended him to learn her secret, but more than all she was not able to endure the perception of his learning it and continuing unmoved. There was nothing but misery to come now. They would step ashore 
he would say good night, go to London tomorrow, and the miserable she would lose him forever. She did not quite suppose what was the fact, that a parallel thought was simultaneously passing through his mind. They were now within ten yards, now within five, he was only now waiting for a smooth to bring the boat in. Sweet, sweet love must not be slain thus, was the fair maid's reasoning. She was equal to the occasion ladies are and delivered the god. Do you want very much to land, Mr. Springrove, she said, letting her young violet eyes pine at him a very, very little. I. Not at all, said he, looking in astonishment at her inquiry which a slight twinkle of his eye half belied. But you do. I think that now we have come out, and it is such a pleasant evening, she said gently and sweetly, I should like a little longer row if you don't mind. I'll try to steer better than before if it makes it easier for you. I'll try very hard. It was the turn of his face to tell a tale now. He looked, we understand each other ah, we do, darling turned the boat, and pulled back into the bay once more. Now steer wherever you will he said, in a low voice. Never mind the directness of the course wherever you will. Shall it be crest and shore, she said, pointing to a stretch of beach northward from Budmouth Esplanade. Crest and shore certainly, he responded, grasping the skulls. She took the strings daintily, and they wound away to the left. For a long time nothing was audible in the boat but the regular dip of the oars, and their movement in the rowlocks. Spring Grove at length spoke. I must go away tomorrow, he said tentatively. Yes, she replied faintly. To endeavor to advance a little in my profession in London. Yes, she said again, with the same preoccupied softness. But I shan't advance. Why not? Architecture is a bewitching profession. They say that an architect's work is another man's play. Yes. But worldly advantage from an art doesn't depend upon mastering it. I used to think it did, but it doesn't. Those who get rich need have no skill at all as artists. What need they have? A certain kind of energy which men with any fondness for art possess very seldom indeed an earnestness in making acquaintances, and a love for using them. They give their whole attention to the art of dining out, after mastering a few rudimentary facts to serve up in conversation. Now after saying that, do I seem a man likely to make a name? You seem a man likely to make a mistake. What's that? To give too much room to the latent feeling which is rather common in these days among the unappreciated, that because some remarkably successful men are fools, all remarkably unsuccessful men are geniuses. Pretty subtle for a young lady, he said slowly. From that remark I should fancy you had bought experience. She passed over the idea. Do try to succeed, she said, with wistful thoughtfulness, leaving her eyes on him. Spring Grove flushed a little at the earnestness of her words, and mused. Then, like Cato the censor, I shall do what I despise, to be in the fashion, he said at last. Well, when I found all this out that I was speaking of, whatever do you think I did? From having already loved verse passionately, I went on to read it continually, then I went rhyming myself. If anything on earth ruins a man for useful occupation, and for content with reasonable success in a profession or trade, it is the habit of writing verses on emotional subjects, which had much better be left to die from want of nourishment. Do you write poems now, she said. None. Poetical days are getting past with me, according to the usual rule. Writing rhymes is a stage people of my sort pass through, as they pass through the stage of shaving for a beard, or thinking they are ill-used, or saying there's nothing in the world worth living for. Then the difference between a common man and a recognized poet is, that one has been deluded, and cured of his delusion, and the other continues deluded all his days. Well, there's just enough truth in what you say, to make the remark unbearable. However, it doesn't matter to me now that I meditate the thankless muse no longer, but... He paused, as if endeavoring to think what better thing he did. Cytheria's mind ran on to the succeeding lines of the poem, and their startling harmony with the present situation suggested the fancy that he was sporting with her, 
and brought an awkward contemplativeness to her face. Spring Grove guessed her thoughts, and in answer to them simply said yes. Then they were silent again. If I had known an Amaryllis was coming here, I should not have made arrangements for leaving, he resumed. Such levity, superimposed on the notion of sport, was intolerable to Cytherea, for a woman seems never to see any but the serious side of her attachment, though the most devoted lover has all the time a vague and dim perception that he is losing his old dignity and frittering away his time. But will you not try again to get on in your profession? Try once more, do try once more, she murmured. I am going to try again. I have advertised for something to do. Of course I will, he said, with an eager gesture and smile. But we must remember that the fame of Christopher Wren himself depended upon the accident of a fire in Pudding Lane. My successes seem to come very slowly. I often think, that before I am ready to live, it will be time for me to die. However, I am trying not for fame now, but for an easy life of reasonable comfort. It is a melancholy truth for the middle classes, that in proportion as they develop, by the study of poetry and art, their capacity for conjugal love of the highest and purest kind, they limit the possibility of their being able to exercise it the very act putting out of their power the attainment of means sufficient for marriage. The man who works up a good income has had no time to learn love to its solemn extreme, the man who has learnt that has had no time to get rich. And if you should fail utterly fail to get that reasonable wealth, she said earnestly, don't be perturbed. The truly great stand upon no middle ledge, they are either famous or unknown. Unknown, he said, if their ideas have been allowed to flow with a sympathetic breadth. Famous only if they have been convergent and exclusive. Yes, and I am afraid from that, that my remark was but discouragement, wearing the dress of comfort. Perhaps I was not quite right in. It depends entirely upon what is meant by being truly great. But the long and the short of the matter is, that men must stick to a thing if they want to succeed in it not giving way to overmuch admiration for the flowers they see growing in other people's borders, which I am afraid has been my case. He looked into the far distance and paused. Adherence to a course with persistence sufficient to ensure success is possible to widely appreciative minds only when there is also found in them a power commonplace in its nature but rare in such combination the power of assuming to conviction that in the outlying paths which appear so much more brilliant than their own, there are bitternesses equally great unperceived simply on account of their remoteness. They were opposite rings worth shore. The cliffs here were formed of strata completely contrasting with those of the further side of the bay, whilst in and beneath the water hard boulders had taken the place of sand and shingle, between which, however, the sea glided noiselessly, without breaking the crest of a single wave, so strikingly calm was the air. The breeze had entirely died away, leaving the water of that rare glassy smoothness which is unmarked even by the small dimples of the least aerial movement. Purples and blues of divers shades were reflected from this mirror accordingly as each undulation sloped east or west. They could see the rocky bottom some twenty feet beneath them, luxuriant with weeds of various growths and dotted with pulpy creatures reflecting a silvery and spangled radiance upwards to their eyes. At length she looked at him to learn the effect of her words of encouragement. He had let the oars drift alongside, and the boat had come to a standstill. Everything on earth seemed taking a contemplative rest, as if waiting to hear the avowal of something from his lips. At that instant he appeared to break a resolution hitherto zealously kept. Leaving his seat amidships he came and gently edged himself down beside her upon the narrow seat at the stern. She breathed more quickly and warmly, he took her right hand in his own right, it was not withdrawn. He put his left hand behind her neck till it came round upon her left cheek, it was not thrust away. Lightly pressing her, he brought her face and mouth towards his own, when, at this the very brink, some unaccountable thought or spell within him suddenly made him halt even now and as it seemed as much to himself as to her, he timidly whispered may I. Her endeavor was to say no, so denuded of its flesh and sinews that its nature would hardly be recognized, or in other words a no from so near the affirmative frontier as to be affected with the yes accent. It was thus a whispered no, drawn out to nearly a quarter of a minute's length, 
the O making itself audible as a sound like the spring coo of a pigeon on unusually friendly terms with its mate. Though conscious of her success in producing the kind of word she had wished to produce, she at the same time trembled in suspense as to how it would be taken. But the time available for doubt was so short as to admit of scarcely more than half a pulsation, pressing closer he kissed her. Then he kissed her again with a longer kiss. It was the supremely happy moment of their experience. The bloom and the purple light were strong on the lineaments of both. Their hearts could hardly believe the evidence of their lips. I love you, and you love me, Cytheria he whispered. She did not deny it, and all seemed well. The gentle sounds around them from the hills, the plains, the distant town, the adjacent shore, the water heaving at their side, the kiss and the long kiss, were all many a voice of one delight, and in unison with each other. But his mind flew back to the same unpleasant thought which had been connected with the resolution he had broken a minute or two earlier. I could be a slave at my profession to win you, Cytheria, I would work at the meanest, honest trade to be near you much less claim you as mine, I would anything. But I have not told you all, it is not this, you don't know what there is yet to tell. Could you forgive as you can love? She was alarmed to see that he had become pale with the question. No do not speak, he said. I have kept something from you, which has now become the cause of a great uneasiness. I had no right to love you, but I did it. Something forbade. What? she exclaimed. Something forbade me till the kiss yes, till the kiss came, and now nothing shall forbid it will hope in spite of all. I must, however, speak of this love of ours to your brother. Dearest, you had better go indoors whilst I meet him at the station, and explain everything. Cytheria's short-lived bliss was dead and gone. Oh! If she had known of this sequel would she have allowed him to break down the barrier of mere acquaintanceship never, never. Will you not explain to me, she faintly urged. Doubt indefinite, carking doubt had taken possession of her. Not now. You alarm yourself unnecessarily, he said tenderly. My only reason for keeping silence is that with my present knowledge I may tell an untrue story. It may be that there is nothing to tell. I am to blame for haste in alluding to any such thing. Forgive me, sweet forgive me. Her heart was ready to burst, and she could not answer him. He returned to his place and took to the oars. They again made for the distant esplanade, now, with its line of houses, lying like a dark grey band against the light western sky. The sun had set, and a star or two began to peep out. They drew near their destination, Edward as he pulled tracing listlessly with his eyes the red stripes upon her scarf, which grew to appear as black ones in the increasing dusk of evening. She surveyed the long line of lamps on the sea wall of the town, now looking small and yellow, and seeming to send long tap roots of fire quivering down deep into the sea. By and by they reached the landing steps. He took her hand as before, and found it as cold as the water about them. It was not relinquished till he reached her door. His assurance had not removed the constraint of her manner, he saw that she blamed him mutely and with her eyes, like a captured sparrow. Left alone, he went and seated himself in a chair on the esplanade. Neither could she go indoors to her solitary room, feeling as she did in such a state of desperate heaviness. When Spring Grove was out of sight she turned back, and arrived at the corner just in time to see him sit down. Then she glided pensively along the pavement behind him forgetting herself to marble like melancholy herself as she mused in his neighborhood unseen. She heard, without heeding, the notes of pianos and singing voices from the fashionable houses at her back, from the open windows of which the lamplight streamed to join that of the orange-hued full moon, newly risen over the bay in front. Then Edward began to pace up and down, and Cytheria, fearing that he would notice her, hastened homeward, flinging him a last look as she passed out of sight. No promise from him to write, no request that she herself would do so nothing but an indefinite expression of hope in the face of some fear unknown to her. Alas, alas! When Owen returned he found she was not in the small sitting room, and creeping upstairs into her bedroom with a light, he discovered her there lying asleep upon the coverlet of the bed, still with her hat and jacket on. 
she had flung herself down on entering, and succumbed to the unwanted oppressiveness that ever attends full-blown love. The wet traces of tears were yet visible upon her long drooping lashes. Love is a sour delight, and sagred grief. A living death, an ever-dying life. Cytheria, he whispered, kissing her. She awoke with a start, and vented an exclamation before recovering her judgment. He's gone she said. He has told me all, said Gray soothingly. He is going off early tomorrow morning. Twas a shame of him to win you away from me, and cruel of you to keep the growth of this attachment a secret. We couldn't help it, she said, and then jumping up Owen, has he told you all? All of your love from beginning to end, he said simply. Edward then had not told more as he ought to have done, yet she could not convict him but she would struggle against his fetters. She tingled to the very solace of her feet at the very possibility that he might be deluding her. Owen, she continued, with dignity, what is he to me? Nothing. I must dismiss such weakness as this believe me, I will. Something far more pressing must drive it away. I have been looking my position steadily in the face, and I must get a living somehow. I mean to advertise once more. Advertising is no use. This one will be. He looked surprised at the sanguine tone of her answer, till she took a piece of paper from the table and showed it him. See what I am going to do, she said sadly, almost bitterly. This was her third effort. Ladies maid. Inexperienced. Age 18 G, Cross Street. Budmouth. Owen Owen the respectable looked blank astonishment. He repeated in a nameless, varying tone, the two words. Ladies maid. Yes, ladies maid. Tis an honest profession, said Cytheria bravely. But you, Cytheria. Yes, I who am I? You will never be a lady's maid never, I am quite sure. I shall try to be, at any rate. Such a disgrace. Nonsense I maintain that it is no disgrace she said rather warmly. You know very well. Well, since you will, you must, he interrupted. Why do you put inexperienced? Because I am. Never mind that scratch out inexperienced. We are poor, Cytheria, aren't we, he murmured, after a silence, and it seems that the two months will close my engagement here. We can put up with being poor, she said, if they only give us work to do. Yes, we desire as a blessing what was given us as a curse, and even that is denied. However, be cheerful, Owen, and never mind. In justice to desponding men, it is as well to remember that the brighter endurance of women at these epochs invaluable, sweet, angelic, as it is owes more of its origin to a narrower vision that shuts out many of the leaden-eyed despairs in the van, than to a hopefulness intense enough to quell them. For the events of one day. August the 4th. Till 4 o'clock. The early part of the next week brought an answer to Cytheria's last note of hope in the way of advertisement not from a distance of hundreds of miles, London, Scotland, Ireland, the continent as Cytheria seemed to think it must, to be in keeping with the means adopted for obtaining it, but from a place in the neighborhood of that in which she was living a country mansion not twenty miles off. The reply ran thus. Knapwater House. August. Miss Aldclyffe is in want of a young person as lady's maid. The duties of the place are light. Miss Aldclyffe will be in Budmouth on Thursday, when should she still not have heard of a place she would like to see her at the Belvedere Hotel, Esplanade, at four o'clock. No answer need be returned to this note. A little earlier than the time named, Cytheria, clothed in a modest bonnet, and a black silk jacket, turned down to the hotel. Expectation, the fresh air from the water, the bright, far-extending outlook, raised the most delicate of pink colors to her cheeks, and restored to her tread a portion of that elasticity which her past troubles, and thoughts of Edward, had well nigh taken away. She entered the vestibule, and went to the window of the bar. Is Miss Aldclyffe here, she said to a nicely dressed barmaid in the foreground who was talking to a landlady covered with chains, knobs and clamps of gold, 
in the background. No, she isn't, said the barmaid, not very civilly. Cytheria looked a shade too pretty for a plain dresser. Miss Aldclyffe is expected here, the landlady said to a third person, out of sight, in the tone of one who had known for several days the fact newly discovered from Cytheria. Get ready her room be quick. From the alacrity with which the order was given and taken, it seemed to Cytheria that Miss Aldclyffe must be a woman of considerable importance. You are to have an interview with Miss Aldclyffe here, the landlady inquired. Yes. The young person had better wait, continued the landlady. With the money taker's intuition she had rightly divined that Cytheria would bring no profit to the house. Cytheria was shown into a nondescript chamber, on the shady side of the building, which appeared to be either bedroom or dayroom, as occasion necessitated, and was one of a suite at the end of the first floor corridor. The prevailing color of the walls, curtains, carpet and coverings of furniture, was more or less blue, to which the cold light coming from the northeasterly sky, and falling on a wide roof of new slates the only object the small window commanded imparted a more striking paleness. But underneath the door, communicating with the next room of the suite, gleamed an infinitesimally small, yet very powerful, fraction of contrast a very thin line of ruddy light, showing that the sun beamed strongly into this room adjoining. The line of radiance was the only cheering thing visible in the place. People give way to very infantine thoughts and actions when they wait, the battlefield of life is temporarily fenced off by a hard and fast line the interview. Cytheria fixed her eyes idly upon the streak, and began picturing a wonderful paradise on the other side as the source of such a beam reminding her of the well-known good deed in a naughty world. Whilst she watched the particles of dust floating before the brilliant chink she heard a carriage and horses stop opposite the front of the house. Afterwards came the rustle of a lady's skirts down the corridor, and into the room communicating with the one Cytheria occupied. The golden line vanished in parts like the phosphorescent streak caused by the striking of a match, there was the fall of a light footstep on the floor just behind it, then a pause. Then the foot tapped impatiently, and there's no one here was spoken imperiously by a lady's tongue. No, madam, in the next room. I am going to fetch her, said the attendant. That will do or you needn't go in, I will call her. Cytheria had risen and she advanced to the middle door with the chink under it as the servant retired. She had just laid her hand on the knob, when it slipped round within her fingers, and the door was pulled open from the other side. Four o'clock. The direct blaze of the afternoon sun, partly refracted through the crimson curtains of the window, and heightened by reflections from the crimson flock paper which covered the walls, and a carpet on the floor of the same tint, shone with a burning glow round the form of a lady standing close to Cytheria's front with the door in her hand. The stranger appeared to the maiden's eyes fresh from the blue gloom, and assisted by an imagination fresh from nature like a tall black figure standing in the midst of fire. It was the figure of a finely built woman, of spare though not angular proportions. Cytheria involuntarily shaded her eyes with her hand, retreated a step or two, and then she could for the first time see Miss Aldclyffe's face in addition to her outline, lit up by the secondary and softer light that was reflected from the varnished panels of the door. She was not a very young woman, but could boast of much beauty of the majestic autumnal face. Oh, said the lady, come this way. Cytheria followed her to the embrasure of the window. Both the women showed off themselves to advantage as they walked forward in the orange light, and each showed too in her face that she had been struck with her companion's appearance. The warm tint added to Cytheria's face a voluptuousness which youth and a simple life had not yet allowed to express itself there ordinarily, whilst in the elder lady's face it reduced the customary expression, which might have been called sternness, if not harshness, to grandeur, and warmed her decaying complexion with much of the youthful richness it plainly had once possessed. She appeared now no more than five and thirty though she might easily have been ten or a dozen years older. She had clear steady eyes, a Roman nose in its purest form, and also the round prominent chin with which the Caesars are represented in ancient marbles, a mouth expressing a capability for and tendency to strong emotion, habitually controlled by pride. There was a severity about the lower outlines of the face which gave a masculine cast to this portion of her countenance. 
womanly weakness was nowhere visible save in one part the curve of her forehead and brows there it was clear and emphatic. She wore a lace shawl over a brown silk dress, and a net bonnet set with a few blue corn flowers. You inserted the advertisement for a situation as ladies made giving the address, G, Cross Street. Yes, madam. Gray. Yes. I have heard your name Mrs. Morris, my housekeeper, mentioned you, and pointed out your advertisement. This was puzzling intelligence, but there was not time enough to consider it. Where did you live last, continued Miss Aldclyffe. I have never been a servant before. I lived at home. Never been out. I thought too at sight of you that you were too girlish looking to have done much. But why did you advertise with such assurance? It misleads people. I am very sorry, I put inexperienced at first, but my brother said it is absurd to trumpet your own weakness to the world, and would not let it remain. But your mother knew what was right, I suppose. I have no mother, madam. Your father, then. I have no father. Well, she said, more softly, your sisters, aunts, or cousins. They didn't think anything about it. You didn't ask them, I suppose. No. You should have done so, then. Why didn't you? Because I haven't any of them, either. Miss Aldclyffe showed her surprise. You deserve forgiveness then at any rate, child, she said, in a sort of drilly kind tone. However, I am afraid you do not suit me, as I am looking for an elderly person. You see, I want an experienced maid who knows all the usual duties of the office. She was going to add, though I like your appearance, but the words seemed offensive to apply to the lady-like girl before her, and she modified them to, though I like you much. I am sorry I misled you, madam, said Cytherea. Miss Aldclyffe stood in a reverie, without replying. Good afternoon, continued Cytherea. Goodbye, Miss Gray I hope you will succeed. Cytherea turned away towards the door. The movement chanced to be one of her masterpieces. It was precise, it had as much beauty as was compatible with precision, and as little coquettishness as was compatible with beauty. And she had in turning looked over her shoulder at the other lady with a faint accent of reproach in her face. Those who remember Groitie's head of a girl, have an idea of Cytherea's look askance at the turning. It is not for a man to tell fishers of men how to set out their fascinations so as to bring about the highest possible average of takes within the year, but the action that tugs the hardest of all at an emotional beholder is this sweet method of turning which steals the bosom away and leaves the eyes behind. Now Miss Aldclyffe herself was no tyro at wheeling. When Cytherea had closed the door upon her, she remained for some time in her motionless attitude, listening to the gradually dying sound of the maiden's retreating footsteps. She murmured to herself, it is almost worthwhile to be bored with instructing her in order to have a creature who could glide round my luxurious indolent body in that manner, and look at me in that way I warrant how light her fingers are upon one's head and neck. What a silly modest young thing she is, to go away so suddenly as that she rang the bell. Ask the young lady who has just left me to step back again, she said to the attendant. Quick or she will be gone. Cytherea was now in the vestibule, thinking that if she had told her history, Miss Aldclyffe might perhaps have taken her into the household, yet her history she particularly wished to conceal from a stranger. When she was recalled she turned back without feeling much surprise. Something, she knew not what, told her she had not seen the last of Miss Aldclyffe. You have somebody to refer me to, of course, the lady said, when Cytherea had re-entered the room. Yes, Mr. Thorne, a solicitor at Aldbrickham. And are you a clever needlewoman? I am considered to be. Then I think that at any rate I will write to Mr. Thorne, said Miss Aldclyffe, with a little smile. It is true, the whole proceeding is very irregular, but my present maid leaves next Monday, and neither of the five I have already seen seem to do for me. Well, I will write to Mr. Thorne, and if his reply is satisfactory, you shall hear from me. It will be as well to set yourself in readiness to come on Monday. 
When Cytheria had again been watched out of the room, Miss Aldclyffe asked for writing materials, that she might at once communicate with Mr. Thorne. She indecisively played with the pen. Suppose Mr. Thorne's reply to be in any way disheartening and even if so from his own imperfect acquaintance with the young creature more than from circumstantial knowledge I shall feel obliged to give her up. Then I shall regret that I did not give her one trial in spite of other people's prejudices. All her account of herself is reliable enough yes, I can see that by her face. I like that face of hers. Miss Aldclyffe put down the pen and left the hotel without writing to Mr. Thorne. V. The events of one day. August the 8th. Morning and afternoon. At post time on that following Monday morning, Cytheria watched so anxiously for the postman, that as the time which must bring him narrowed less and less her vivid expectation had only a degree less tangibility than his presence itself. In another second his form came into view. He brought two letters for Cytheria. One from Miss Aldclyffe, simply stating that she wished Cytheria to come on trial, that she would require her to be at Knapp Waterhouse by Monday evening. The other was from Edward Springrove. He told her that she was the bright spot of his life, that her existence was far dearer to him than his own, that he had never known what it was to love till he had met her. True, he had felt passing attachments to other faces from time to time, but they all had been weak inclinations towards those faces as they then appeared. He loved her past and future, as well as her present. He pictured her as a child, he loved her. He pictured her of sage years, he loved her. He pictured her in trouble, he loved her. Homely friendship entered into his love for her, without which all love was evanescent. He would make one depressing statement. Uncontrollable circumstances a long history, with which it was impossible to acquaint her at present operated to a certain extent as a drag upon his wishes. He had felt this more strongly at the time of their parting than he did now and it was the cause of his abrupt behavior, for which he begged her to forgive him. He saw now an honorable way of freeing himself, and the perception had prompted him to write. In the meantime might he indulge in the hope of possessing her on some bright future day, when by hard labor generated from her own encouraging words, he had placed himself in a position she would think worthy to be shared with him? Dear little letter, she huddled it up. So much more important a love letter seems to a girl than to a man. Springrove was unconsciously clever in his letters, and a man with a talent of that kind may write himself up to a hero in the mind of a young woman who loves him without knowing much about him. Springgrove already stood a cubit higher in her imagination than he did in his shoes. During the day she flitted about the room in an ecstasy of pleasure, packing the things and thinking of an answer which should be worthy of the tender tone of the question, her love bubbling from her involuntarily, like prophesyings from a prophet. In the afternoon Owen went with her to the railway station, and put her in the train for Carry Ford Road, the station nearest to Knapp Waterhouse. Half an hour later she stepped out upon the platform, and found nobody there to receive her though a pony carriage was waiting outside. In two minutes she saw a melancholy man in cheerful livery running towards her from a public house close adjoining, who proved to be the servant sent to fetch her. There are two ways of getting rid of sorrows, one by living them down, the other by drowning them. The coachman drowned his. He informed her that her luggage would be fetched by a spring wagon in about half an hour, then helped her into the chaise and drove off. Her lover's letter, lying close against her neck, fortified her against the restless timidity she had previously felt concerning this new undertaking, and completely furnished her with the confident ease of mind which is required for the critical observation of surrounding objects. It was just that stage in the slow decline of the summer days when the deep, dark, and vacuous hot weather shadows are beginning to be replaced by blue ones that have a surface and substance to the eye. They trotted along the turnpike road for a distance of about a mile, which brought them just outside the village of Carry Ford, and then turned through large lodge gates, on the heavy stone piers of which stood a pair of bitterns cast in bronze. They then entered the park and wound along a drive shaded by old and drooping lime trees, not arranged in the form of an avenue but standing irregularly, sometimes leaving the track completely exposed to the sky, at other times casting a shade over it, 
which almost approached gloom the undersurface of the lowest boughs hanging at a uniform level of six feet above the grass the extreme height to which the nibbling mouths of the cattle could reach. Is that the house, said Cytheria expectantly, catching sight of a grey gable between the trees, and losing it again. No, that's the old manor house or rather all that's left of it. The Aldy Cliffs used to let it sometimes, but it was oftener empty. Tis now divided into three cottages. Respectable people didn't care to live there. Why didn't they? Well, tis so awkward and unhandy. You see so much of it has been pulled down, and the rooms that are left won't do very well for a small residence. Tis so dismal, too, and like most old houses stands too low down in the hollow to be healthy. Do they tell any horrid stories about it? No, not a single one. Ah, that's a pity. Yes, that's what I say. Tis just the house for a nice ghastly hair on end story, that would make the parish religious. Perhaps it will have one some day to make it complete, but there's not a word of the kind now. There, I wouldn't live there for all that. In fact, I couldn't. Oh no, I couldn't. Why couldn't you? The sounds. What are they? One is the waterfall, which stands so close by that you can hear that there waterfall in every room of the house, night or day, ill or well. Tis enough to drive anybody mad, now hark. He stopped the horse. Above the slight common sounds in the air came the unvarying steady rush of falling water from some spot unseen on account of the thick foliage of the grove. There's something awful in the timing of that sound, ain't there, miss? When you say there is, there really seems to be. You said there were two what is the other horrid sound? The pumping engine. That's close by the old house, and sends water up the hill and all over the great house. We shall hear that directly. There, now hark again. From the same direction down the dell they could now hear the whistling creak of cranks, repeated at intervals of half a minute, with the sousing noise between each, a creak, a souse, then another creak, and so on continually. Now if anybody could make shift to live through the other sounds, these would finish him off, don't you think so, miss? That machine goes on night and day, summer and winter, and is hardly ever greased or visited. Ah, it tries the nerves at night, especially if you are not very well, though we don't often hear it at the great house. That sound is certainly very dismal. They might have the wheel greased. Does Miss Aldclyffe take any interest in these things? Well, scarcely, you see her father doesn't attend to that sort of thing as he used to. The engine was once quite his hobby. But now he's getting old and very seldom goes there. How many are there in family? Only her father and herself. He's a old man of seventy. I had thought that Miss Aldclyffe was sole mistress of the property, and lived here alone. No, M. the coachman was continually checking himself thus, being about to style her Miss involuntarily, and then recollecting that he was only speaking to the new lady's maid. She will soon be mistress, however, I am afraid, he continued as if speaking by a spirit of prophecy denied to ordinary humanity. The poor old gentleman has decayed very fast lately. The man then drew a long breath. Why did you breathe sadly like that, said Cytheria. Ah! When he's dead peace will be all over with us old servants. I expect to see the old house turned inside out. She will marry, do you mean? Marry not she I wish she would. No. In her soul she's as solitary as Robinson Crusoe, though she has acquaintances in plenty, if not relations. There's the rector, Mr. Ronham he's a relation by marriage yet she's quite distant towards him. And people say that if she keeps single there will be hardly a life between Mr. Ronham and the heirship of the estate. Dang it, she don't care. She's an extraordinary picture of womankind very extraordinary. In what way besides? You'll know soon enough, miss. She has had seven ladies' maids this last twelve month. I assure you tis one body's work to fetch em from the station and take em back again. The Lord must be a neglectful party at heart, or he'd never permit such overbearing goings-on. Does she dismiss them directly they come? 
not at all she never dismisses them they go themselves. Yes see tis like this. She's got a very quick temper, she flees in a passion with them for nothing at all, next morning they come up and say they are going, she's sorry for it and wishes they'd stay, but she's as proud as a Lucifer, and her pride won't let her say, stay, and away they go. Tis like this in fact. If you say to her about anybody, ah, poor thing she says, pooh indeed if you say, pooh, indeed ah, poor thing she says directly. She hangs the chief baker, as mid be, and restores the chief butler, as mid be, though the devil but Pharaoh herself can see the difference between them. Cytherea was silent. She feared she might be again a burden to her brother. However, you stand a very good chance, the man went on, for I think she likes you more than common. I have never known her send the pony carriage to meet one before, tis always the trap, but this time she said, in a very particular lady-like tone, Rupert, J.O. with the pony carriage. There, tis true, pony and carriage too are getting rather shabby now, he added, looking round upon the vehicle as if to keep Cytherea's pride within reasonable limits. Tis to be hoped you'll please in dressin her tonight. Why tonight? There's a dinner party of seventeen, tis her father's birthday, and she's very particular about her looks at such times. Now see, this is the house. Livelier up here, isn't it, miss? They were now on rising ground, and had just emerged from a clump of trees. Still a little higher than where they stood was situated the mansion, called Knapwater House, the offices gradually losing themselves among the trees behind. Evening The house was regularly and substantially built of clean grey freestone throughout, in that plainer fashion of Greek classicism which prevailed at the latter end of the last century when the copyists called designers had grown weary of fantastic variations in the Roman orders. The main block approximated to a square on the ground plan, having a projection in the center of each side, surmounted by a pediment. From each angle of the inferior side ran a line of buildings lower than the rest, turning inwards again at their further end, and forming within them a spacious open court, within which resounded an echo of astonishing clearness. These erections were in their turn backed by ivy-covered ice houses, laundries, and stables, the whole mass of subsidiary buildings being half buried beneath close-set shrubs and trees. There was opening sufficient through the foliage on the right hand to enable her on nearer approach to form an idea of the arrangement of the remoter or lawn front also. The natural features and contour of this quarter of the site had evidently dictated the position of the house primarily, and were of the ordinary, and upon the whole, most satisfactory kind, namely, a broad, graceful slope running from the terrace beneath the walls to the margin of a placid lake lying below, upon the surface of which a dozen swans and a green punt floated at leisure. An irregular wooded island stood in the midst of the lake, beyond this and the further margin of the water were plantations and greensward of varied outlines, the trees heightening, by half failing, the softness of the exquisite landscape stretching behind. The glimpses she had obtained of this portion were now checked by the angle of the building. In a minute or two they reached the side door, at which Cytherea alighted. She was welcomed by an elderly woman of lengthy smiles and general pleasantness, who announced herself to be Mrs. Morris, the housekeeper. M.R.S. Gray, I believe, she said. I am not oh yes, yes, we are all mistresses, said Cytherea, smiling, but forcedly. The title accorded her seemed disagreeably like the first slight scar of a brand, and she thought of Owen's prophecy. Mrs. Morris led her into a comfortable parlor called the room. Here tea was made ready, and Cytherea sat down, looking, whenever occasion allowed, at Mrs. Morris with great interest and curiosity, to discover, if possible, something in her which should give a clue to the secret of her knowledge of herself, and the recommendation based upon it. But nothing was to be learnt, at any rate just then. Mrs. Morris was perpetually getting up, feeling in her pockets, going to cupboards, leaving the room two or three minutes, and trotting back again. You'll excuse me, Mrs. Gray, she said, but tis the old gentleman's birthday, and they always have a lot of people to dinner on that day, though he's getting up in years now. However, 
none of them are sleepers she generally keeps the house pretty clear of lodgers being a lady with no intimate friends, though many acquaintances, which, though it gives us less to do, makes it all the duller for the younger maids in the house. Mrs. Morris then proceeded to give in fragmentary speeches an outline of the constitution and government of the estate. Now, are you sure you have quite done tea? Not a bit or drop more. Why, you've eaten nothing, I'm sure. Well, now, it is rather inconvenient that the other maid is not here to show you the ways of the house a little, but she left last Saturday, and Miss Aldclyffe has been making shift with poor old clumsy me for a maid all yesterday and this morning. She is not come in yet. I expect she will ask for you, Mrs. Gray, the first thing. I was going to say that if you have really done tea, I will take you upstairs, and show you through the wardrobes Miss Aldclyffe's things are not laid out for tonight yet. She preceded Cytheria upstairs, pointed out her own room, and then took her into Miss Aldclyffe's dressing room, on the first floor, where, after explaining the whereabouts of various articles of apparel, the housekeeper left her, telling her that she had an hour yet upon her hands before dressing time. Cytheria laid out upon the bed in the next room all that she had been told would be required that evening, and then went again to the little room which had been appropriated to herself. Here she sat down by the open window, leant out upon the sill like another blessed damsel, and listlessly looked down upon the brilliant pattern of colors formed by the flower beds on the lawn now richly crowded with late summer blossom. But the vivacity of spirit which had hitherto enlivened her, was fast ebbing under the pressure of prosaic realities, and the warm scarlet of the geraniums, glowing most conspicuously, and mingling with the vivid cold red and green of the verbenas, the rich depth of the dahlia, and the ripe mellowness of the calceolaria, backed by the pale hue of a flock of meek sheep feeding in the open park, close to the other side of the fence, were, to a great extent, lost upon her eyes. She was thinking that nothing seemed worthwhile, that it was possible she might die in a workhouse, and what did it matter? The petty, vulgar details of servitude that she had just passed through, her dependence upon the whims of a strange woman, the necessity of quenching all individuality of character in herself, and relinquishing her own peculiar tastes to help on the wheel of this alien establishment, made her sick and sad, and she almost longed to pursue some free, out-of-doors employment sleep under trees or a hut, and know no enemy but winter and cold weather, like shepherds and cowkeepers, and birds and animals I, like the sheep she saw there under her window. She looked sympathizingly at them for several minutes, imagining their enjoyment of the rich grass. Yes like those sheep, she said aloud, and her face reddened with surprise at a discovery she made that very instant. The flock consisted of some ninety or a hundred young stock ewes, the surface of their fleece was as rounded and even as a cushion, and white as milk. Now she had just observed that on the left buttock of every one of them were marked in distinct red letters the initials E.S. E.S. could bring to Cytheria's mind only one thought, but that immediately and forever the name of her lover, Edward Springrove. Oh, if it should be she interrupted her words by a resolve. Miss Aldclyffe's carriage at the same moment made its appearance in the drive but Miss Aldclyffe was not her object now. It was to ascertain to whom the sheep belonged, and to set her surmise at rest one way or the other. She flew downstairs to Mrs. Morris. Whose sheep are those in the park, Mrs. Morris? Farmer Springrove's. What Farmer Springrove is that, she said quickly. Why, surely you know. Your friend, Farmer Springrove, the cider maker and who keeps the three tranters in, who recommended you to me when he came in to see me the other day. Cytheria's mother would suddenly warned her in the midst of her excitement that it was necessary not to betray the secret of her love. Oh yes, she said, of course. Her thoughts had run as follows in that short interval. Farmer Springrove is Edward's father, and his name is Edward too. Edward knew I was going to advertise for a situation of some kind. He watched the times, and saw it, my address being attached. He thought it would be excellent for me to be here that we might meet whenever he came home. He told his father that I might be recommended as a lady's maid, and he knew my brother and myself. His father told Mrs. Morris, Mrs. Morris told Miss Aldclyffe. 
The whole chain of incidents that drew her there was plain, and there was no such thing as chance in the matter. It was all Edward's doing. The sound of a bell was heard. Cytheria did not heed it, and still continued in her reverie. That's Miss Aldclyffe's bell, said Mrs. Morris. I suppose it is, said the young woman placidly. Well, it means that you must go up to her, the matron continued, in a tone of surprise. Cytheria felt a burning heat come over her, mingled with a sudden irritation at Mrs. Morris's hint. But the good sense which had recognized stern necessity prevailed over rebellious independence, the flush passed, and she said hastily. Yes, yes, of course, I must go to her when she pulls the bell whether I want to or no. However, in spite of this painful reminder of her new position in life, Cytheria left the apartment in a mood far different from the gloomy sadness of ten minutes previous. The place felt like home to her now, she did not mind the pettiness of her occupation, because Edward evidently did not mind it, and this was Edward's own spot. She found time on her way to Miss Aldclyffe's dressing room to hurriedly glide out by a side door, and look for a moment at the unconscious sheep bearing the friendly initials. She went up to them to try to touch one of the flock, and felt vexed that they all stared skeptically at her kind advances, and then ran pell-mell down the hill. Then, fearing anyone should discover her childish movements, she slipped indoors again, and ascended the staircase, catching glimpses, as she passed of silver-buttoned footmen, who flashed about the passages like lightning. Miss Aldclyffe's dressing room was an apartment which, on a casual survey, conveyed an impression that it was available for almost any purpose save the adornment of the feminine person. In its hours of perfect order nothing pertaining to the toilet was visible, even the inevitable mirrors with their accessories were arranged in a roomy recess not noticeable from the door, lighted by a window of its own, called the dressing window. The washing stand figured as a vast oak chest, carved with grotesque Renaissance ornament. The dressing table was in appearance something between a high altar and a cabinet piano, the surface being richly worked in the same style of semi-classic decoration, but the extraordinary outline having been arrived at by an ingenious joiner and decorator from the neighboring town, after months of painful toil in cutting and fitting, under Miss Aldclyffe's immediate eye the materials being the remains of two or three old cabinets the lady had found in the lumber room. About two-thirds of the floor was carpeted, the remaining portion being laid with parquetry of light and dark woods. Miss Aldclyffe was standing at the larger window, away from the dressing niche. She bowed, and said pleasantly, I am glad you have come. We shall get on capitally, I dare say. Her bonnet was off. Cytheria did not think her so handsome as on the earlier day, the queenliness of her beauty was harder and less warm. But a worse discovery than this was that Miss Aldclyffe, with the usual obliviousness of rich people to their dependents' specialties, seemed to have quite forgotten Cytheria's inexperience, and mechanically delivered up her body to her handmaid without a thought of details, and with a mild yawn. Everything went well at first. The dress was removed. Stockings and black boots were taken off, and silk stockings and white shoes were put on. Miss Aldclyffe then retired to bathe her hands and face, and Cytheria drew breath. If she could get through this first evening, all would be right. She felt that it was unfortunate that such a crucial test for her powers as a birthday dinner should have been applied on the threshold of her arrival, but set to again. Miss Aldclyffe was now arrayed in a white dressing gown and dropped languidly into an easy chair, pushed up before the glass. The instincts of her sex and her own practice told Cytheria the next movement. She let Miss Aldclyffe's hair fall about her shoulders, and began to arrange it. It proved to be all real, a satisfaction. Miss Aldclyffe was musingly looking on the floor, and the operation went on for some minutes in silence. At length her thoughts seemed to turn to the present, and she lifted her eyes to the glass. Why, what on earth are you doing with my head, she exclaimed, with widely opened eyes. At the words she felt the back of Cytheria's little hand tremble against her neck. Perhaps you prefer it done the other fashion, madam, said the maiden. No, no, that's the fashion right enough, but you must make more show of my hair than that, or I shall have to buy some, which God forbid. It is how I do my own, 
said Cytherea naively, and with a sweetness of tone that would have pleased the most acrimonious under favourable circumstances, but tyranny was in the ascendant with Miss Aldclyffe at this moment, and she was assured of palatable food for her vice by having felt the trembling of Cytherea's hand. Yours, indeed your hair come, go on. Considering that Cytherea possessed at least five times as much of that valuable auxiliary to woman's beauty as the lady before her, there was at the same time some excuse for Miss Aldclyffe's outburst. She remembered herself, however, and said more quietly, Now then, Gray by the by, what do they call you downstairs? M.R.S. Gray, said the handmaid. Then tell them not to do any such absurd thing not but that it is quite according to usage, but you are too young yet. This dialogue tided Cytherea safely onward through the hairdressing till the flowers and diamonds were to be placed upon the lady's brow. Cytherea began arranging them tastefully, and to the very best of her judgment. That won't do, said Miss Aldclyffe harshly. Why? I look too young and old dressed doll. Will that, madam? No, I look a fright a perfect fright. This way, perhaps. Heavens don't worry me so. She shut her lips like a trap. Having once worked herself up to the belief that her headdress was to be a failure that evening, no cleverness of Cytherea's in arranging it could please her. She continued in a smoldering passion during the remainder of the performance, keeping her lips firmly closed, and the muscles of her body rigid. Finally, snatching up her gloves, and taking her handkerchief and fan in her hand, she silently sailed out of the room, without betraying the least consciousness of another woman's presence behind her. Cytherea's fears that at the undressing this suppressed anger would find a vent, kept her on thorns throughout the evening. She tried to read, she could not. She tried to sew, she could not. She tried to muse, she could not do that connectedly. If this is the beginning, what will the end be she said in a whisper, and felt many misgivings as to the policy of being over hasty in establishing an independence at the expense of congruity with a cherished past. Midnight. The clock struck twelve. The Aldclyffe state dinner was over. The company had all gone, and Miss Aldclyffe's bell rang loudly and jerkingly. Cytherea started to her feet at the sound, which broke in upon a fitful sleep that had overtaken her. She had been sitting drearily in her chair waiting minute after minute for the signal, her brain in that state of intentness which takes cognizance of the passage of time as a real motion motion without matter the instant's throbbing past in the company of a feverish pulse. She hastened to the room, to find the lady sitting before the dressing shrine, illuminated on both sides, and looking so queenly in her attitude of absolute repose that the younger woman felt the awfulest sense of responsibility at her vandalism in having undertaken to demolish so imposing a pile. The lady's jeweled ornaments were taken off in silence some by her own listless hands, some by Cytherea's. Then followed the outer stratum of clothing. The dress being removed, Cytherea took it in her hand and went with it into the bedroom adjoining, intending to hang it in the wardrobe. But on second thoughts, in order that she might not keep Miss Aldclyffe waiting a moment longer than necessary, she flung it down on the first resting place that came to hand, which happened to be the bed, and re-entered the dressing room with the noiseless footfall of a kitten. She paused in the middle of the room. She was unnoticed, and her sudden return had plainly not been expected. During the short time of Cytherea's absence, Miss Aldclyffe had pulled off a kind of chemiset of Brussels net, drawn high above the throat, which she had worn with her evening dress as a semi-opaque covering to her shoulders, and in its place had put her nightgown round her. Her right hand was lifted to her neck, as if engaged in fastening her nightgown. But on a second glance Miss Aldclyffe's proceeding was clearer to Cytherea. She was not fastening her nightgown, it had been carelessly thrown round her, and Miss Aldclyffe was really occupied in holding up to her eyes some small object that she was keenly scrutinizing. And now on suddenly discovering the presence of Cytherea at the back of the apartment, instead of naturally continuing or concluding her inspection, she desisted hurriedly, the tiny snap of a spring was heard, her hand was removed, and she began adjusting her robes. Modesty might have directed her hasty action of enwrapping her shoulders, but it was scarcely likely, considering Miss Aldclyffe's temperament, 
that she had all her life been used to a maid, Cytheria's youth and the elder lady's marked treatment of her as if she were a mere child or plaything. The matter was too slight to reason about, and yet upon the whole it seemed that Miss Aldclyffe must have a practical reason for concealing her neck. With a timid sense of being an intruder Cytheria was about to step back and out of the room, but at the same moment Miss Aldclyffe turned, saw the impulse, and told her companion to stay, looking into her eyes as if she had half an intention to explain something. Cytheria felt certain it was the little mystery of her late movements. The other withdrew her eyes, Cytheria went to fetch the dressing gown, and wheeled round again to bring it up to Miss Aldclyffe, who had now partly removed her night dress to put it on the proper way, and still sat with her back towards Cytheria. Her neck was again quite open and uncovered, and though hidden from the direct line of Cytheria's vision, she saw it reflected in the glass the fair white surface, and the inimitable combination of curves between throat and bosom which artists adore, being brightly lit up by the light burning on either side. And the lady's prior proceedings were now explained in the simplest manner. In the midst of her breast, like an island in a sea of pearl, reclined an exquisite little gold locket, embellished with arabesque work of blue, red and white enamel. That was undoubtedly what Miss Aldclyffe had been contemplating, and, moreover, not having been put off with her other ornaments, it was to be retained during the night a slight departure from the custom of ladies which Miss Aldclyffe had at first not cared to exhibit to her new assistant, though now, on further thought, she seemed to have become indifferent on the matter. My dressing gown, she said, quietly fastening her night dress as she spoke. Cytheria came forward with it. Miss Aldclyffe did not turn her head, but looked inquiringly at her maid in the glass. You saw what I wear on my neck, I suppose, she said to Cytheria's reflected face. Yes, madam, I did, said Cytheria to Miss Aldclyffe's reflected face. Miss Aldclyffe again looked at Cytheria's reflection as if she were on the point of explaining. Again she checked her resolve, and said lightly. Few of my maids discover that I wear it always. I generally keep it a secret not that it matters much. But I was careless with you, and seemed to want to tell you. You win me to make confidences that. She ceased, took Cytheria's hand in her own, lifted the locket with the other, touched the spring and disclosed a miniature. It is a handsome face, is it not? She whispered mournfully, and even timidly. It is. But the sight had gone through Cytheria like an electric shock and there was an instantaneous awakening of perception in her, so thrilling in its presence as to be well nigh insupportable. The face in the miniature was the face of her own father younger and fresher than she had ever known him but her father. Was this the woman of his wild and unquenchable early love? And was this the woman who had figured in the gate man's story as answering the name of Cytheria before her judgment was awake? Surely it was. And if so, here was the tangible outcrop of a romantic and hidden stratum of the past hitherto seen only in her imagination, but as far as her scope allowed, clearly defined therein by reason of its strangeness. Miss Aldclyffe's eyes and thoughts were so intent upon the miniature that she had not been conscious of Cytheria's start of surprise. She went on speaking in a low and abstracted tone. Yes, I lost him. She interrupted her words by a short meditation, and went on again. I lost him by excess of honesty as regarded my past. But it was best that it should be so. I was led to think rather more than usual of the circumstances tonight because of your name. It is pronounced the same way, though differently spelt. The only means by which Cytheria's surname could have been spelt to Miss Aldclyffe must have been by Mrs. Morris or Farmer Springrove. She fancied Farmer Springrove would have spelt it properly if Edward was his informant which made Miss Aldclyffe's remark obscure. Women make confidences and then regret them. The impulsive rush of feeling which had led Miss Aldclyffe to indulge in this revelation, trifling as it was, died out immediately her words were beyond recall, and the turmoil, occasioned in her by dwelling upon that chapter of her life, found vent in another kind of emotion the result of a trivial accident. Cytheria, after letting down Miss Aldclyffe's hair, adopted some plan with it to which the lady had not been accustomed. A rapid revulsion to irritation ensued. The maiden's mere touch seemed to discharge the pent-up regret of the lady as if she had been a jar of electricity. 
How strangely you treat my hair! she exclaimed. A silence. I have told you what I never tell my maids as a rule, of course nothing that I say in this room is to be mentioned outside it. She spoke crossly no less than emphatically. It shall not be, madam, said Cytherea, agitated and vexed that the woman of her romantic wonderings should be so disagreeable to her. Why on earth did I tell you of my past, she went on. Cytherea made no answer. The lady's vexation with herself, and the accident which had led to the disclosure swelled little by little till it knew no bounds. But what was done could not be undone, and though Cytherea had shown a most winning responsiveness, quarrel Miss Aldclyffe must. She recurred to the subject of Cytherea's want of expertness, like a bitter reviewer, who finding the sentiments of a poet unimpeachable, quarrels with his rhymes. Never, never before did I serve myself such a trick as this in engaging a maid she waited for an expostulation, none came. Miss Aldclyffe tried again. The idea of my taking a girl without asking her more than three questions, or having a single reference, all because of her good L, the shape of her face and body it was a fool's trick. There, I am served right, quite right by being deceived in such a way. I didn't deceive you, said Cytherea. The speech was an unfortunate one, and was the very fuel to maintain its fires that the other's petulance desired. You did, she said hotly. I told you I couldn't promise to be acquainted with every detail of routine just at first. Will you contradict me in this way you are telling untruths, I say. Cytherea's lip quivered. I would answer the remark if if. If what? If it were a lady's. You girl of impudence what do you say? Leave the room this instant, I tell you. And I tell you that a person who speaks to a lady as you do to me, is no lady herself. To a lady. A lady's maid speaks in this way. The idea. Don't ladies maid me, nobody is my mistress I won't have it. Good heavens. I wouldn't have come no I wouldn't if I had known. What? That you were such an ill-tempered, unjust woman. Possiest beyond the muse's painting, Miss Aldclyffe exclaimed. A woman? Am I I'll teach you if I am a woman and lifted her hand as if she would have liked to strike her companion. This stung the maiden into absolute defiance. I dare you to touch me she cried. Strike me if you dare, madam I am not afraid of you what do you mean by such an action as that? Miss Aldclyffe was disconcerted at this unexpected show of spirit, and ashamed of her unladylike impulse now it was put into words. She sank back in the chair. I was not going to strike you go to your room I beg you to go to your room she repeated in a husky whisper. Cytherea, red and panting, took up her candlestick and advanced to the table to get a light. As she stood close to them the rays from the candle struck sharply on her face. She usually bore a much stronger likeness to her mother than to her father, but now, looking with a grave, reckless and angered expression of countenance at the kindling wick as she held it slanting into the other flame, her father's features were distinct in her. It was the first time Miss Aldclyffe had seen her in a passionate mood, and wearing that expression which was invariably its concomitant. It was Miss Aldclyffe's turn to start now, and the remark she made was an instance of that sudden change of tone from high-flown invective to the pettiness of curiosity which so often makes women's quarrels ridiculous. Even Miss Aldclyffe's dignity had not sufficient power to postpone the absorbing desire she now felt to settle the strange suspicion that had entered her head. You spell your name the common way, G, R, E, Y, don't you, she said, with assumed indifference. No, said Cytherea, poised on the side of her foot, and still looking into the flame. Yes, surely. The name was spelt that way on your boxes. I looked and saw it myself. The enigma of Miss Aldclyffe's mistake was solved. Oh, was it, said Cytherea. Ah, I remember Mrs. Jackson, the lodging house keeper at Budmouth, labeled them. We spell our name G, R, A, Y, E. What was your father's trade? Cytherea thought it would be useless to attempt to conceal facts any longer. His was not a trade, she said. He was an architect. The idea of your being an architect's daughter. There's nothing to offend you in that, 
I hope. Oh no. Why did you say the idea? Leave that alone. Did he ever visit in Gower Street, Bloomsbury, one Christmas, many years ago, but you would not know that. I have heard him say that Mr. Huntway, a curate somewhere in that part of London, and who died there, was an old college friend of his. What is your Christian name? Cytheria. No and is it really? And you knew that face I showed you? Yes, I see you did. Miss Aldclyffe stopped, and closed her lips impassibly. She was a little agitated. Do you want me any longer, said Cytheria, standing candle in hand and looking quietly in Miss Aldclyffe's face. Well no, no longer, said the other lingeringly. With your permission, I will leave the house tomorrow morning, madam. Ah! Miss Aldclyffe had no notion of what she was saying. And I know you will be so good as not to intrude upon me during the short remainder of my stay. Saying this Cytheria left the room before her companion had answered. Miss Aldclyffe, then, had recognized her at last, and had been curious about her name from the beginning. The other members of the household had retired to rest. As Cytheria went along the passage leading to her room her skirts rustled against the partition. A door on her left opened, and Mrs. Morris looked out. I waited out of bed till you came up, she said, it being your first night, in case you should be at a loss for anything. How have you got on with Miss Aldclyffe? Pretty well though not so well as I could have wished. Has she been scolding? A little. She's a very odd lady tis all one way or the other with her. She's not bad at heart, but unbearable in close quarters. Those of us who don't have much to do with her personally, stay on for years and years. Has Miss Aldclyffe's family always been rich, said Cytheria. Oh no. The property, with the name, came from her mother's uncle. Her family is a branch of the old Aldclyffe family on the maternal side. Her mother married a Bradley a mere nobody at that time and was on that account cut by her relations. But very singularly the other branch of the family died out one by one three of them, and Miss Aldclyffe's great-uncle then left all his property, including this estate, to Captain Bradley and his wife Miss Aldclyffe's father and mother on condition that they took the old family name as well. There's all about it in the landed gentry. Tis a thing very often done. Oh, I see. Thank you. Well, now I am going. Good night. Six the events of twelve hours. August the ninth. One to two o'clock a.m. Cytheria entered her bedroom, and flung herself on the bed, bewildered by a whirl of thought. Only one subject was clear in her mind, and it was that, in spite of family discoveries, that day was to be the first and last of her experience as a lady's maid. Starvation itself should not compel her to hold such a humiliating post for another instant. Ah she thought, with a sigh, at the martyrdom of her last little fragment of self-conceit, Owen knows everything better than I dot. She jumped up and began making ready for her departure in the morning, the tears streaming down when she grieved and wondered what practical matter on earth she could turn her hand to next. All these preparations completed, she began to undress, her mind unconsciously drifting away to the contemplation of her late surprises. To look in the glass for an instant at the reflection of her own magnificent resources in face and bosom, and to mark their attractiveness unadorned, was perhaps but the natural action of a young woman who had so lately been chidden whilst passing through the harassing experience of decorating an older beauty of Miss Aldclyffe's temper. But she directly checked her weakness by sympathizing reflections on the hidden troubles which must have thronged the past years of the solitary lady, to keep her, though so rich and courted in a mood so repellent and gloomy as that in which Cytheria found her, and then the young girl marvelled again and again, as she had marvelled before, at the strange confluence of circumstances which had brought herself into contact with the one woman in the world whose history was so romantically intertwined with her own. She almost began to wish she were not obliged to go away and leave the lonely being to loneliness still. In bed and in the dark, Miss Aldclyffe haunted her mind more persistently than ever. Instead of sleeping, she called up staring visions of the possible past of this queenly lady, her mother's rival. 
Up the long vista of bygone years she saw, behind all, the young girl's flirtation, little or much, with the cousin, that seemed to have been nipped in the bud, or to have terminated hastily in some way. Then the secret meetings between Miss Aldclyffe and the other woman at the Little Inn at Hammersmith and other places, the commonplace name she adopted, her swoon at some painful news, and the very slight knowledge the elder female had of her partner in mystery. Then, more than a year afterwards, the acquaintanceship of her own father with this his first love, the awakening of the passion, his acts of devotion, the unreasoning heat of his rapture, her tacit acceptance of it, and yet her uneasiness under the delight. Then his declaration amid the evergreens, the utter change produced in her manner thereby, seemingly the result of a rigid determination, and the total concealment of her reason by herself and her parents, whatever it was. Then the lady's course dropped into darkness, and nothing more was visible till she was discovered here at Knapwater, nearly fifty years old, still unmarried and still beautiful, but lonely, embittered, and haughty. Cytheria imagined that her father's image was still warmly cherished in Miss Aldclyffe's heart, and was thankful that she herself had not been betrayed into announcing that she knew many particulars of this page of her father's history, and the chief one the lady's unaccountable renunciation of him. It would have made her bearing towards the mistress of the mansion more awkward, and would have been no benefit to either. Thus conjuring up the past, and theorizing on the present, she lay restless, changing her posture from one side to the other and back again. Finally, when courting sleep with all her art, she heard a clock strike two. A minute later, and she fancied she could distinguish a soft rustle in the passage outside her room. To bury her head in the sheets was her first impulse, then to uncover it, raise herself on her elbow, and stretch her eyes wide open in the darkness, her lips being parted with the intentness of her listening. Whatever the noise was, it had ceased for the time. It began again and came close to her door, lightly touching the panels. Then there was another stillness, Cytheria made a movement which caused a faint rustling of the bed clothes. Before she had time to think another thought a light tap was given. Cytheria breathed, the person outside was evidently bent upon finding her awake, and the rustle she had made had encouraged the hope. The maiden's physical condition shifted from one pole to its opposite. The cold sweat of terror forsook her, and modesty took the alarm. She became hot and red, her door was not locked. A distinct woman's whisper came to her through the keyhole, Cytheria. Only one being in the house knew her Christian name, and that was Miss Aldclyffe. Cytheria stepped out of bed, went to the door, and whispered back, Yes. Let me come in, darling. The young woman paused in a conflict between judgment and emotion. It was now mistress and maid no longer, woman and woman only. Yes, she must let her come in, poor thing. She got a light in an instant, opened the door, and raising her eyes and the candle, saw Miss Aldclyffe standing outside in her dressing gown. Now you see that it is really myself, put out the light, said the visitor. I want to stay here with you, Scythe. I came to ask you to come down into my bed, but it is snugger here. But remember that you are mistress in this room, and that I have no business here, and that you may send me away if you choose. Shall I go? Oh no, you shan't indeed if you don't want to, said Scythe generously. The instant they were in bed Miss Aldclyffe freed herself from the last remnant of restraint. She flung her arms round the young girl, and pressed her gently to her heart. Now kiss me, she said. Cytheria, upon the whole, was rather discomposed at this change of treatment, and, discomposed or no, her passions were not so impetuous as Miss Aldclyffe's. She could not bring her soul to her lips for a moment, try how she would. Come, kiss me, repeated Miss Aldclyffe. Cytheria gave her a very small one, as soft in touch and in sound as the bursting of a bubble. More earnestly than that come. She gave another, a little but not much more expressively. I don't deserve a more feeling one, I suppose, said Miss Aldclyffe with an emphasis of sad bitterness in her tone. I am an ill-tempered woman, you think, half out of my mind. Well, perhaps I am, 
but I have had grief more than you can think or dream of. But I can't help loving you your name is the same as mine isn't it strange? Cytheria was inclined to say no, but remained silent. Now, don't you think I must love you, continued the other. Yes, said Cytheria absently. She was still thinking whether duty to Owen and her father, which asked for silence on her knowledge of her father's unfortunate love, or duty to the woman embracing her, which seemed to ask for confidence, ought to predominate. Here was a solution. She would wait till Miss Aldclyffe referred to her acquaintanceship and attachment to Cytheria's father in past times, then she would tell her all she knew, that would be honour. Why can't you kiss me as I can kiss you? Why can't you she impressed upon Cytheria's lips a warm motherly salute, given as if in the outburst of strong feeling, long checked, and yearning for something to love and be loved by in return. Do you think badly of me for my behaviour this evening, child? I don't know why I am so foolish as to speak to you in this way. I am a very fool, I believe. Yes. How old are you? Eighteen. Eighteen. Well, why don't you ask me how old I am? Because I don't want to know. Never mind if you don't. I am forty-six, and it gives me greater pleasure to tell you this than it does to you to listen. I have not told my age truly for the last twenty years till now. Why haven't you? I have met deceit by deceit, till I am weary of it weary, weary, and I long to be what I shall never be again artless and innocent, like you. But I suppose that you, too, will, prove to be not worth a thought, as every new friend does on more intimate knowledge. Come, why don't you talk to me, child? Have you said your prayers? Yes no I forgot them tonight. I suppose you say them every night as a rule. Yes. Why do you do that? Because I have always done so, and it would seem strange if I were not to. Do you? I. A wicked old sinner like me no, I never do. I have thought all such matters humbug for years thought so so long that I should be glad to think otherwise from very weariness, and yet, such is the code of the polite world that I subscribe regularly to missionary societies and others of the sort. Well, say your prayers, dear you won't omit them now you recollect it. I should like to hear you very much. Will you? It seems hardly. It would seem so like old times to me when I was young, and nearer far nearer heaven than I am now. Do, sweet one. Cytheria was embarrassed, and her embarrassment arose from the following conjuncture of affairs. Since she had loved Edward Springrove, she had linked his name with her brother Owens in her nightly supplications to the Almighty. She wished to keep her love for him a secret, and, above all, a secret from a woman like Miss Aldclyffe, yet her conscience and the honesty of her love would not for an instant allow her to think of omitting his dear name, and so endanger the efficacy of all her previous prayers for his success by an unworthy shame now, it would be wicked of her, she thought, and a grievous wrong to him. Under any worldly circumstances she might have thought the position justified a little finesse, and have skipped him for once, but prayer was too solemn a thing for such trifling. I would rather not say them, she murmured first. It struck her then that this declining altogether was the same cowardice in another dress, and was delivering her poor Edward over to Satan just as unceremoniously as before. Yes, I will say my prayers, and you shall hear me, she added firmly. She turned her face to the pillow and repeated in low soft tones the simple words she had used from childhood on such occasions. Owen's name was mentioned without faltering, but in the other case, maidenly shyness was too strong even for religion, and that when supported by excellent intentions. At the name of Edward she stammered, and her voice sank to the faintest whisper in spite of her. Thank you, dearest, said Miss Aldclyffe. I have prayed too, I verily believe. You are a good girl, I think. Then the expected question came. Bless Owen, and whom, did you say? There was no help for it now, and out it came. Owen and Edward, said Cytheria. Who are Owen and Edward? Owen is my brother, madam, faltered the maid. Ah, I remember. Who is Edward? A silence. Your brother, 
too, continued Miss Aldclyffe. No. Miss Aldclyffe reflected a moment. Don't you want to tell me who Edward is, she said at last, in a tone of meaning. I don't mind telling, only. You would rather not, I suppose. Yes. Miss Aldclyffe shifted her ground. Were you ever in love, she inquired suddenly. Cytheria was surprised to hear how quickly the voice had altered from tenderness to harshness, vexation, and disappointment. Yes I think I was once, she murmured. Aha and were you ever kissed by a man? A pause. Well, were you, said Miss Aldclyffe, rather sharply. Don't press me to tell I can't indeed, I won't, madam. Miss Aldclyffe removed her arms from Cytheria's neck. Tis now with you as it is always with all girls, she said, in jealous and gloomy accents. You are not, after all, the innocent the first took you for. No, no she then changed her tone with fitful rapidity. Cytheria, try to love me more than you love him do. I love you more sincerely than any man can. Do, Scythe, don't let any man stand between us. Oh. I can't bear that she clasped Cytheria's neck again. I must love him now I have begun, replied the other. Must yes must, said the elder lady reproachfully. Yes, women are all alike. I thought I had at last found an artless woman who had not been sullied by a man's lips, and who had not practiced or been practiced upon by the arts which ruin all the truth and sweetness and goodness in us. Find a girl, if you can whose mouth and ears have not been made a regular highway of by some man or another leave the admittedly notorious spots the drawing rooms of society and look in the villages leave the villages and search in the schools and you can hardly find a girl whose heart has not been had is not an old thing half worn out by some he or another if men only knew the staleness of the freshest of us that nine times out of ten the first love they think they are winning from a woman is but the hulk of an old wrecked affection, fitted with new sails and reused. O oh, can it be that you, too, are like the rest? No, 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 urged Cytheria, awed by the storm she had raised in the impetuous woman's mind. He only kissed me once twice I mean. He might have done it a thousand times if he had cared to, there's no doubt about that, whoever his lordship is. You are as bad as I we are all alike, and I an old fool have been sipping at your mouth as if it were honey because I fancied no wasting lover knew the spot. But a minute ago, and you seemed to me like a fresh spring meadow now you seem a dusty highway. Oh no, no Cytheria was not weak enough to shed tears except on extraordinary occasions, but she was fain to begin sobbing now. She wished Miss Aldclyffe would go to her own room, and leave her and her treasured dreams alone. This vehement imperious affection was in one sense soothing, but yet it was not of the kind that Cytheria's instincts desired. Though it was generous, it seemed somewhat too rank and capricious for endurance. Well, said the lady in continuation, who is he? Her companion was desperately determined not to tell his name, she too much feared a taunt when Miss Aldclyffe's fiery mood again ruled her tongue. Won't you tell me? Not tell me after all the affection I have shown. I will, perhaps, Another day. Did you wear a hat and white feather in Budmouth for the week or two previous to your coming here? Yes. Then I have seen you and your lover at a distance he rode you round the bay with your brother. Yes. And without your brother fie there, there, don't let that little heart beat itself to death, throb, throb, it shakes the bed, you silly thing. I didn't mean that there was any harm in going alone with him. I only saw you from the esplanade, in common with the rest of the people. I often run down to Budmouth. He was a very good figure, now who was he? I, I won't tell, madam I cannot indeed. Won't tell very well, don't. You are very foolish to treasure up his name and image as you do. Why, he has had loves before you, trust him for that, whoever he is, and you are but a temporary link in a long chain of others like you who only have your little day as they have had theirs. Tisn't he true tisn't he true tisn't he true cried Cytheria in an agony of torture. He has never loved anybody else, I know I am sure he hasn't. Miss Aldclyffe was as jealous as any man could have been. 
she continued. He sees a beautiful face and thinks he will never forget it, but in a few weeks the feeling passes off, and he wonders how he could have cared for anybody so absurdly much. No, no, he doesn't what does he do when he has thought that come, tell me tell me. You are as hot as fire, and the throbbing of your heart makes me nervous. I can't tell you if you get in that flustered state. Do, do tell oh, it makes me so miserable but tell come tell me. Ah the tables are turned now, dear she continued, in a tone which mingled pity with derision. Love's passions shall rock thee. As the storm rocks the ravens on high. Bright reason will mock thee. Like the sun from a wintry sky. What does he do next, why, this is what he does next, ruminate on what he has heard of women's romantic impulses, and how easily men torture them when they have given way to those feelings, and have resigned everything for their hero. It may be that though he loves you heartily now that is, as heartily as a man can and you love him in return, your loves may be impracticable and hopeless, and you may be separated forever. You, as the weary, weary years pass by will fade and fade bright eyes will fade and you will perhaps then die early true to him to your latest breath, and believing him to be true to the latest breath also, whilst he, in some gay and busy spot far away from your last quiet nook, will have married some dashing lady, and not purely oblivious of you, will long have ceased to regret you will chat about you, as you were in long past years will say, ah, little Cytheria used to tie her hair like that. Poor innocent trusting thing, it was a pleasant useless idle dream that dream of mine for the maid with the bright eyes and simple, silly heart, but I was a foolish lad at that time. Then he will tell the tale of all your little wills and wants and particular ways, and as he speaks, turn to his wife with a placid smile. It is not true he can't, he see can't be s so cruel and you are cruel to me you are, you are she was at last driven to desperation, her natural common sense and shrewdness had seen all through the piece how imaginary her emotions were she felt herself to be weak and foolish in permitting them to rise, but even then she could not control them, be agonized she must. She was only eighteen, and the long day's labor, her weariness, her excitement, had completely unnerved her, and worn her out, she was bent hither and thither by this tyrannical working upon her imagination, as a young rush in the wind. She wept bitterly. And now think how much I like you, resumed Miss Aldclyffe, when Cytheria grew calmer. I shall never forget you for anybody else, as men do never. I will be exactly as a mother to you. Now will you promise to live with me always, and always be taken care of, and never deserted? I cannot. I will not be anybody's maid for another day on any consideration. No, no, no. You shan't be a lady's maid. You shall be my companion. I will get another maid. Companion that was a new idea. Cytheria could not resist the evidently heartfelt desire of the strange tempered woman for her presence. But she could not trust to the moment's impulse. I will stay, I think. But do not ask for a final answer tonight. Never mind now, then. Put your hair round your mama's neck, and give me one good long kiss and I won't talk any more in that way about your lover. After all, some young men are not so fickle as others, but even if he's the ficklest, there is consolation. The love of an inconstant man is ten times more ardent than that of a faithful man that is, while it lasts. Cytheria did as she was told, to escape the punishment of further talk, flung the twining tresses of her long, rich hair over Miss Aldclyffe's shoulders as directed, and the two ceased conversing, making themselves up for sleep. Miss Aldclyffe seemed to give herself over to a luxurious sense of content and quiet, as if the maiden at her side afforded her a protection against dangers which had menaced her for years, she was soon sleeping calmly. 2 to 5 a.m. With Cytheria it was otherwise. Unused to the place and circumstances, she continued wakeful, ill at ease, and mentally distressed. She withdrew herself from her companion's embrace, turned to the other side, and endeavored to relieve her busy brain by looking at the window blind, and noticing the light of the rising moon now in her last quarter creep round upon it, it was the light of an old waning moon which had but a few days longer to live. The sight led her to think again of what had happened under the rays of the same month's moon, 
a little before its full, the ecstatic evening scene with Edward, the kiss, and the shortness of those happy moments made an imagination bringing about the apotheosis of a status quo which had had several unpleasantnesses in its earthly reality. But sounds were in the ascendant that night. Her ears became aware of a strange and gloomy murmur. She recognized it, it was the gushing of the waterfall, faint and low, brought from its source to the unwanted distance of the house by a faint breeze which made it distinct and recognizable by reason of the utter absence of all disturbing sounds. The groom's melancholy representation lent to the sound a more dismal effect than it would have had of its own nature. She began to fancy what the waterfall must be like at that hour, under the trees in the ghostly moonlight. Black at the head, and over the surface of the deep cold hole into which it fell, white and frothy at the fall, black and white, like a pall in its border, sad everywhere. She was in the mood for sounds of every kind now, and strained her ears to catch the faintest, in wayward enmity to her quiet of mind. Another soon came. The second was quite different from the first a kind of intermittent whistle it seemed primarily, no, a creak, a metallic creak, ever and anon, like a plough, or a rusty wheelbarrow, or at least a wheel of some kind. Yes, it was, a wheel the water wheel in the shrubbery by the old manor house, which the coachman had said would drive him mad. She determined not to think any more of these gloomy things, but now that she had once noticed the sound there was no sealing her ears to it. She could not help timing its creaks, and putting on a dread expectancy just before the end of each half-minute that brought them. To imagine the inside of the engine house, whence these noises proceeded, was now a necessity. No window, but crevices in the door, through which, probably, the moonbeams streamed in the most attenuated and skeleton-like rays, striking sharply upon portions of wet rusty cranks and chains, a glistening wheel, turning incessantly, laboring in the dark like a captive starving in a dungeon, and instead of a floor below, gurgling water, which on account of the darkness could only be heard, water which labored up dark pipes almost to where she lay. She shivered. Now she was determined to go to sleep, there could be nothing else left to be heard or to imagine it was horrid that her imagination should be so restless. Yet just for an instant before going to sleep she would think this suppose another sound should come just suppose it should before the thought had well passed through her brain, a third sound came. The third was a very soft gurgle or rattle of a strange and abnormal kind yet a sound she had heard before at some past period of her life when, she could not recollect. To make it the more disturbing, it seemed to be almost close to her either close outside the window, close under the floor, or close above the ceiling. The accidental fact of its coming so immediately upon the heels of her supposition, told so powerfully upon her excited nerves that she jumped up in the bed. The same instant, a little dog in some room near, having probably heard the same noise, set up a low whine. The watchdog in the yard, hearing the moan of his associate, began to howl loudly and distinctly. His melancholy notes were taken up directly afterwards by the dogs in the kennel a long way off, in every variety of wail. One logical thought alone was able to enter her flurried brain. The little dog that began the whining must have heard the other two sounds even better than herself. He had taken no notice of them, but he had taken notice of the third. The third, then, was an unusual sound. It was not like water, it was not like wind, it was not the night jar, it was not a clock, nor a rat, nor a person snoring. She crept under the clothes, and flung her arms tightly round Miss Aldclyffe, as if for protection. Cytherea perceived that the lady's late peaceful warmth had given place to a sweat. At the maiden's touch, Miss Aldclyffe awoke with a low scream. She remembered her position instantly. Oh such a terrible dream she cried, in a hurried whisper, holding to Cytherea in her turn, and your touch was the end of it. It was dreadful. Time with his wings, our glass, and scythe, coming nearer and nearer to me grinning and mocking, then he seized me, took a piece of me only. But I can't tell you. I can't bear to think of it. How those dogs howl people say it means death. The return of Miss Aldclyffe to consciousness was sufficient to dispel the wild fancies which the loneliness of the night had woven in Cytherea's mind. 
she dismissed the third noise as something which in all likelihood could easily be explained, if trouble were taken to inquire into it, large houses had all kinds of strange sounds floating about them. She was ashamed to tell Miss Aldclyffe her terrors. A silence of five minutes. Are you asleep? said Miss Aldclyffe. No, said Cytheria, in a long-drawn whisper. How those dogs howl, don't they? Yes. A little dog in the house began it. Ah, yes, that was Totsy. He sleeps on the mat outside my father's bedroom door. A nervous creature. There was a silent interval of nearly half an hour. A clock on the landing struck three. Are you asleep, Miss Aldclyffe? whispered Cytheria. No, said Miss Aldclyffe. How wretched it is not to be able to sleep, isn't it? Yes, replied Cytheria, like a docile child. Another hour passed, and the clock struck four. Miss Aldclyffe was still awake. Cytheria, she said, very softly. Cytheria made no answer. She was sleeping soundly. The first glimmer of dawn was now visible. Miss Aldclyffe arose, put on her dressing gown, and went softly downstairs to her own room. I have not told her who I am after all, or found out the particulars of Ambrose's history, she murmured. But her being in love alters everything. Half past seven to ten o'clock a.m. Cytheria awoke, quiet in mind and refreshed. A conclusion to remain at Knapwater was already in possession of her. Finding Miss Aldclyffe gone, she dressed herself and sat down at the window to write an answer to Edward's letter, and an account of her arrival at Knapwater to Owen. The dismal and heartbreaking pictures that Miss Aldclyffe had placed before her the preceding evening, the later terrors of the night, were now but as shadows of shadows, and she smiled in derision at her own excitability. But writing Edward's letter was the great consoler, the effect of each word upon him being enacted in her own face as she wrote it. She felt how much she would like to share his trouble how well she could endure poverty with him and wondered what his trouble was. But all would be explained at last, she knew. At the appointed time she went to Miss Aldclyffe's room, intending, with the contradictoriness common in people, to perform with pleasure, as a work of supererogation, what as a duty was simply intolerable. Miss Aldclyffe was already out of bed. The bright penetrating light of morning made a vast difference in the elder lady's behavior to her dependent, the day, which had restored Cytheria's judgment, had effected the same for Miss Aldclyffe. Though practical reasons forbade her regretting that she had secured such a companionable creature to read, talk, or play to her whenever her whim required, she was inwardly vexed at the extent to which she had indulged in the womanly luxury of making confidences and giving way to emotions. Few would have supposed that the calm lady sitting aristocratically at the toilet table, seeming scarcely conscious of Cytheria's presence in the room, even when greeting her, was the passionate creature who had asked for kisses a few hours before. It is both painful and satisfactory to think how often these antitheses are to be observed in the individual most open to our observation ourselves. We pass the evening with faces lit up by some flaring illumination or other, we get up the next morning the fiery jets have all gone out, and nothing confronts us but a few crinkled pipes and sooty wirework, hardly even recalling the outline of the blazing picture that arrested our eyes before bedtime. Emotions would be half-starved if there were no candle light. Probably nine-tenths of the gushing letters of indiscreet confession are written after nine or ten o'clock in the evening and sent off before day returns to leer invidiously upon them. Few that remain open to catch our glance as we rise in the morning, survive the frigid criticism of dressing time. The subjects uppermost in the minds of the two women who had thus cooled from their fires, were not the visionary ones of the later hours, but the hard facts of their earlier conversation. After a remark that Cytheria need not assist her in dressing unless she wished to, Miss Aldclyffe said abruptly, I can tell that young man's name. She looked keenly at Cytheria. It is Edward Springrove, my tenant's son. The inundation of color upon the younger lady at hearing a name which to her was a world, handled as if it were only an atom, told Miss Aldclyffe that she had divined the truth at last. Ah it is he, is it, she continued. Well, I wanted to know for practical reasons. 
His example shows that I was not so far wrong in my estimate of men after all, though I only generalized, and had no thought of him. This was perfectly true. What do you mean, said Cytherea, visibly alarmed. Mean. Why that all the world knows him to be engaged to be married, and that the wedding is soon to take place. She made the remark bluntly and superciliously, as if to obtain absolution at the hands of her family pride for the weak confidences of the night. But even the frigidity of Miss Aldclyffe's morning mood was overcome by the look of sick and blank despair which the carelessly uttered words had produced upon Cytheria's face. She sank back into a chair, and buried her face in her hands. Don't be so foolish, said Miss Aldclyffe. Come, make the best of it. I cannot upset the fact I have told you of, unfortunately. But I believe the match can be broken off. Oh no, no. Nonsense. I liked him much as a youth, and I like him now. I'll help you to captivate and chain him down. I have got over my absurd feeling of last night in not wanting you ever to go away from me of course, I could not expect such a thing as that. There, now I have said I'll help you, and that's enough. He's tired of his first choice now that he's been away from home for a while. The love that no outer attack can frighten away quails before its idol's own homely ways, it is always so. Come, finish what you are doing if you are going to, and don't be a little goose about such a trumpery affair as that. Who is he engaged to? Cytheria inquired by a movement of her lips but no sound of her voice. But Miss Aldclyffe did not answer. It mattered not. Cytheria thought. Another woman that was enough for her, curiosity was stunned. She applied herself to the work of dressing, scarcely knowing how. Miss Aldclyffe went on. You were too easily won. I'd have made him or anybody else speak out before he should have kissed my face for his pleasure. But you are one of those precipitantly fond things who are yearning to throw away their hearts upon the first worthless fellow who says good morning. In the first place, you shouldn't have loved him so quickly, in the next, if you must have loved him offhand, you should have concealed it. It tickled his vanity, by Jove, that girl's in love with me already he thought. To hasten away at the end of the toilet, to tell Mrs. Morris who stood waiting in a little room prepared for her, with tea poured out, bread and butter cut into diaphanous slices, and eggs arranged that she wanted no breakfast, then to shut herself alone in her bedroom was her only thought. She was followed thither by the well-intentioned matron with a cup of tea and one piece of bread and butter on a tray, cheerfully insisting that she should eat it. To those who grieve, innocent cheerfulness seems heartless levity. No, thank you, Mrs. Morris, she said, keeping the door closed. Despite the incivility of the action, Cytheria could not bear to let a pleasant person see her face then. Immediate revocation even if revocation would be more effective by postponement is the impulse of young wounded natures. Cytheria went to her blotting book, took out the long letters so carefully written, so full of gushing remarks and tender hints, and sealed up so neatly with a little seal bearing good faith as its motto, tore the missive into fifty pieces, and threw them into the grate. It was then the bitterest of anguishes to look upon some of the words she had so lovingly written, and see them existing only in mutilated forms without meaning to feel that his eye would never read them, nobody ever know how ardently she had penned them. Pity for oneself for being wasted is mostly present in these moods of abnegation. The meaning of all his illusions, his abruptness in telling her of his love, his constraint at first, then his desperate manner of speaking, was clear. They must have been the last flickerings of a conscience not quite dead to all sense of perfidiousness and fickleness. Now he had gone to London, she would be dismissed from his memory, in the same way as Miss Aldclyffe had said. And here she was in Edward's own parish, reminded continually of him by what she saw and heard. The landscape, yesterday so much and so bright to her, was now but as the banquet hall deserted all gone but herself. Miss Aldclyffe had wormed her secret out of her, and would now be continually mocking her for her trusting simplicity in believing him. It was altogether unbearable, she would not stay there. She went downstairs and found Miss Aldclyffe had gone into the breakfast room, but that Captain Aldclyffe, who rose later with increasing infirmities, 
had not yet made his appearance. Cytheria entered. Miss Aldclyffe was looking out of the window, watching a trail of white smoke along the distant landscape signifying a passing train. At Cytheria's entry she turned and looked inquiry. I must tell you now, began Cytheria, in a tremulous voice. Well, what? Miss Aldclyffe said. I am not going to stay with you. I must go away a very long way. I am very sorry, but indeed I can't remain. Who what shall we hear next? Miss Aldclyffe surveyed Cytheria's face with leisurely criticism. You are breaking your heart again about that worthless young Springrove. I knew how it would be. It is as Hallam says of Juliet what little reason you may have possessed originally has all been whirled away by this love. I shan't take this notice, mind. Do let me go. Miss Aldclyffe took her new pet's hand, and said with severity, as to hindering you, if you are determined to go, of course that's absurd. But you are not now in a state of mind fit for deciding upon any such proceeding, and I shall not listen to what you have to say. Now, Scythe, come with me, we'll let this volcano burst and spend itself, and after that we'll see what had better be done. She took Cytheria into her workroom, opened a drawer, and drew forth a roll of linen. This is some embroidery I began one day, and now I should like it finished. She then preceded the maiden upstairs to Cytheria's own room. There, she said, now sit down here, go on with this work, and remember one thing that you are not to leave the room on any pretext whatever for two hours unless I send for you I insist kindly, dear. Whilst you stitch you are to stitch, recollect, and not go mooning out of the window think over the whole matter, and get cooled, don't let the foolish love affair prevent your thinking as a woman of the world. If at the end of that time you still say you must leave me, you may. I will have no more to say in the matter. Come, sit down, and promise to sit here the time I name. To hearts in a despairing mood, compulsion seems a relief and docility was at all times natural to Cytheria. She promised, and sat down. Miss Aldclyffe shut the door upon her and retreated. She sewed, stopped to think, shed a tear or two, recollected the articles of the treaty, and sewed again, and at length fell into a reverie which took no account whatever of the lapse of time. Ten to twelve o'clock a.m. A quarter of an hour might have passed when her thoughts became attracted from the past to the present by unwanted movements downstairs. She opened the door and listened. There were hurryings along passages, opening and shutting of doors, trampling in the stable yard. She went across into another bedroom, from which a view of the stable yard could be obtained, and arrived there just in time to see the figure of the man who had driven her from the station vanishing down the coach road on a black horse galloping at the top of the animal's speed. Another man went off in the direction of the village. Whatever had occurred, it did not seem to be her duty to inquire or meddle with it, stranger and dependent as she was, unless she were requested to, especially after Miss Aldclyffe's strict charge to her. She sat down again determined to let no idle curiosity influence her movements. Her window commanded the front of the house, and the next thing she saw was a clergyman walk up and enter the door. All was silent again till, a long time after the first man had left, he returned again on the same horse, now matted with sweat and trotting behind a carriage in which sat an elderly gentleman driven by a lad in livery. These came to the house, entered, and all was again the same as before. The whole household master, mistress, and servants appeared to have forgotten the very existence of such a being as Cytheria. She almost wished she had not vowed to have no idle curiosity. Half an hour later, the carriage drove off with the elderly gentleman, and two or three messengers left the house, speeding in various directions. Rustics in smock frocks began to hang about the road opposite the house, or lean against trees, looking idly at the windows and chimneys. A tap came to Cytheria's door. She opened it to a young maid servant. Miss Aldclyffe wishes to see you, ma'am. Cytheria hastened down. Miss Aldclyffe was standing on the hearthrug, her elbow on the mantel, her hand to her temples, her eyes on the ground, perfectly calm, but very pale. Cytheria, she said in a whisper, come here. Cytheria went close. 
something very serious has taken place, she said again, and then paused, with a tremulous movement of her mouth. Yes, said Cytheria. My father. He was found dead in his bed this morning. Dead echoed the younger woman. It seemed impossible that the announcement could be true, that knowledge of so great a fact could be contained in a statement so small. Yes, dead, murmured Miss Aldclyffe solemnly. He died alone, though within a few feet of me. The room we slept in is exactly over his own. Cytheria said hurriedly, do they know at what hour? The doctor says it must have been between two and three o'clock this morning. Then I heard him. Heard him. Heard him die. You heard him die. What did you hear? A sound I heard once before in my life at the deathbed of my mother. I could not identify it though I recognized it. Then the dog howled, you remarked it. I did not think it worthwhile to tell you what I had heard a little earlier. She looked agonized. It would have been useless, said Miss Aldclyffe. All was over by that time. She addressed herself as much as Cytheria when she continued, Is it a providence who sent you here at this juncture that I might not be left entirely alone? Till this instant Miss Aldclyffe had forgotten the reason of Cytheria's seclusion in her own room. So had Cytheria herself. The fact now recurred to both in one moment. Do you still wish to go? said Miss Aldclyffe anxiously. I don't want to go now, Cytheria had remarked simultaneously with the other's question. She was pondering on the strange likeness which Miss Aldclyffe's bereavement bore to her own, it had the appearance of being still another call to her not to forsake this woman so linked to her life, for the sake of any trivial vexation. Miss Aldclyffe held her almost as a lover would have held her, and said musingly. We get more and more into one groove, I now am left fatherless and motherless as you were. Other ties lay behind in her thoughts, but she did not mention them. You loved your father, Cytheria, and wept for him. Yes, I did. Poor Papa. I was always at variance with mine, and can't weep for him now but you must stay here always, and make a better woman of me. The compact was thus sealed, and Cytheria, in spite of the failure of her advertisements, was installed as a veritable companion. And, once more in the history of human endeavor, a position which it was impossible to reach by any direct attempt, was come to by the seekers swerving from the path, and regarding the original object as one of secondary importance. 7. The Events of 18 Days August the 17th The time of day was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The place was the ladies' study or boudoir, Knapp Water House. The person was Miss Aldclyffe sitting there alone, clothed in deep mourning. The funeral of the old captain had taken place, and his will had been read. It was very concise, and had been executed about five years previous to his death. It was attested by his solicitors, Messrs. Needleton and Tailing, of Lincoln's Inn Fields. The whole of his estate, real and personal, was bequeathed to his daughter Cytheria, for her sole and absolute use subject only to the payment of a legacy to the rector, their relative, and a few small amounts to the servants. Miss Aldclyffe had not chosen the easiest chair of her boudoir to sit in, or even a chair of ordinary comfort, but an uncomfortable, high, narrow-backed, oak-framed and seated chair, which was allowed to remain in the room only on the ground of being a companion in artistic quaintness to an old coffer beside it and was never used except to stand in to reach for a book from the highest row of shelves. But she had sat erect in this chair for more than an hour, for the reason that she was utterly unconscious of what her actions and bodily feelings were. The chair had stood nearest her path on entering the room, and she had gone to it in a dream. She sat in the attitude which denotes unflagging, intense, concentrated thought as if she were cast in bronze. Her feet were together her body bent a little forward, and quite unsupported by the back of the chair, her hands on her knees, her eyes fixed intently on the corner of a footstool. At last she moved and tapped her fingers upon the table at her side. Her pent-up ideas had finally found some channel to advance in. Motions became more and more frequent as she labored to carry further and further the problem which occupied her brain. She sat back and drew a long breath. She sat sideways and leant her forehead upon her hand. 
Later still she arose, walked up and down the room at first abstractedly, with her features as firmly set as ever, but by degrees her brow relaxed, her footsteps became lighter and more leisurely, her head rode gracefully and was no longer bowed. She plumed herself like a swan after exertion. Yes, she said aloud. To get him here without letting him know that I have any other object than that of getting a useful man that's the difficulty and that I think I can master. She rang for the new maid, a placid woman of forty with a few grey hairs. Ask Miss Gray if she can come to me. Cytheria was not far off, and came in. Do you know anything about architects and surveyors, said Miss Aldclyffe abruptly. Know anything, replied Cytheria, poising herself on her toe to consider the compass of the question. Yes know anything, said Miss Aldclyffe. Owen is an architect and surveyor's draftsman, the maiden said, and thought of somebody else who was likewise. Yes that's why I asked you. What are the different kinds of work comprised in an architect's practice? They lay out estates, and superintend the various works done upon them, I should think, among other things. Those are, more properly, a land or building steward's duties at least I have always imagined so. Country architects include those things in their practice, city architects don't. I know that, child. But a steward's is an indefinite fast and loose profession, it seems to me. Shouldn't you think that a man who had been brought up as an architect would do for a steward? Cytheria had doubts whether an architect pure would do. The chief pleasure connected with asking an opinion lies in not adopting it. Miss Aldclyffe replied decisively. Nonsense, of course he would. Your brother Owen makes plans for country buildings such as cottages, stables, homesteads, and so on. Yes, he does. And superintends the building of them. Yes, he will soon. And he surveys land. Oh yes. And he knows about hedges and ditches how wide they ought to be, boundaries, leveling, planting trees to keep away the wines measuring timber, houses for ninety-nine years, and such things. I have never heard him say that, but I think Mr. Gradfield does those things. Owen, I am afraid, is inexperienced as yet. Yes, your brother is not old enough for such a post yet, of course. And then there are rent days, the audit and winding up of tradesmen's accounts. I am afraid, Cytheria. You don't know much more about the matter than I do myself. I am going out just now, she continued. I shall not want you to walk with me today. Run away till dinner time. Miss Aldclyffe went out of doors, and down the steps to the lawn, then turning to the left, through a shrubbery, she opened a wicket and passed into a neglected and leafy carriage drive, leading down the hill. This she followed till she reached the point of its greatest depression, which was also the lowest ground in the whole grove. The trees here were so interlaced, and hung their branches so near the ground, that a whole summer's day was scarcely long enough to change the air pervading the spot from its normal state of coolness to even a temporary warmth. The unvarying freshness was helped by the nearness of the ground to the level of the springs, and by the presence of a deep, sluggish stream close by, equally well shaded by bushes and a high wall. Following the road, which now ran along at the margin of the stream, she came to an opening in the wall, on the other side of the water, revealing a large rectangular nook from which the stream proceeded, covered with froth, and accompanied by a dull roar. Two more steps, and she was opposite the nook, in full view of the cascade forming its further boundary. Over the top could be seen the bright outer sky in the form of a crescent, caused by the curve of a bridge across the rapids, and the trees above. Beautiful as was the scene she did not look in that direction. The same standing ground afforded another prospect, straight in the front, less somber than the water on the right or the trees all around. The avenue and grove which flanked it abruptly terminated a few yards ahead, where the ground began to rise, and on the remote edge of the greensward thus laid open, stood all that remained of the original manor house, to which the dark margin line of the trees in the avenue formed an adequate and well-fitting frame. It was the picture thus presented that was now interesting Miss Aldclyffe not artistically or historically, but practically as regarded its fitness for adaptation to modern requirements. 
In front, detached from everything else, rose the most ancient portion of the structure an old arched gateway, flanked by the bases of two small towers, and nearly covered with creepers, which had clambered over the eaves of the sinking roof, and up the gable to the crest of the Altcliffe family perched on the apex. Behind this, at a distance of ten or twenty yards, came the only portion of the main building that still existed an Elizabethan fragment, consisting of as much as could be contained under three gables and a cross roof behind. Against the wall could be seen ragged lines indicating the form of other destroyed gables which had once joined it there. The mullioned and transomed windows, containing five or six lights, were mostly bricked up to the extent of two or three, and the remaining portion fitted with cottage window frames carelessly inserted, to suit the purpose to which the old place was now applied, it being partitioned out into small rooms downstairs to form cottages for two laborers and their families, the upper portion was arranged as a storehouse for divers kinds of roots and fruit. The owner of the picturesque spot, after her survey from this point, went up to the walls and walked into the old court where the paving stones were pushed sideways and upwards by the thrust of the grasses between them. Two or three little children, with their fingers in their mouths, came out to look at her, and then ran in to tell their mothers in loud tones of secrecy that Miss Aldclyffe was coming. Miss Aldclyffe, however, did not come in. She concluded her survey of the exterior by making a complete circuit of the building, then turned into a nook a short distance off where round and square timber, a saw pit, planks, grindstones, heaps of building stone and brick, explained that the spot was the center of operations for the building work done on the estate. She paused, and looked around. A man who had seen her from the window of the workshops behind, came out and respectfully lifted his hat to her. It was the first time she had been seen walking outside the house since her father's death. Struden, could the old house be made a decent residence of? without much trouble, she inquired. The mechanic considered, and spoke as each consideration completed itself. You don't forget, ma'am, that two-thirds of the place is already pulled down, or gone to ruin. Yes, I know. And that what's left may almost as well be, ma'am. Why may it? Twas so cut up inside when they made it into cottages, that the whole carcass is full of cracks. Still by pulling down the inserted partitions, and adding a little outside, it could be made to answer the purpose of an ordinary six- or eight-roomed house. Yes, ma'am. About what would it cost, was the question which had invariably come next in every communication of this kind to which the superintending workman had been a party during his whole experience. To his surprise, Miss Aldclyffe did not put it. The man thought her object in altering an old house must have been an unusually absorbing one not to prompt what was so instinctive in owners as hardly to require any prompting at all. Thank you, that's sufficient, Struthan, she said. You will understand that it is not unlikely some alteration may be made here in a short time, with reference to the management of the affairs. Struthan said yes, in a complex voice, and looked uneasy. During the life of Captain Aldclyffe, with you as the foreman of works, and he himself as his own steward, everything worked well. But now it may be necessary to have a steward, whose management will encroach further upon things which have hitherto been left in your hands than did your late masters. What I mean is, that he will directly and in detail superintend all. Then I shall not be wanted, ma'am, he faltered. Oh yes, if you like to stay on as foreman in the yard and workshops only. I should be sorry to lose you. However, you had better consider. I will send for you in a few days. Leaving him to suspense, and all the ills that came in its train distracted application to his duties, and an undefined number of sleepless nights and untasted dinners, Miss Aldclyffe looked at her watch and returned to the house. She was about to keep an appointment with her solicitor, Mr. Needleton, who had been to Budmouth and was coming to nap water on his way back to London. August the 20th On the Saturday subsequent to Mr. Needleton's visit to Knapp Water House, the subjoined advertisement appeared in the field and the builder newspapers. Land Steward A gentleman of integrity and professional skill is required immediately for the management of an estate, containing about acres, 
upon which agricultural improvements and the erection of buildings are contemplated. He must be a man of superior education, unmarried, and not more than thirty years of age. Considerable preference will be shown for one who possesses an artistic as well as a practical knowledge of planning and laying out. The remuneration will consist of a salary of pounds, with the old manor house as a residence address Messrs. Needleton and Tailing, Solicitors, Lincoln's Inn Fields. A copy of each paper was sent to Miss Aldclyffe on the day of publication. The same evening she told Cytheria that she was advertising for a steward, who would live at the old manor house, showing her the papers containing the announcement. What was the drift of that remark? Thought the maiden, or was it merely made to her in confidential intercourse, as other arrangements were told her daily? Yet it seemed to have more meaning than common. She remembered the conversation about architects and surveyors, and her brother Owen. Miss Aldclyffe knew that his situation was precarious, that he was well educated and practical, and was applying himself heart and soul to the details of the profession and all connected with it. Miss Aldclyffe might be ready to take him if he could compete successfully with others who would reply. She hazarded a question. Would it be desirable for Owen to answer it? Not at all said Miss Aldclyffe peremptorily. A flat answer of this kind had ceased to alarm Cytheria. Miss Aldclyffe's blunt mood was not her worst. Cytheria thought of another man, whose name, in spite of resolves, tears, renunciations and injured pride, lingered in her ears like an old familiar strain. That man was qualified for a stewardship under a king. Would it be of any use if Edward Springrove were to answer it, she said resolutely enunciating the name. None whatever, replied Miss Aldclyffe, again in the same decided tone. You are very unkind to speak in that way. Now don't pout like a goosey, as you are. I don't want men like either of them, for, of course, I must look to the good of the estate rather than to that of any individual. The man I want must have been more specially educated. I have told you that we are going to London next week it is mostly on this account. Cytheria found that she had mistaken the drift of Miss Aldclyffe's peculiar explicitness on the subject of advertising, and wrote to tell her brother that if he saw the notice it would be useless to reply. August the 25th Five days after the above-mentioned dialogue took place they went to London, and, with scarcely a minute's pause, to the solicitor's offices in Lincoln's Inn Fields. They alighted opposite one of the characteristic entrances about the place a gate which was never, and could never be, closed, flanked by lamp standards carrying no lamp. Rust was the only active agent to be seen there at this time of the day and year. The palings along the front were rusted away at their base to the thinness of wires, and the successive coats of paint, with which they were overlaid in bygone days, had been completely undermined by the same insidious canker, which lifted off the paint in flakes leaving the raw surface of the iron on palings, standards and gate hinges, of a staring blood red. But once inside the railings the picture changed. The court and offices were a complete contrast to the grand ruin of the outwork which enclosed them. Well-painted respectability extended over, within, and around the doorstep, and in the carefully swept yard not a particle of dust was visible. Mr. Needleton, who had just come up from Margate, where he was staying with his family, was standing at the top of his own staircase as the pair ascended. He politely took them inside. Is there a comfortable room in which this young lady can sit during our interview, said Miss Aldclyffe. It was rather a favorite habit of hers to make much of Cytheria when they were out, and snub her for it afterwards when they got home. Certainly Mr. Tailings. Cytheria was shown into an inner room. Social definitions are all made relatively, an absolute datum is only imagined. The small gentry about Knapwater seemed unpracticed to Miss Aldclyffe, Miss Aldclyffe herself seemed unpracticed to Mr. Needleton's experienced old eyes. Now then, the lady said, when she was alone with the lawyer, what is the result of our advertisement? It was late summer, the estate agency, building, engineering and surveying worlds were dull. There were forty-five replies to the advertisement. Mr. Needleton spread them one by one before Miss Aldclyffe. You will probably like to read some of them yourself, madam, he said. 
Yes, certainly, said she. I will not trouble you with those which are from persons manifestly unfit at first sight, he continued, and began selecting from the heap twos and threes which he had marked, collecting others into his hand. The man we want lies among these, if my judgment doesn't deceive me, and from them it would be advisable to select a certain number to be communicated with. I should like to see every one only just to glance them over exactly as they came, she said suasively. He looked as if he thought this a waste of his time, but dismissing his sentiment unfolded each singly and laid it before her. As he laid them out, it struck him that she studied them quite as rapidly as he could spread them. He slyly glanced up from the outer corner of his eye to hers, and noticed that all she did was look at the name at the bottom of the letter, and then put the enclosure aside without further ceremony. He thought this an odd way of inquiring into the merits of forty-five men who at considerable trouble gave in detail reasons why they believed themselves well qualified for a certain post. She came to the final one, and put it down with the rest. Then the lady said that in her opinion it would be best to get as many replies as they possibly could before selecting to give us a wider choice. What do you think, Mr. Needleton? It seemed to him, he said that a greater number than those they already had would scarcely be necessary, and if they waited for more, there would be this disadvantage attending it, that some of those they now could command would possibly not be available. Never mind, we will run that risk, said Miss Aldclyffe. Let the advertisement be inserted once more, and then we will certainly settle the matter. Mr. Needleton bowed, and seemed to think Miss Aldclyffe, for a single woman, and one who till so very recently had never concerned herself with business of any kind, a very meddlesome client. But she was rich, and handsome still. She's a new broom in estate management as yet, he thought. She will soon get tired of this, and he parted from her without a sentiment which could mar his habitual blandness. The two ladies then proceeded westward. Dismissing the cab in Waterloo Place, they went along Pall Mall on foot where in place of the usual well-dressed clubists rubicund with alcohol were to be seen, in linen pinafores, flocks of house painters pallid from white lead. When they had reached the green park, Cytherea proposed that they should sit down a while under the young elms at the brow of the hill. This they did the growl of Piccadilly on their left hand the monastic seclusion of the palace on their right, before them, the clock tower of the Houses of Parliament, standing forth with a metallic luster against a livid Lambeth sky. Miss Aldclyffe still carried in her hand a copy of the newspaper, and while Cytherea had been interesting herself in the picture around, glanced again at the advertisement. She heaved a slight sigh, and began to fold it up again. In the action her eye caught sight of two consecutive advertisements on the cover, one relating to some lecture on art, and addressed to members of the Institute of Architects. The other emanated from the same source, but was addressed to the public and stated that the exhibition of drawings at the Institute's rooms would close at the end of that week. Her eye lighted up. She sent Cytherea back to the hotel in a cab, then turned round by Piccadilly into Bond Street, and proceeded to the rooms of the Institute. The secretary was sitting in the lobby. After making her payment, and looking at a few of the drawings on the walls, in the company of three gentlemen, the only other visitors to the exhibition, she turned back and asked if she might be allowed to see a list of the members. She was a little connected with the architectural world, she said, with a smile, and was interested in some of the names. Here it is, madam, he replied, politely handing her a pamphlet containing the names. Miss Aldclyffe turned the leaves till she came to the letter M. The name she hoped to find there was there, with the address appended, as was the case with all the rest. The address was at some chambers in a street not far from Charing Cross. Chambers, as a residence, had always been assumed by the lady to imply the condition of a bachelor. She murmured two words, there still. Another request had yet to be made, but it was of a more noticeable kind than the first, and might compromise the secrecy with which she wished to act throughout this episode. Her object was to get one of the envelopes lying on the secretary's table stamped with the die of the Institute, and in order to get it she was about to ask if she might write a note. But the secretary's back chanced to be turned, and he now went towards one of the men at the other end of the room, 
who had called him to ask some question relating to an etching on the wall. Quick as thought, Miss Aldclyffe stood before the table, slipped her hand behind her, took one of the envelopes and put it in her pocket. She sauntered round the rooms for two or three minutes longer, then withdrew and returned to her hotel. Here she cut the nap water advertisement from the paper, put it into the envelope she had stolen, embossed with the society's stamp, and directed it in a round clerkly hand to the address she had seen in the list of members' names submitted to her. Aeneas Manston, ESQ. Wycombe Chambers. Spring Gardens. This ended her first day's work in London. From August the 26th to September the 1st. The two Cytherias continued at the Westminster Hotel, Miss Aldclyffe informing her companion that business would detain them in London another week. The days passed as slowly and quietly as days can pass in a city at that time of the year, the shuttered windows about the squares and terraces confronting their eyes like the white and sightless orbs of blind men. On Thursday Mr. Needleton called, bringing the whole number of replies to the advertisement. Cytheria was present at the interview by Miss Aldclyffe's request either from whim or design. Ten additional letters were the result of the second week's insertion, making fifty-five in all. Miss Aldclyffe looked them over as before. One was signed. Aeneas Manston, Tungate Street, Liverpool. Now, then, Mr. Needleton, will you make a selection, and I will add one or two, Miss Aldclyffe said. Mr. Needleton scanned the whole heap of letters, testimonials, and references, sorting them into two heaps. Manston's missive, after a mere glance, was thrown amongst the summarily rejected ones. Miss Aldclyffe read, or pretended to read after the lawyer. When he had finished, five lay in the group he had selected. Would you like to add to the number, he said, turning to the lady. No, she said carelessly. Well. Two or three additional ones rather took my fancy, she added, searching for some in the larger collection. She drew out three. One was Manston's. These eight, then, shall be communicated with, said the lawyer, taking up the eight letters and placing them by themselves. They stood up. If I myself, Miss Aldclyffe, were only concerned personally, he said, in an offhand way, and holding up a letter singly, I should choose this man unhesitatingly. He writes honestly, is not afraid to name what he does not consider himself well acquainted with a rare thing to find in answers to advertisements, he is well recommended, and possesses some qualities rarely found in combination. Oddly enough, he is not really a steward. He was bred a farmer, studied building affairs, served on an estate for some time, then went with an architect and is now well qualified as architect, estate agent, and surveyor. That man is sure to have a fine head for a manner like yours. He tapped the letter as he spoke. Yes, I should choose him without hesitation speaking personally. And I think, she said artificially, I should choose this one as a matter of mere personal whim, which, of course, can't be given way to when practical questions have to be considered. Cytheria after looking out of the window, and then at the newspapers, had become interested in the proceedings between the clever Miss Aldclyffe and the keen old lawyer, which reminded her of a game at cards. She looked inquiringly at the two letters one in Miss Aldclyffe's hand, the other in Mr. Needleton's. What is the name of your man? said Miss Aldclyffe. His name said the lawyer, looking down the page, what is his name, it is Edward Springrove. Miss Aldclyffe glanced towards Cytheria, who was getting red and pale by turns. She looked imploringly at Miss Aldclyffe. The name of my man, said Miss Aldclyffe, looking at her letter in turn, is, I think yes Aeneas Manston. September the 3rd. The next morning but one was appointed for the interviews, which were to be at the lawyer's offices. Mr. Needleton and Mr. Tailing were both in town for the day and the candidates were admitted one by one into a private room. In the window recess was seated Miss Aldclyffe, wearing her veil down. The lawyer had, in his letters to the selected number, timed each candidate at an interval of ten or fifteen minutes from those preceding and following. They were shown in as they arrived, and had short conversations with Mr. Needleton Terse, 
and to the point. Miss Aldclyffe neither moved nor spoke during this proceeding, it might have been supposed that she was quite unmindful of it, had it not been for what was revealed by a keen penetration of the veil covering her countenance the rays from two bright black eyes, directed towards the lawyer and his interlocutor. Springgrove came fifth, Manston seventh. When the examination of all was ended, and the last man had retired, Needleton, again as at the former time, blandly asked his client which of the eight she personally preferred. I still think the fifth we spoke to, Springgrove, the man whose letter I pounced upon at first, to be by far the best qualified, in short, most suitable generally. I am sorry to say that I differ from you. I lean to my first notion still that Mr. Mr. Manston is most desirable in tone and bearing, and even specifically, I think he would suit me best in the long run. Mr. Needleton looked out of the window at the widened wall of the court. Of course, madam, your opinion may be perfectly sound and reliable, a sort of instinct, I know, often leads ladies by a short cut to conclusions truer than those come to by men after laborious roundabout calculations based on long experience. I must say I shouldn't recommend him. Why, pray? Well, let us look first at his letter of answer to the advertisement. He didn't reply till the last insertion, that's one thing. His letter is bold and frank in tone, so bold and frank that the second thought after reading it is that not honesty, but unscrupulousness of conscience dictated it. It is written in an indifferent mood as if he felt that he was humbugging us in his statement that he was the right man for such an office, that he tried hard to get it only as a matter of form which required that he should neglect no opportunity that came in his way. You may be right, Mr. Needleton, but I don't quite see the grounds of your reasoning. He has been, as you perceive, almost entirely used to the office duties of a city architect, the experience we don't want. You want a man whose acquaintance with rural landed properties is more practical and closer somebody who, if he has not filled exactly such an office before, has lived a country life, knows the ins and outs of country tenancies, building, farming, and so on. He's by far the most intellectual looking of them all. Yes, he may be your opinion, Miss Aldclyffe, is worth more than mine in that matter. And more than you say. He is a man of parts his brain power would soon enable him to master details and fit him for the post, I don't much doubt that. But to speak clearly here his words started off at a jog trot I wouldn't run the risk of placing the management of an estate of mine in his hands on any account whatever. There, that's flat and plain, madam. But, definitely, she said, with a show of impatience, what is your reason? He is a voluptuary with activity which is a very bad form of man as bad as it is rare. Oh! Thank you for your explicit statement, Mr. Needleton, said Miss Aldclyffe, starting a little and flushing with displeasure. Mr. Needleton nodded slightly, as a sort of neutral motion, simply signifying a receipt of the information, good or bad. And I really think it is hardly worthwhile to trouble you further in this, continued the lady. He's quite good enough for a little insignificant place like mine at Knapwater, and I know that I could not get on with one of the others for a single month. We'll try him. Certainly, Miss Aldclyffe, said the lawyer. And Mr. Manston was written to, to the effect that he was the successful competitor. Did you see how unmistakably her temper was getting the better of her, that minute you were in the room, said Needleton to Tailing, when their client had left the house. Needleton was a man who surveyed everybody's character in a sunless and shadowless northern light. A culpable slyness, which marked him as a boy, had been molded by time, the improver, into honorable circumspection. We frequently find that the quality which, conjoined with the simplicity of the child, is vice, is virtue when it pervades the knowledge of the man. She was as near as damn it to boiling over when I added up her man, continued Needleton. His handsome face is his qualification in her eyes. They have met before, I saw that. He didn't seem conscious of it, said the junior. He didn't. That was rather puzzling to me. But still, if ever a woman's face spoke out plainly that she was in love with a man, hers did that she was with him. Poor old maid, she's almost old enough to be his mother. 
If that Manston's a schemer he'll marry her, as sure as I am Needleton. Let's hope he's honest, however. I don't think she's in love with him, said Tailing. He had seen but little of the pair, and yet he could not reconcile what he had noticed in Miss Aldclyffe's behaviour with the idea that it was the bearing of a woman towards her lover. Well, your experience of the fiery phenomenon is more recent than mine, rejoined Needleton carelessly. And you may remember the nature of it best. Eight the events of eighteen days. From the third to the nineteenth of September. Miss Aldclyffe's tenderness towards Cytherea, between the hours of her irascibility, increased till it became no less than doting fondness. Like nature in the tropics, with her hurricanes and the subsequent luxuriant vegetation effacing their ravages, Miss Aldclyffe compensated for her outbursts by excess of generosity afterwards. She seemed to be completely won out of herself by close contact with a young woman whose modesty was absolutely unimpaired, and whose artlessness was as perfect as was compatible with the complexity necessary to produce the due charm of womanhood. Cytherea, on her part, perceived with honest satisfaction that her influence for good over Miss Aldclyffe was considerable. Ideas and habits peculiar to the younger, which the elder lady had originally imitated as a mere whim, she grew in course of time to take a positive delight in. Among others were evening and morning prayers, dreaming over outdoor scenes, learning a verse from some poem whilst dressing. Yet try to force her sympathies as much as she would, Cytherea could feel no more than thankful for this, even if she always felt as much as thankful. The mysterious cloud hanging over the past life of her companion, of which the uncertain light already thrown upon it only seemed to render still darker the unpenetrated remainder, nourished in her a feeling which was scarcely too slight to be called dread. She would have infinitely preferred to be treated distantly, as the mere dependent, by such a changeable nature like a fountain, always herself, yet always another. That a crime of any deep dye had ever been perpetrated or participated in by her namesake, she would not believe but the reckless adventuring of the lady's youth seemed connected with deeds of darkness rather than of light. Sometimes Miss Aldclyffe appeared to be on the point of making some absorbing confidence, but reflection invariably restrained her. Cytherea hoped that such a confidence would come with time, and that she might thus be a means of soothing a mind which had obviously known extreme suffering. But Miss Aldclyffe's reticence concerning her past was not imitated by Cytherea. Though she never disclosed the one fact of her knowledge that the love suit between Miss Aldclyffe and her father terminated abnormally, the maiden's natural ingenuousness on subjects not set down for special guard had enabled Miss Aldclyffe to worm from her, fragment by fragment, every detail of her father's history. Cytherea saw how deeply Miss Aldclyffe sympathized and it compensated her, to some extent, for the hasty resentments of other times. Thus uncertainly she lived on. It was perceived by the servants of the house that some secret bond of connection existed between Miss Aldclyffe and her companion. But they were woman and woman, not woman and man, the facts were ethereal and refined, and so they could not be worked up into a taking story. Whether, as old critics disputed, a supernatural machinery be necessary to an epic or no, an ungodly machinery is decidedly necessary to a scandal. Another letter had come to her from Edward very short, but full of entreaty, asking why she would not write just one line just one line of cold friendship at least. She then allowed herself to think, little by little, whether she had not perhaps been too harsh with him, and at last wondered if he were really much to blame for being engaged to another woman. Ah, brain, there is one in me stronger than you she said. The young maid now continually pulled out his letter, read it and reread it, almost crying with pity the while to think what wretched suspense he must be enduring at her silence, till her heart chid her for her cruelty. She felt that she must send him a line one little line just a wee line to keep him alive, poor thing, sighing like Donna Clara. Ah, were he now before me. In spite of injured pride. I fear my eyes would pardon. Before my tongue could chide. September the 20th. 3 to 4 p.m. It was the third week in September, about five weeks after Cytherea's arrival, when Miss Aldclyffe requested her one day to go through the village of Carryford and assist herself in collecting the subscriptions made by some of the inhabitants of the parish to a religious society she patronized. 
Miss Altclyffe formed one of what was called a ladies' association, each member of which collected tributary streams of shillings from her inferiors, to add to her own pound at the end. Miss Altclyffe took particular interest in Cytheria's appearance that afternoon, and the object of her attention was, indeed, gratifying to look at it. The sight of the lithe girl, set off by an airy dress, coquettish jacket, flexible hat, a ray of starlight in each eye and a war of lilies and roses in each cheek, was a palpable pleasure to the mistress of the mansion, yet a pleasure which appeared to partake less of the nature of affectionate satisfaction than of mental gratification. Eight names were printed in the report as belonging to Miss Aldclyffe's list, with the amount of subscription money attached to each. I will collect the first four, whilst you do the same with the last four, said Miss Aldclyffe. The names of two tradespeople stood first in Cytheria's share, then came a Miss Hinton, last of all in the printed list was Mr. Springrove the Elder. Underneath his name was penciled, in Miss Aldclyffe's handwriting, M. R. Manston. Manston had arrived on the estate, in the capacity of steward, three or four days previously, and occupied the old manor house, which had been altered and repaired for his reception. Call on Mr. Manston said the lady impressively, looking at the name written under Cytheria's portion of the list. But he does not subscribe yet. I know it, but call and leave him a report. Don't forget it. Say you would be pleased if he would subscribe. Yes say I should be pleased if he would, repeated Miss Aldclyffe, smiling. Goodbye. Don't hurry in your walk. If you can't get easily through your task today put off some of it till tomorrow. Each then started on her rounds, Cytheria going in the first place to the old manor house. Mr. Manston was not indoors, which was a relief to her. She called then on the two gentlemen farmers' wives, who soon transacted their business with her, frigidly indifferent to her personality. A person who socially is nothing is thought less of by people who are not much than by those who are a great deal. She then turned towards Peak Hill Cottage, the residence of Miss Hinton, who lived there happily enough, with an elderly servant and a house dog as companions. Her father, and last remaining parent, had retired thither four years before this time, after having filled the post of editor to the Casterbridge Chronicle for eighteen or twenty years. There he died soon after, and though comparatively a poor man, he left his daughter sufficiently well provided for as a modest fund holder and claimant of sundry small sums and dividends to maintain herself as mistress at Peak Hill. At Cytheria's knock an inner door was heard to open and close, and footsteps crossed the passage hesitatingly. The next minute Cytheria stood face to face with the lady herself. Adelaide Hinton was about nine and twenty years of age. Her hair was plentiful, like Cytheria's own, her teeth equaled Cytheria's in regularity and whiteness. But she was much paler, and had features too transparent to be in place among household surroundings. Her mouth expressed love less forcibly than Cytheria's, and, as a natural result of her greater maturity, her tread was less elastic, and she was more self-possessed. She had been a girl of that kind which mothers praise as not forward, by way of contrast, when disparaging those warmer ones with whom loving is an end and not a means. Men of forty, too, said of her, a good sensible wife for any man, if she cares to marry the caring to marry being thrown in as the vaguest hypothesis, because she was so practical. Yet it would be singular if, in such cases, the important subject of marriage should be excluded from manipulation by hands that are ready for practical performance in every domestic concern besides. Cytheria was an acquisition, and the greeting was hearty. Good afternoon oh yes Miss Gray, from Miss Aldclyffe's. I have seen you at church and I am so glad you have called come in. I wonder if I have change enough to pay my subscription. She spoke girlishly. Adelaide, when in the company of a younger woman, always leveled herself down to that younger woman's age from a sense of justice to herself as if, though not her own age at common law, it was in equity. It doesn't matter. I'll come again. Yes, do at any time, not only on this errand. But you must step in for a minute. Two. I have been wanting to come for several weeks. That's right. Now you must see my house lonely, isn't it, 
for a single person? People said it was odd for a young woman like me to keep on a house, but what did I care? If you knew the pleasure of locking up your own door, with the sensation that you reign supreme inside it, you would say it was worth the risk of being called odd. Mr. Springrove attends to my gardening, the dog attends to robbers, and whenever there is a snake or toad to kill, Jane does it. How nice it is better than living in a town. Far better. A town makes a cynic of me. The remark recalled, somewhat startlingly, to Cytheria's mind, that Edward had used those very words to herself one evening at Budmouth. Miss Hinton opened an interior door and led her visitor into a small drawing room commanding a view of the country for miles. The missionary business was soon settled, but the chat continued. How lonely it must be here at night, said Cytheria. Aren't you afraid? At first I was, slightly. But I got used to the solitude. And you know a sort of common sense will creep even into timidity. I say to myself sometimes at night, if I were anybody but a harmless woman, not worth the trouble of a worm's ghost to appear to me, I should think that every sound I hear was a spirit. But you must see all over my house. Cytheria was highly interested in seeing. I say you must do this, and you must do that, as if you were a child, remarked Adelaide. A privileged friend of mine tells me this use of the imperative comes of being so constantly in nobody's society but my own. Ah, yes. I suppose she is right. Cytheria called the friend she by a rule of late alike practice for a woman's friend is delicately assumed by another friend to be of their own sex in the absence of knowledge to the contrary, just as cats are called she's until they prove themselves he's. Miss Hinton laughed mysteriously. I get a humorous reproof for it now and then, I assure you, she continued. Humorous reproof that's not from a woman, who can reprove humorously but a man, was the groove of Cytheria's thought at the remark. Your brother reproves you, I expect said that innocent young lady. No, said Miss Hinton, with a candid air. Tis only a professional man I am acquainted with. She looked out of the window. Women are persistently imitative. No sooner did a thought flash through Cytheria's mind that the man was a lover than she became a Miss Aldclyffe in a mild form. I imagine he's a lover, she said. Miss Hinton smiled a smile of experience in that line. Few women, if taxed with having an admirer, are so free from vanity as to deny the impeachment, even if it is utterly untrue. When it does happen to be true, they look pityingly away from the person who is so benighted as to have got no further than suspecting it. There now Miss Hinton, you are engaged to be married, said Cytheria accusingly. Adelaide nodded her head practically. Well, yes, I am, she said. The word engaged had no sooner passed Cytheria's lips than the sound of it the mere sound of her own lips carried her mind to the time and circumstances under which Miss Aldclyffe had used it towards herself. A sickening thought followed based but on a mere surmise, yet its presence took every other idea away from Cytheria's mind. Miss Hinton had used Edward's words about towns, she mentioned Mr. Springrove as attending to her garden. It could not be that Edward was the man that Miss Aldclyffe had planned to reveal her rival thus. Are you going to be married soon? she inquired, with a steadiness the result of a sort of fascination, but apparently of indifference. Not very soon still, soon. Aha in less than three months, said Cytheria. Two. Now that the subject was well in hand, Adelaide wanted no more prompting. You won't tell anybody if I show you something she said, with eager mystery. Oh no, nobody. But does he live in this parish? No. Nothing proved yet. What's his name? said Cytheria flatly. Her breath and heart had begun their old tricks and came and went hotly. Miss Hinton could not see her face. What do you think? said Miss Hinton. George, said Cytheria, with deceitful agony. No said Adelaide. But now, you shall see him first, come here, and she led the way upstairs into her bedroom. There, standing on the dressing table in a little frame, was the unconscious portrait of Edward Springrove. There he is, Miss Hinton said, and a silence ensued. 
Are you very fond of him? continued the miserable Cytherea at length. Yes, of course I am, her companion replied, but in the tone of one who lived in Abraham's bosom all the year, and was therefore untouched by solemn thought at the fact. He's my cousin a native of this village. We were engaged before my father's death left me so lonely. I was only twenty, and a much greater bell than I am now. We know each other thoroughly, as you may imagine. I give him a little sermonizing now and then. Why? Oh, it's only in fun. He's very naughty sometimes not really, you know but he will look at any pretty face when he sees it. Storing up this statement of his susceptibility as another item to be miserable upon when she had time, how do you know that? Cytherea asked, with a swelling heart. Well, you know how things do come to women's ears. He used to live at Budmouth as an assistant architect, and I found out that a young giddy thing of a girl who lives there somewhere took his fancy for a day or two. But I don't feel jealous at all our engagement is so matter of fact that neither of us can be jealous. And it was a mere flirtation she was too silly for him. He's fond of rowing, and kindly gave her an airing for an evening or two. I'll warrant they talked the most unmitigated rubbish under the sun all shallowness and pastime just as everything is at watering places neither of them caring a bit for the other she giggling like a goose all the time. Concentrated essence of woman pervaded the room rather than air. She didn't and it wasn't shallowness Cytherea burst out, with brimming eyes. Twas deep deceit on one side, an entire confidence on the other yes, it was the pent-up emotion had swollen and swollen inside the young thing till the dam could no longer embay it. The instant the words were out she would have given worlds to have been able to recall them. Do you know her or him, said Miss Hinton, starting with suspicion at the warmth shown. The two rivals had now lost their personality quite. There was the same keen brightness of eye, the same movement of the mouth, the same mind in both, as they looked doubtingly and excitedly at each other. As is invariably the case with women when a man they care for is the subject of an excitement among them. The situation abstracted the differences which distinguished them as individuals, and left only the properties common to them as atoms of a sex. Cytherea caught at the chance afforded her of not betraying herself. Yes, I know her, she said. Well, said Miss Hinton, I am really vexed if my speaking so lightly of any friend of yours has hurt your feelings, but... Oh, never mind, Cytherea returned, it doesn't matter. Miss Hinton. I think I must leave you now. I have to call at other places. Yes I must go. Miss Hinton, in a perplexed state of mind, showed her visitor politely downstairs to the door. Here Cytherea bade her a hurried adieu, and flitted down the garden into the lane. She persevered in her duties with a wayward pleasure in giving herself misery, as was her wont. Mr. Springrove's name was next on the list and she turned towards his dwelling, the three tranters in. 4 to 5 p.m. The cottages along Carry Ford Village Street were not so close but that on one side or other of the road was always a hedge of hawthorn or privet, over or through which could be seen gardens or orchards rich with produce. It was about the middle of the early apple harvest, and the laden trees were shaken at intervals by the gatherers the soft pattering of the falling crop upon the grassy ground being diversified by the loud rattle of vagrant ones upon a rail, hang coop, basket, or lean to roof, or upon the rounded and stooping backs of the collectors mostly children, who would have cried bitterly at receiving such a smart blow from any other quarter, but smilingly assumed it to be but fun in apples. The three tranters in, a many-gabled, medieval building, constructed almost entirely of timber, plaster, and thatch, stood close to the line of the roadside, almost opposite the churchyard, and was connected with a row of cottages on the left by thatched outbuildings. It was an uncommonly characteristic and handsome specimen of the genuine roadside inn of bygone times, and standing on one of the great highways in this part of England, had in its time been the scene of as much of what is now looked upon as the romantic and genial experience of stagecoach travelling as any halting place in the country. The railway had absorbed the whole stream of traffic which formerly flowed through the village and along by the ancient door of the inn, reducing the empty-handed landlord, who used only to farm a few fields at the back of the house, 
to the necessity of eking out his attenuated income by increasing the extent of his agricultural business if he would still maintain his social standing. Next to the general stillness pervading the spot, the long line of outbuildings adjoining the house was the most striking and saddening witness to the passed away fortunes of the three Tranters Inn. It was the bulk of the original stabling, and where once the hoofs of two score horses had daily rattled over the stony yard, to and from the stalls within, thick grass now grew, whilst the line of roofs once so straight over the decayed stalls, had sunk into vast hollows till they seemed like the cheeks of toothless age. On a green plot at the other end of the building grew two or three large, wide-spreading elm trees, from which the sign was suspended representing the three men called Tranters Irregular Carriers, standing side by side, and exactly alike to a hair's breadth, the grain of the wood and joints of the boards being visible through the thin paint depicting their forms, which were still further disfigured by red stains running downwards from the rusty nails above. Under the trees now stood a cider mill and press, and upon the spot sheltered by the boughs were gathered Mr. Springrove himself, his men, the parish clerk, two or three other men, grinders, and supernumeraries, a woman with an infant in her arms, a flock of pigeons, and some little boys with straws in their mouths, endeavouring, whenever the men's backs were turned, to get a sip of the sweet juice issuing from the vat. Edward Springrove the elder, the landlord, now more particularly a farmer, and for two months in the year a cider maker, was an employer of labor of the old school, who worked himself among his men. He was now engaged in packing the pomace into horsehair bags with a rammer, and Gad Weedy, his man, was occupied in shoveling up more from a tub at his side. The shovel shone like silver from the action of the juice, and ever and anon, in its motion to and fro, caught the rays of the declining sun and reflected them in bristling stars of light. Mr. Springrove had been too young a man when the pristine days of the three tranters had departed forever to have much of the host left in him now. He was a poet with a rough skin, one whose sturdiness was more the result of external circumstances than of intrinsic nature. Too kindly constituted to be very provident, he was yet not imprudent. He had a quiet humorousness of disposition, not out of keeping with a frequent melancholy, the general expression of his countenance being one of abstraction. Like Walt Whitman he felt as his years increased. I foresee too much, it means more than I thought. On the present occasion he wore gaiters and a leathern apron, and worked with his shirt sleeves rolled up beyond his elbows, disclosing solid and fleshy rather than muscular arms. They were stained by the cider, and two or three brown apple pips from the pomace he was handling were to be seen sticking on them here and there. The other prominent figure was that of Richard Cricket the parish clerk, a kind of bodlerized rake, who ate only as much as a woman, and had the rheumatism in his left hand. The remainder of the group, brown-faced peasants, wore smock frocks embroidered on the shoulders with hearts and diamonds, and were girt round their middle with a strap, another being worn round the right wrist. And have you seen the steward, Mr. Springrove, said the clerk. Just a glimpse of him but twas just enough to show me that he's not here for long. Why mid that be? He'll never stand the vagaries of the female figure hold in the reins not he. She de pay and well, said a grinder, and money's money. Ah tis, very much so, the clerk replied. Yes, yes, neighbour cricket, said Springrove, but she'll be lee in a passion all the fat will be in the fire and there's an end o't. Yes, she is a one continued the farmer, resting, raising his eyes, and reading the features of a distant apple. She is, said Gad, resting too it is wonderful how prompt a journeyman is in following his master's initiative to rest and reflectively regarding the ground in front of him. True, a one is she, the clerk chimed in, shaking his head ominously. She has such a temper, said the farmer, and is so willful too. You may as well try to stop a footpath as stop her when she has taken anything into her head. I'd as soon grind little green crabs all day as live wi her. Tis a temper she achev, tis, the clerk replied, though I be a servant of the church that say it. But she isn't going to flee in a passion this time. The audience waited for the continuation of the speech, as if they knew from experience the exact distance off it lay in the future. 
The clerk swallowed nothing as if it were a great deal, and then went on, There's some at between em, mark my words, neighbours there's some at between em. D mean it. I d know it. He came last Saturday, didn't he? A did, truly, said Gadweedy, at the same time taking an apple from the hopper of the mill, eating a piece, and flinging back the remainder to be ground up for cider. He went to church a Sunday, said the clerk again. A did. And she kept her eye upon and all the service, her face flit Karen between red and white, but never stoppin' at either. Mr. Springrove nodded, and went to the press. Well, said the clerk, you don't call her the kind o' woman to make mistakes and just trotten through the weekly service o' God. Why, as a rule she's as right as I be myself. Mr. Springrove nodded again, and gave a twist to the screw of the press, followed in the movement by Gad at the other side, the two grinders expressing by looks of the greatest concern that, if Miss Aldclyffe were as right at church as the clerk, she must be right indeed. Yes, as right in the service o' oh God as I be myself, repeated the clerk. But last Sunday, when we were in the Tenth Commandment, says she, incline our hearts to keep this law, says she, when twas laws in our hearts, we beseech thee, all the church through. Her eye was upon him she was quite lost hearts to keep this law, says she, she was no more than a mere shatter at that tenth time a mere shatter. You me te ha mouthed across to her a laws in our hearts we beseech thee, fifty times over she'd never ha noticed yet. She's in love wi the man, that's what she is. Then she's a bigger stun pole than I took her for, said Mr. Springrove. Why, she's old enough to be his mother. The role be between her and that young curly wig, you'll see. She won't run the risk of that pretty face be and near. Clerk Cricket, I d fancy you d know everything about everybody, said Gad. Well so's, said the clerk modestly. I do know a little. It comes to me. And I d know where from. Ah. That wife o' thine. She's an entertainin' woman, not to speak disrespectful. She is, and a winnin' one. Look at the husband's she ve had God bless her. I wonder you could stand third in that list, clerk cricket, said Mr. Springrove. Well, T has been a power o' marvel to myself oftentimes. Yes, matrimony do begin wi dearly beloved, and ends wi amazement, as the prayer book says. But what could I do, neighbour Springrove? Twas ordained to be. Well do I call to mind what your poor lady said to me when I had just married. Ah, Mr. Cricket, says she, your wife will soon settle you as she did her other two, here's a glass o' rum, for I shan't see your poor face this time next year. I swallowed the rum, called again next year, and said, Mrs. Springrove, you gave me a glass o' rum last year because I was going to die here I be alive still, you see. Well said. Clerk here's two glasses for you now, then, says she. Thank you, M.E.M., -E I said, and swallowed the rum. Well, dang my old sides, next year I thought I'd call again and get three. And call I did. But she wouldn't give me a drop o' oh, the commonest. No, clerk, says she, you be too tough for a woman's pity. Ah, poor soul, twas true enough here be I that was expected to die, alive and hard as a nail, you see, and there's she Maldiran in her grave. I used to think twas your wife's fate not to have a livin' husband when I zid em die off so, said Gad. Fate. Bless thy simplicity, so twas her fate, but she struggled to have one, and would, and did. Fate's nothing beside a woman's schemin'. I suppose, then, that fate is a he, like us, and the Lord, and the rest o' em up above there, said Gad, lifting his eyes to the sky. Hello here's the young woman common that we were a-talkin' about by now, said a grinder, suddenly interrupting. She's common up here, as I be alive. The two grinders stood and regarded Cytherea as if she had been a ship tacking into a harbour, nearly stopping the mill in their new interest. Stylish accoutrements about the head and shoulders, to my thinkin', said the clerk. Sheenan curls, and plenty o'm. 
if there's one kind of pride more excusable than another in a young woman, tis being proud of her hair, said Mr. Springrove. Dear man the pride there is only a small piece o' the whole. I warrant now, though she can show such a figure, she ha ain't a stick o' furniture to call her own. Come, clerk cricket, let the maid be a maid while she is a maid, said Farmer Springrove chivalrously. Oh, replied the servant of the church, I've nothing to say against it oh no. The chimney sweeper's daughter Sue. As I have heard declare, oh. Although she's neither sock nor shoe. Will curl and deck her hair, oh. Cytheria was rather disconcerted at finding that the gradual cessation of the chopping of the mill was on her account, and still more when she saw all the cider maker's eyes fixed upon her except Mr. Springrove's whose natural delicacy restrained him. She neared the plot of grass, but instead of advancing further, hesitated on its border. Mr. Springrove perceived her embarrassment, which was relieved when she saw his old established figure coming across to her, wiping his hands in his apron. I know your errand, Missy, he said, and am glad to see you, and attend to it. I'll step indoors. If you are busy I am in no hurry for a minute or two, said Cytheria. Then if so be you really wouldn't mind, we'll ring down this last filling to let it drain all night. Not at all. I'd like to see you. We are only just grinding down the early pickthongs and griffins, continued the farmer, in a half-apologetic tone for detaining by his cider making any well-dressed woman. They rot as black as a chimney crook if we keep em till the regulars turn in. As he spoke he went back to the press, Cytheria keeping at his elbow. I'm later than I should have been by rights, he continued, taking up a lever for propelling the screw, and beckoning to the men to come forward. The truth is, my son Edward had promised to come today, and I made preparations, but instead of him comes a letter, London, September the 18th, dear father, says he, and went on to tell me he couldn't. It threw me out a bit. Of course, said Cytheria. He's got a place a believe, said the clerk, drawing near. No, poor mortal fellow, no. He tried for this one here, you know, but couldn't manage to get it. I don't know the rights o' the matter, but willy-nilly they wouldn't have him for steward. Now mates, form in line. Springrove, the clerk, the grinders, and Gad, all ranged themselves behind the lever of the screw and walked round like soldiers wheeling. The man that the old Queen H.E.V. got is a man you can hardly get upon your tongue to gainsay, by the look o' in, rejoined Clerk Cricket. One o' them people that can contrive to be thought no worse o' for stealin' a horse than another man for lookin' over hedge at in, said a grinder. Well, he's all there as steward, and is quite the gentleman no doubt about that. So would my Ted hop in, for the matter o' that, the farmer said. That's true, a wood, sir. I said, I'll give Ted a good education if it do cost me my eyes, and I would have done it. I, that you would so, said the chorus of assistants solemnly. But he took to books and drawing naturally, and cost very little, and as a wind up the womenfolk hatched up a match between him and his cousin. When's the wedding to be, Mr. Springrove? Uncertain but soon, I suppose. Edward? you see, can do anything pretty nearly, and yet can't get a straightforward living. I wish sometimes I had kept him here, and let professions go. But he was such a one for the pencil. He dropped the lever in the hedge, and turned to his visitor. Now then, Missy, if you'll come indoors, please. Gad Weedy looked with a placid criticism at Cytheria as she withdrew with the farmer. I could tell by the tongue o' her that she didn't take her degrees in our county, he said in an undertone. The railways have left you lonely here, she observed, when they were indoors. Save the withered old flies, which were quite tame from the solitude, not a being was in the house. Nobody seemed to have entered it since the last passenger had been called out to mount the last stage coach that had run by. Yes, the inn and I seem almost a pair of fossils, the farmer replied looking at the room and then at himself. Oh, Mr. Springrove, said Cytheria, suddenly recollecting herself, 
I am much obliged to you for recommending me to Miss Aldclyffe. She began to warm towards the old man, there was in him a gentleness of disposition which reminded her of her own father. Recommending? Not at all, Miss Ted that's my son Ted said a fellow draftsman of his had a sister who wanted to be doing something in the world, and I mentioned it to the housekeeper, that's all. I, I miss my son very much. She kept her back to the window that he might not see her rising color. Yes, he continued, sometimes I can't help feeling uneasy about him. You know, he seems not made for a town life exactly, he gets very queer over it sometimes, I think. Perhaps he'll be better when he's married to Adelaide. A half-impatient feeling arose in her, like that which possesses a sick person when he hears a recently struck hour struck again by a slow clock. She had lived further on. Everything depends upon whether he loves her, she said tremulously. He used to he doesn't show it so much now, but that's because he's older. You see, it was several years ago they first walked together as young man and young woman. She's altered too from what she was when he first courted her. How, sir? Oh, she's more sensible by half. When he used to write to her she'd creep up the lane and look back over her shoulder, and slide out the letter, and read a word and stand in thought looking at the hills and seeing none. Then the cuckoo would cry away the letter would slip, and she'd start W.I. fright at the mere bird, and have a red skin before the quickest man among ye could say, blood rush up. He came forward with the money and dropped it into her hand. His thoughts were still with Edward, and he absently took her little fingers in his as he said, earnestly and ingenuously. "'Tis so seldom I get a gentlewoman to speak to that I can't help speaking to you, Miss Gray, on my fears for Edward, I sometimes am afraid that he'll never get on that he'll die poor and despised under the worst mental conditions, a keen sense of having been passed in the race by men whose brains are nothing to his own, all through his seeing too far into things being discontented with makeshifts thinking oh perfection in things, and then sickened that there's no such thing as perfection. I shan't be sorry to see him marry, since it may settle him down and do him good. I, will hope for the best. He let go her hand and accompanied her to the door saying, If you should care to walk this way and talk to an old man once now and then, it will be a great delight to him, Miss Gray. Good evening to yet. Ah look a thunderstorm is brewing be quick home. Or shall I step up with you? No, thank you, Mr. Springrove. Good evening, she said in a low voice, and hurried away. One thought still possessed her, Edward had trifled with her love. 5 to 6 p.m. She followed the road into a bower of trees, overhanging it so densely that the pass appeared like a rabbit's burrow, and presently reached a side entrance to the park. The clouds rose more rapidly than the farmer had anticipated, the sheep moved in a trail, and complained incoherently. Livid gray shades, like those of the modern French painters, made a mystery of the remote and dark parts of the vista, and seemed to insist upon a suspension of breath. Before she was halfway across the park the thunder rumbled distinctly. The direction in which she had to go would take her close by the old manor house. The air was perfectly still, and between each low rumble of the thunder behind she could hear the roar of the waterfall before her, and the creak of the engine among the bushes hard by it. Hurrying on, with a growing dread of the gloom and of the approaching storm, she drew near the old house, now rising before her against the dark foliage and sky in tones of strange whiteness. On the flight of steps, which descended from a terrace in front to the level of the park, stood a man. He appeared, partly from the relief the position gave to his figure, and partly from fact, to be of towering height. He was dark in outline, and was looking at the sky, with his hands behind him. It was necessary for Cytherea to pass directly across the line of his front. She felt so reluctant to do this, that she was about to turn under the trees out of the path and enter it again at a point beyond the old house, but he had seen her, and she came on mechanically, unconsciously averting her face a little, and dropping her glance to the ground. Her eyes unswervingly lingered along the path until they fell upon another path branching in a right line from the path she was pursuing. It came from the steps of the old house. I am exactly opposite him now, she thought, and his eyes are going through me. 
a clear masculine voice said, at the same instant. Are you afraid? She, interpreting his question by her feelings at the moment, assumed himself to be the object of fear, if any. I don't think I am, she stammered. He seemed to know that she thought in that sense. Of the thunder, I mean, he said, not of myself. She must turn to him now. I think it is going to rain, she remarked for the sake of saying something. He could not conceal his surprise and admiration of her face and bearing. He said courteously, it may possibly not rain before you reach the house, if you are going there. Yes, I am. May I walk up with you? It is lonely under the trees. No fearing his courtesy arose from a belief that he was addressing a woman of higher station than was hers, she added, I am Miss Aldclyffe's companion. I don't mind the loneliness. Oh, Miss Aldclyffe's companion. Then will you be kind enough to take a subscription to her? She sent to me this afternoon to ask me to become a subscriber to her society, and I was out. Of course I'll subscribe if she wishes it. I take a great interest in the society. Miss Aldclyffe will be glad to hear that, I know. Yes, let me see what society did she say it was? I am afraid I haven't enough money in my pocket, and yet it would be a satisfaction to her to have practical proof of my willingness. I'll get it, and be out in one minute. He entered the house and was at her side again within the time he had named. This is it, he said pleasantly. She held up her hand. The soft tips of his fingers brushed the palm of her glove as he placed the money within it. She wondered why his fingers should have touched her. I think after all, he continued, that the rain is upon us, and will drench you before you reach the house. Yes, see there. He pointed to a round wet spot as large as a nasturtium leaf, which had suddenly appeared upon the white surface of the step. You had better come into the porch. It is not nearly night yet. The clouds make it seem later than it really is. Heavy drops of rain, followed immediately by a forked flash of lightning and sharp rattling thunder compelled her, willingly or no, to accept his invitation. She ascended the steps, stood beside him just within the porch, and for the first time obtained a series of short views of his person, as they waited there in silence. He was an extremely handsome man, well-formed, and well-dressed of an age which seemed to be two or three years less than thirty. The most striking point in his appearance was the wonderful, almost preternatural, clearness of his complexion. There was not a blemish or speck of any kind to mar the smoothness of its surface or the beauty of its hue. Next, his forehead was square and broad, his brow straight and firm, his eyes penetrating and clear. By collecting the round of expressions they gave forth, a person who theorized on such matters would have imbibed the notion that their owner was of a nature to kick against the pricks, the last man in the world to put up with a position because it seemed to be his destiny to do so, one who took upon himself to resist fate with the vindictive determination of a theomachist. Eyes and forehead both would have expressed keenness of intellect too severely to be pleasing, had their force not been counteracted by the lines and tone of the lips. These were full and luscious to a surprising degree possessing a woman-like softness of curve, and a ruby redness so intense, as to testify strongly to much susceptibility of heart where feminine beauty was concerned a susceptibility that might require all the ballast of brain with which he had previously been credited to confine within reasonable channels. His manner was rather elegant than good, his speech well finished and unconstrained. The pause in their discourse, which had been caused by the peal of thunder was unbroken by either for a minute or two during which the ears of both seemed to be absently following the low roar of the waterfall as it became gradually rivaled by the increasing rush of rain upon the trees and herbage of the grove. After her short looks at him, Cytheria had turned her head towards the avenue for a while, and now, glancing back again for an instant, she discovered that his eyes were engaged in a steady, though delicate, regard of her face and form. At this moment, by reason of the narrowness of the porch, their dresses touched and remained in contact. His clothes are something exterior to every man, but to a woman her dress is part of her body. Its motions are all present to her intelligence if not to her eyes, no man knows how his coat tails swing. 
By the slightest hyperbole it may be said that her dress has sensation. Crease but the very ultima thule of fringe or flounce, and it hurts her as much as pinching her. Delicate antennae, or feelers, bristle on every outlying frill. Go to the uppermost, she is there, tread on the lowest, the fair creature is there almost before you. Thus the touch of clothes, which was nothing to Manston, sent a thrill through Cytherea, seeing, moreover, that he was of the nature of a mysterious stranger. She looked out again at the storm, but still felt him. At last to escape the sensation she moved away, though by so doing it was necessary to advance a little into the rain. Look, the rain is coming into the porch upon you, he said. Step inside the door. Cytherea hesitated. Perfectly safe, I assure you, he added, laughing and holding the door open. You shall see what a state of disorganization I am in boxes on boxes, furniture, straw, crockery, in every form of transposition. An old woman is in the back quarters somewhere, beginning to put things to rights. You know the inside of the house, I dare say. I have never been in. Oh well, come along. Here, you see, they have made a door through, here, they have put a partition dividing the old hall into two. One part is now my parlor, there they have put a plaster ceiling, hiding the old chestnut carved roof because it was too high and would have been chilly for me, you see, being the original hall, it was open right up to the top, and here the lord of the manor and his retainers used to meet and be merry by the light from the monstrous fire which shone out from that monstrous fireplace. Now narrowed to a mere nothing for my grate, though you can see the old outline still. I almost wish I could have had it in its original state. With more romance and less comfort. Yes, exactly. Well, perhaps the wish is not deep-seated. You will see how the things are tumbled in anyhow, packing cases and all. The only piece of ornamental furniture yet unpacked is this one. An organ. Yes, an organ. I made it myself, except the pipes. I opened the case this afternoon to commence soothing myself at once. It is not a very large one, but quite big enough for a private house. You play, I dare say. The piano. I am not at all used to an organ. You would soon acquire the touch for an organ, though it would spoil your touch for the piano. Not that that matters a great deal. A piano isn't much as an instrument. It is the fashion to say so now. I think it is quite good enough. That isn't altogether a right sentiment about things being good enough. No no. What I mean is, that the men who despise pianos do it as a rule from their teeth, merely for fashion's sake, because cleverer men have said it before them not from the experience of their ears. Now Cytherea all at once broke into a blush at the consciousness of a great snub she had been guilty of in her eagerness to explain herself. He charitably expressed by a look that he did not in the least mind her blunder, if it were one, and this attitude forced him into a position of mental superiority which vexed her. I play for my private amusement only, he said. I have never learned scientifically. All I know is what I taught myself. The thunder, lightning and rain had now increased to a terrific force. The clouds, from which darts, forks, zigzags and balls of fire continually sprang, did not appear to be more than a hundred yards above their heads, and every now and then a flash and appeal made gaps in the steward's descriptions. He went towards the organ, in the midst of a volley which seemed to shake the aged house from foundations to chimney. You are not going to play now, are you? said Cytherea uneasily. Oh yes. Why not now? he said. You can't go home and therefore we may as well be amused, if you don't mind sitting on this box. The few chairs I have unpacked are in the other room. Without waiting to see whether she sat down or not, he turned to the organ and began extemporizing a harmony which meandered through every variety of expression of which the instrument was capable. Presently he ceased and began searching for some music book. What a splendid flash, he said, as the lightning again shone in through the mullioned window, which of a proportion to suit the whole extent of the original hall, was much too large for the present room. The thunder pealed again. Cytherea, in spite of herself, 
was frightened, not only at the weather, but at the general unearthly weirdness which seemed to surround her there. I wish I the lightning wasn't so bright. Do you think it will last long, she said timidly. It can't last much longer, he murmured, without turning, running his fingers again over the keys. But this is nothing, he continued, suddenly stopping and regarding her. It seems brighter because of the deep shadow under those trees yonder. Don't mind it, now look at me look in my face now. He had faced the window, looking fixedly at the sky with his dark strong eyes. She seemed compelled to do as she was bidden, and looked in the too delicately beautiful face. The flash came, but he did not turn or blink, keeping his eyes fixed as firmly as before. There, he said, turning to her, that's the way to look at lightning. Oh, it might have blinded you she exclaimed. Nonsense not lightning of this sort I shouldn't have stared at it if there had been danger. It is only sheet lightning now. Now, will you have another piece? Something from an oratorio this time. No, thank you I don't want to hear it whilst it thunders so. But he had begun without heeding her answer, and she stood motionless again, marveling at the wonderful indifference to all external circumstance which was now evinced by his complete absorption in the music before him. Why do you play such saddening chords, she said, when he next paused. Hmm because I like them, I suppose, said he lightly. Don't you like sad impressions sometimes? Yes, sometimes, perhaps. When you are full of trouble. Yes. Well, why shouldn't I when I am full of trouble? Are you troubled? I am troubled. He said this thoughtfully and abruptly so abruptly that she did not push the dialogue further. He now played more powerfully. Cytheria had never heard music in the completeness of full orchestral power, and the tones of the organ, which reverberated with considerable effect in the comparatively small space of the room, heightened by the elemental strife of light and sound outside, moved her to a degree out of proportion to the actual power of the mere notes, practiced as was the hand that produced them. The varying strains now loud, now soft, simple, complicated, weird, touching, grand, boisterous, subdued, each phase distinct, yet modulating into the next with a graceful and easy flow shook and bent her to themselves, as a gushing brook shakes and bends a shadow cast across its surface. The power of the music did not show itself so much by attracting her attention to the subject of the piece, as by taking up and developing as its libretto the poem of her own life and soul, shifting her deeds and intentions from the hands of her judgment and holding them in its own. She was swayed into emotional opinions concerning the strange man before her, new impulses of thought came with new harmonies, and entered into her with a gnawing thrill. A dreadful flash of lightning then, and the thunder close upon it. She found herself involuntarily shrinking up beside him, and looking with parted lips at his face. He turned his eyes and saw her emotion, which greatly increased the ideal element in her expressive face. She was in the state in which woman's instinct to conceal has lost its power over her impulse to tell, and he saw it. Bending his handsome face over her till his lips almost touched her ear, he murmured, without breaking the harmonies. Do you very much like this piece? Very much indeed, she said. I could see you were affected by it. I will copy it for you. Thank you much. I will bring it to the house to you tomorrow. Who shall I ask for? Oh, not for me. Don't bring it, she said hastily. I shouldn't like you to. Let me see tomorrow evening at seven or a few minutes past I shall be passing the waterfall on my way home. I could conveniently give it you there, and I should like you to have it. He modulated into the pastoral symphony, still looking in her eyes. Very well, she said, to get rid of the look. The storm had by this time considerably decreased in violence, and in seven or ten minutes the sky partially cleared the clouds around the western horizon becoming lighted up with the rays of the sinking sun. Cytheria drew a long breath of relief, and prepared to go away. She was full of a distressing sense that her detention in the old manor house, and the acquaintanceship it had set on foot, was not a thing she wished. It was such a foolish thing to have been excited and dragged into frankness by the wiles of a stranger. 
allow me to come with you, he said, accompanying her to the door, and again showing by his behavior how much he was impressed with her. His influence over her had vanished with the musical chords, and she turned her back upon him. May I come, he repeated. No, no. The distance is not a quarter of a mile it is really not necessary, thank you, she said quietly. And wishing him good evening, without meeting his eyes, she went down the steps, leaving him standing at the door. Oh, how is it that man has so fascinated me, was all she could think. Her own self, as she had sat spellbound before him, was all she could see. Her gait was constrained, from the knowledge that his eyes were upon her until she had passed the hollow by the waterfall, and by ascending the rise had become hidden from his view by the boughs of the overhanging trees. 6 to 7 p.m. The wet shining rode through the western glare into her eyes with an invidious luster which rendered the restlessness of her mood more wearying. Her thoughts flew from idea to idea without asking for the slightest link of connection between one and another. One moment she was full of the wild music and stirring scene with Manston the next, Edward's image rose before her like a shadowy ghost. Then Manston's black eyes seemed piercing her again, and the reckless voluptuous mouth appeared bending to the curves of his special words. What could be those troubles to which he had alluded? Perhaps Miss Aldclyffe was at the bottom of them. Sad at heart she paced on, her life was bewildering her. On coming into Miss Aldclyffe's presence Cytheria told her of the incident, not without a fear that she would burst into one of her ungovernable fits of temper at learning Cytheria's slight departure from the program. But, strangely to Cytheria, Miss Aldclyffe looked delighted. The usual cross-examination followed. And so you were with him all that time, said the lady, with assumed severity. Yes, I was. I did not tell you to call at the old house twice. I didn't call, as I have said. He made me come into the porch. What remarks did he make, do you say? That the lightning was not so bad as I thought. A very important remark, that. Did he she turned her glance full upon the girl, and eyeing her searchingly, said. Did he say anything about me? Nothing said Cytheria, returning her gaze calmly, except that I was to give you the subscription. You are quite sure? Quite. I believe you. Did he say anything striking or strange about himself? Only one thing that he was troubled. Troubled. After saying the word, Miss Aldclyffe relapsed into silence. Such behavior as this had ended, on most previous occasions, by her making a confession, and Cytheria expected one now. But for once she was mistaken, nothing more was said. When she had returned to her room she sat down and penned a farewell letter to Edward Springrove, as little able as any other excitable and brimming young woman of nineteen to feel that the wisest and only dignified course at that juncture was to do nothing at all. She told him that, to her painful surprise, she had learnt that his engagement to another woman was a matter of notoriety. She insisted that all honor bade him marry his early love a woman far better than her unworthy self, who only deserved to be forgotten, and begged him to remember that he was not to see her face again. She upbraided him for levity and cruelty in meeting her so frequently at Budmouth, and above all in stealing the kiss from her lips on the last evening of the water excursions. I never, never can forget it she said, and then felt a sensation of having done her duty ostensibly persuading herself that her reproaches and commands were of such a force that no man to whom they were uttered could ever approach her more. Yet it was all unconsciously said in words which betrayed a lingering tenderness of love at every unguarded turn. Like Beatrice accusing Dante from the chariot, try as she might to play the superior being who contemned such mere eye sensuousness, she betrayed at every point a pretty woman's jealousy of a rival, and covertly gave her old lover hints for excusing himself at each fresh indictment. This done, Cytheria, still in a practical mood, upbraided herself with weakness in allowing a stranger like Mr. Manston to influence her as he had done that evening. What right on earth had he to suggest so suddenly that she might meet him at the waterfall to receive his music? She would have given much to be able to annihilate the ascendancy he had obtained over her during that extraordinary interval of melodious sound. 
not being able to endure the notion of his living a minute longer in the belief he was then holding, she took her pen and wrote to him also. Knapwater House September th. I find I cannot meet you at seven o'clock by the waterfall as I promised. The emotion I felt made me forgetful of realities. C. Gray. A great statesman thinks several times, and acts, a young lady acts, and thinks several times. When, a few minutes later, she saw the postman carry off the bag containing one of the letters, and a messenger with the other, she, for the first time, asked herself the question whether she had acted very wisely in writing to either of the two men who had so influenced her. 9. The Events of Ten Weeks From September the 21st to the middle of November The foremost figure within Cytheria's horizon, exclusive of the inmates of Knapwater House, was now the steward, Mr. Manston. It was impossible that they should live within a quarter of a mile of each other, be engaged in the same service, and attend the same church, without meeting at some spot or another, twice or thrice a week. On Sundays, in her pew, when by chance she turned her head, Cytheria found his eyes waiting desirously for a glimpse of hers, and, at first more strangely, the eyes of Miss Aldclyffe furtively resting on him. On coming out of church he frequently walked beside Cytheria till she reached the gate at which residence in the house turned into the shrubbery. By degrees a conjecture grew to a certainty. She knew that he loved her. But a strange fact was connected with the development of his love. He was palpably making the strongest efforts to subdue, or at least to hide, the weakness, and as it sometimes seemed, rather from his own conscience than from surrounding eyes. Hence she found that not one of his encounters with her was anything more than the result of pure accident. He made no advances whatever, without avoiding her, he never sought her, the words he had whispered at their first interview now proved themselves to be quite as much the result of unguarded impulse as was her answer. Something held him back, bound his impulse down, but she saw that it was neither pride of his person, nor fear that she would refuse him a course she unhesitatingly resolved to take should he think fit to declare himself. She was interested in him and his marvelous beauty, as she might have been in some fascinating panther or leopard for some undefinable reason she shrank from him, even whilst she admired. The keynote of her nature, a warm precipitance of soul, as Coleridge happily writes it, which Manston had so directly pounced upon at their very first interview, gave her now a tremulous sense of being in some way in his power. The state of mind was, on the whole, a dangerous one for a young and inexperienced woman, and perhaps the circumstance which, more than any other, led her to cherish Edward's image now, was that he had taken no notice of the receipt of her letter, stating that she discarded him. It was plain then, she said that he did not care deeply for her, and she thereupon could not quite leave off caring deeply for him. Ingenium Muliarum Nolan du Bevelis, Ubinali's Cupiant Ultro The month of October passed, and November began its course. The inhabitants of the village of Carryford grew weary of supposing that Miss Aldclyffe was going to marry her steward. New whispers arose and became very distinct though they did not reach Miss Aldclyffe's ears to the effect that the steward was deeply in love with Cytheria Gray. Indeed, the fact became so obvious that there was nothing left to say about it except that their marriage would be an excellent one for both, for her in point of comfort and for him in point of love. As circles in a pond grow wider and wider, the next fact, which at first had been patent only to Cytheria herself, in due time spread to her neighbors, and they, too, wondered that he made no overt advances. By the middle of November, a theory made up of a combination of the other two was received with general favor, its substance being that a guilty intrigue had been commenced between Manston and Miss Aldclyffe, some years before, when he was a very young man, and she still in the enjoyment of some womanly beauty, but now that her seniority began to grow emphatic she was becoming distasteful to him. His fear of the effect of the lady's jealousy would they said, thus lead him to conceal from her his new attachment to Cytheria. Almost the only woman who did not believe this was Cytheria herself, on unmistakable grounds, which were hidden from all besides. It was not only in public, but even more markedly in secluded places, on occasions when gallantry would have been safe from all discovery, 
that this guarded course of action was pursued, all the strength of a consuming passion burning in his eyes the while. November the 18th It was on a Friday in this month of November that Owen Gray paid a visit to his sister. His zealous integrity still retained for him the situation at Budmouth, and in order that there should be as little interruption as possible to his duties there, he had decided not to come to Knapwater till late in the afternoon, and to return to Budmouth by the first train the next morning, Miss Aldclyffe having made a point of frequently offering him lodging for an unlimited period, to the great pleasure of Cytherea. He reached the house about four o'clock, and ringing the bell, asked of the page who answered it for Miss Gray. When Gray spoke the name of his sister, Manston, who was just coming out from an interview with Miss Aldclyffe, passed him in the vestibule and heard the question. The steward's face grew hot, and he secretly clenched his hands. He half crossed the court, then turned his head and saw that the lad still stood at the door, though Owen had been shown into the house. Manston went back to him. Who was that man, he said. I don't know, sir. Has he ever been here before? Yes, sir. How many times? Three. You are sure you don't know him? I think he is Miss Gray's brother, sir. Then, why the devil didn't you say so before Manston exclaimed, and again went on his way? Of course, that was not the man of my dreams of course, it couldn't be he said to himself. That I should be such a fool such an utter fool. Good God to allow a girl to influence me like this, day after day, till I am jealous of her very brother. A lady's dependent, a waif, a helpless thing entirely at the mercy of the world, yes, curse it, that is just why it is, that fact of her being so helpless against the blows of circumstances which renders her so deliciously sweet. He paused opposite his house. Should he get his horse saddled? No. He went down the drive and out of the park, having started to proceed to an outlying spot on the estate concerning some draining, and to call at the potter's yard to make an arrangement for the supply of pipes. But a remark which Miss Aldclyffe had dropped in relation to Cytherea was what still occupied his mind, and had been the immediate cause of his excitement at the sight of her brother. Miss Aldclyffe had meaningly remarked during their intercourse, that Cytherea was wildly in love with Edward Springrove, in spite of his engagement to his cousin Adelaide. How I am harassed, he said aloud, after deep thought for half an hour, while still continuing his walk with the greatest vehemence. How I am harassed by these emotions of mine, he calmed himself by an effort. Well, duty after all it shall be, as nearly as I can effect it. Honesty is the best policy, with which vigorously uttered resolve he once more attempted to turn his attention to the prosy object of his journey. The evening had closed into a dark and dreary night when the steward came from the potter's door to proceed homewards again. The gloom did not tend to raise his spirits, and in the total lack of objects to attract his eye, he soon fell to introspection as before. It was along the margin of turnip fields that his path lay, and the large leaves of the crop struck flatly against his feet at every step, pouring upon them the rolling drops of moisture gathered upon their broad surfaces, but the annoyance was unheeded. Next reaching a fir plantation, he mounted the stile and followed the path into the midst of the darkness produced by the overhanging trees. After walking under the dense shade of the inky boughs for a few minutes, he fancied he had mistaken the path, which as yet was scarcely familiar to him. This was proved directly afterwards by his coming at right angles upon some obstruction, which careful feeling with outstretched hands soon told him to be a rail fence. However, as the wood was not large, he experienced no alarm about finding the path again, and with some sense of pleasure halted a while against the rails, to listen to the intensely melancholy yet musical wail of the fir tops, and as the wind passed on, the prompt moan of an adjacent plantation in reply. He could just dimly discern the airy summits of the two or three trees nearest him waving restlessly backwards and forwards, and stretching out their boughs like hairy arms into the dull sky. The scene from its striking and emphatic loneliness, began to grow congenial to his mood, all of humankind seemed at the antipodes. A sudden rattle on his right hand caused him to start from his reverie, and turn in that direction. There, before him, he saw rise up from among the trees a fountain of sparks and smoke, 
then a red glare of light coming forward towards him, then a flashing panorama of illuminated oblong pictures, then the old darkness, more impressive than ever. The surprise, which had owed its origin to his imperfect acquaintance with the topographical features of that end of the estate, had been but momentary, the disturbance, a well-known one to dwellers by a railway, being caused by the down train passing along a shallow cutting in the midst of the wood immediately below where he stood, the driver having the fire door of the engine open at the minute of going by. The train had, when passing him, already considerably slackened speed, and now a whistle was heard, announcing that Carry Ford Road Station was not far in its van. But contrary to the natural order of things, the discovery that it was only a commonplace train had not caused Manston to stir from his position of facing the railway. If the down train had been a flash of forked lightning transfixing him to the earth, he could scarcely have remained in a more trance-like state. He still leant against the railings, his right hand still continued pressing on his walking stick, his weight on one foot, his other heel raised, his eyes wide open towards the blackness of the cutting. The only movement in him was a slight dropping of the lower jaw, separating his previously closed lips a little way as when a strange conviction rushes home suddenly upon a man. A new surprise, not nearly so trivial as the first, had taken possession of him. It was on this account. At one of the illuminated windows of a second-class carriage in the series gone by, he had seen a pale face, reclining upon one hand, the light from the lamp falling full upon it. The face was a woman's. At last Manston moved, gave a whispering kind of whistle, adjusted his hat, and walked on again, cross-questioning himself in every direction as to how a piece of knowledge he had carefully concealed had found its way to another person's intelligence. How can my address have become known, he said at length, audibly. Well, it is a blessing I have been circumspect and honorable, in relation to that yes, I will say it, for once, even if the words choke me, that darling of mine, Cytherea, never to be my own, Never. I suppose all will come out now. All the great sadness of his utterance proved that no mean force had been exercised upon himself to sustain the circumspection he had just claimed. He wheeled to the left, pursued the ditch beside the railway fence, and presently emerged from the wood, stepping into a road which crossed the railway by a bridge. As he neared home, the anxiety lately written in his face, merged by degrees into a grimly humorous smile which hung long upon his lips, and he quoted aloud a line from the book of Jeremiah. A woman shall compass a man. November the 19th. Daybreak. Before it was light the next morning, two little naked feet pattered along the passage in Knapp Water House, from which Owen Gray's bedroom opened, and a tap was given upon his door. Owen, Owen, are you awake? said Cytheria in a whisper through the keyhole. You must get up directly, or you'll miss the train. When he descended to his sister's little room, he found her there already waiting with a cup of cocoa and a grilled rasher on the table for him. A hasty meal was dispatched in the intervals of putting on his overcoat and finding his hat, and they then went softly through the long deserted passages, the kitchen maid who had prepared their breakfast walking before them with a lamp held high above her head, which cast long wheeling shadows down corridors intersecting the one they followed their remoter ends being lost in darkness. The door was unbolted and they stepped out. Owen had preferred walking to the station to accepting the pony carriage which Miss Aldclyffe had placed at his disposal, having a morbid horror of giving trouble to people richer than himself, and especially to their men servants, who looked down upon him as a hybrid monster in social position. Cytheria proposed to walk a little way with him. I want to talk to you as long as I can, she said tenderly. Brother and sister then emerged by the heavy door into the drive. The feeling and aspect of the hour were precisely similar to those under which the steward had left the house the evening previous, excepting that apparently unearthly reversal of natural sequence, which is caused by the world getting lighter instead of darker. The tearful glimmer of the languid dawn was just sufficient to reveal to them the melancholy red leaves, lying thickly in the channels by the roadside, ever and anon loudly tapped on by heavy drops of water which the boughs above had collected from the foggy air. They passed the old house, engaged in a deep conversation, 
and had proceeded about twenty yards by a cross route, in the direction of the turnpike road, when the form of a woman emerged from the porch of the building. She was wrapped in a grey waterproof cloak, the hood of which was drawn over her head and closely round her face so closely that her eyes were the sole features uncovered. With this one exception of her appearance there, the most perfect stillness and silence pervaded the steward's residence from basement to chimney. Not a shutter was open, not a twine of smoke came forth. Underneath the ivy-covered gateway she stood still and listened for two, or possibly three minutes, till she became conscious of others in the park seeing the pair she stepped back, with the apparent intention of letting them pass out of sight, and evidently wishing to avoid observation. But looking at her watch, and returning it rapidly to her pocket, as if surprised at the lateness of the hour, she hurried out again, and across the park by a still more oblique line than that traced by Owen and his sister. These in the meantime had got into the road, and were walking along it as the woman came up on the other side of the boundary hedge, looking for a gate or stile, by which she, too, might get off the grass upon the hard ground. Their conversation, of which every word was clear and distinct, in the still air of the dawn, to the distance of a quarter of a mile, reached her ears, and withdrew her attention from all other matters and sights whatsoever. Thus arrested she stood for an instant as precisely in the attitude of Imogen by the cave of Belarius, as if she had studied the position from the play. When they had advanced a few steps, she followed them in some doubt, still screened by the hedge. Do you believe in such odd coincidences, said Cytherea. How do you mean, believe in them? They occur sometimes. Yes, one will occur often enough that is two disconnected events will fall strangely together by chance, and people scarcely notice the fact beyond saying, oddly enough it happened that so and so were the same, and so on. But when three such events coincide without any apparent reason for the coincidence, it seems as if there must be invisible means at work. You see, three things falling together in that manner are ten times as singular as two cases of coincidence which are distinct. Well, of course, what a mathematical head you have, Cytherea but I don't see so much to marvel at in our case. That the man who kept the public house in which Miss Aldclyffe fainted, and who found out her name and position, lives in this neighborhood, is accounted for by the fact that she got him the berth to stop his tongue. That you came here was simply owing to Springrove. Ah, but look at this. Miss Aldclyffe is the woman our father first loved, and I have come to Miss Aldclyffe's you can't get over that. From these premises, she proceeded to argue like an elderly divine on the designs of providence which were apparent in such conjunctures, and went into a variety of details connected with Miss Aldclyffe's history. Had I better tell Miss Aldclyffe that I know all this, she inquired at last. What's the use, he said. You're possessing the knowledge does no harm, you are at any rate comfortable here and a confession to Miss Aldclyffe might only irritate her. No, hold your tongue, Cytherea. I fancy I should have been tempted to tell her too, Cytherea went on, had I not found out that there exists a very odd, almost imperceptible and yet real connection of some kind between her and Mr. Manston, which is more than that of a mutual interest in the estate. She is in love with him exclaimed Owen, fancy that. Ah that's what everybody says who has been keen enough to notice anything. I said so at first. And yet now I cannot persuade myself that she is in love with him at all. Why can't you? She doesn't act as if she were. She isn't you will know I don't say it from any vanity, oh and she isn't the least jealous of me. Perhaps she is in some way in his power. No she is not. He was openly advertised for and chosen from forty or fifty who answered the advertisement, without knowing whose it was. And since he has been here, she has certainly done nothing to compromise herself in any way. Besides, why should she have brought an enemy here at all? Then she must have fallen in love with him. You know as well as I do, CYTH, that with women there's nothing between the two poles of emotion towards an interesting male acquaintance. Tis either love or aversion. They walked for a few minutes in silence, when Cytherea's eyes accidentally fell upon her brother's feet. Owen, she said, do you know that there is something unusual in your manner of walking? What is it like, 
he asked. I can't quite say, except that you don't walk so regularly as you used to. The woman behind the hedge, who had still continued to dog their footsteps, made an impatient movement at this change in their conversation, and looked at her watch again. Yet she seemed reluctant to give over listening to them. Yes, Owen returned with assumed carelessness, I do know it. I think the cause of it is that mysterious pain which comes just above my ankle sometimes. You remember the first time I had it? That day we went by steam packet to Lulstead Cove, when it hindered me from coming back to you, and compelled me to sleep with the gateman we have been talking about. But is it anything serious, dear Owen? Cytheria exclaimed, with some alarm. Oh, nothing at all. It is sure to go off again. I never find a sign of it when I sit in the office. Again their unperceived companion made a gesture of vexation, and looked at her watch as if time were precious. But the dialogue still flowed on upon this new subject, and showed no sign of returning to its old channel. Gathering up her skirt decisively she renounced all further hope, and hurried along the ditch till she had dropped into a valley, and came to a gate which was beyond the view of those coming behind. This she softly opened, and came out upon the road, following it in the direction of the railway station. Presently she heard Owen Gray's footsteps in her rear, his quickened pace implying that he had parted from his sister. The woman thereupon increased her rapid walk to a run, and in a few minutes safely distanced her fellow traveller. The railway at Carry Ford Road consisted only of a single line of rails, and the short local down train by which Owen was going to Budmouth was shunted on to a siding whilst the first up train passed. Gray entered the waiting room, and the door being open he listlessly observed the movements of a woman wearing a long grey cloak, and closely hooded, who had asked for a ticket for London. He followed her with his eyes on to the platform, saw her waiting there and afterwards stepping into the train, his recollection of her ceasing with the perception. 8 to 10 o'clock a.m. Mrs. Cricket, twice a widow, and now the parish clerk's wife, a fine-framed, scandal-loving woman, with a peculiar corner to her eye by which, without turning her head, she could see what people were doing almost behind her, lived in a cottage standing nearer to the old manor house than any other in the village of Carryford, and she had on that account been temporarily engaged by the steward, as a respectable kind of charwoman and general servant, until a settled arrangement could be made with some person as permanent domestic. Every morning, therefore, Mrs. Cricket, immediately she had lighted the fire in her own cottage, and prepared the breakfast for herself and husband, paced her way to the old house to do the same for Mr. Manston. Then she went home to breakfast, and when the steward had eaten his, and had gone out on his rounds, she returned again to clear away, make his bed, and put the house in order for the day. On the morning of Owen Gray's departure, she went through the operations of her first visit as usual proceeded home to breakfast, and went back again, to perform those of the second. Entering Manston's empty bedroom, with her hands on her hips, she indifferently cast her eyes upon the bed, previously to dismantling it. Whilst she looked, she thought in an inattentive manner, what a remarkably quiet sleeper Mr. Manston must be the upper bed clothes were flung back, certainly but the bed was scarcely disarranged. Anybody would almost fancy, she thought, that he had made it himself after rising. But these evanescent thoughts vanished as they had come, and Mrs. Cricket set to work, she dragged off the counterpane, blankets, and sheets, and stooped to lift the pillows. Thus stooping, something arrested her attention, she looked closely more closely very closely. Well, to be sure was all she could say. The clerk's wife stood as if the air had suddenly set to amber, and held her fixed like a fly in it. The object of her wonder was a trailing brown hair, very little less than a yard long, which proved it clearly to be a hair from some woman's head. She drew it off the pillow, and took it to the window, there holding it out she looked fixedly at it, and became utterly lost in meditation, her gaze, which had at first actively settled on the hair involuntarily dropped past its object by degrees and was lost on the floor, as the inner vision obscured the outer one. She at length moistened her lips, returned her eyes to the hair, wound it round her fingers, put it in some paper, and secreted the hole in her pocket. 
Mrs. Cricket's thoughts were with her work no more that morning. She searched the house from roof tree to cellar, for some other trace of feminine existence or appurtenance, but none was to be found. She went out into the yard, coal hole, stable, hayloft, greenhouse, fowl house, and piggery, and still there was no sign. Coming in again, she saw a bonnet, eagerly pounced upon it, and found it to be her own. Hastily completing her arrangements in the other rooms, she entered the village again, and called at once on the postmistress, Elizabeth Leet, an intimate friend of hers, and a female who sported several unique diseases and afflictions. Mrs. Cricket unfolded the paper, took out the hair, and waved it on high before the perplexed eyes of Elizabeth, which immediately mooned and wandered after it like a cat's. What is it? said Mrs. Leet, contracting her eyelids and stretching out towards the invisible object a narrow bony hand that would have been an unmitigated delight to the pencil of Carlo Crivelli. You shall hear, said Mrs. Cricket, complacently gathering up the treasure into her own fat hand, and the secret was then solemnly imparted, together with the accident of its discovery. A shaving glass was taken down from a nail, laid on its back in the middle of a table by the window, and the hair spread carefully out upon it. The pair then bent over the table from opposite sides, their elbows on the edge, their hands supporting their heads, their foreheads nearly touching, and their eyes upon the hair. He ha been mad a term my lady Cytherea, said Mrs. Cricket, and tis my very belief the hair is. No tidn. Hers isn't so dark as that, said Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you know that as the faithful wife of a servant of the church, I should be glad to think as you do about the girl. Mind I don't wish to say anything against Miss Gray, but this I do say, that I believe her to be a nameless thing, and she's no right to stick a moral clock in her face, and deceive the country in such a way. If she wasn't of a bad stock at the outset she was bad in the plantain, and if she wasn't bad in the plantain, she was bad in the growin', and if not in the growin', she's made bad by what she's gone through since. But I have another reason for knowing it it and hers, said Mrs. Leet. Ah I know whose it is then Miss Aldclyffe's, upon my song. Tis the colour of hers, but I don't believe it to be hers either. Don't you believe what they d say about her and him? I say nothing about that, but you don't know what I know about his letters. What about M? He d post all his letters here except those for one person, and they he d take to Budmouth. My son is in Budmouth post office, as you know and as he d sit at desk he can see over the blind of the window all the people who d post letters. Mr. Manston d unvariably go their wi letters for that person, my boy d know m by sight well enough now. Is it a she? Tis a she. What's her name? The little stun pole of a fellow couldn't call to mind more than that tis Miss Somebody, of London. However, that's the woman who ha been here depend upon t a wicked one some poor street wench escaped from Sodom, I warrant yet. Only to find herself in Gomorrah, seemingly. That may be. No, no, Mrs. Leet, this is clear to me. Tis no miss who came here to see our steward last night whenever she came or wherever she vanished. Do you think he would haul at a miss get here how she could, go away how she would, without breakfast or help of any kind? Elizabeth shook her head Mrs. Cricket looked at her solemnly. I say I know she had no help of any kind, I know it was so, for the grate was quite cold when I touched it this morning with these fingers, and he was still in bed. No, he wouldn't take the trouble to write letters to a girl and then treat her so offhand as that. There's a tie between M stronger than Phelan. She's his wife. He married the Lord so s, what shall we hear next? Do he look married now? His are not the abashed eyes and lips of a married man. Perhaps she's a tame one but she's his wife still. No, no, he's not a married man. Yes, yes, he is. I've had three, and I ought to know. Well, well, said Mrs. Leet, giving way. Whatever may be the truth on tea I trust Providence will settle it all for the best, as he always do. I. I, Elizabeth, rejoined Mrs. Cricket with a satirical sigh, as she turned on her foot to go home, good people like you may say so, 
but I have always found Providence a different sort of feller. November the 20th It was Miss Aldclyffe's custom, a custom originated by her father, and nourished by her own exclusiveness, to unlock the post bag herself every morning, instead of allowing the duty to devolve on the butler, as was the case in most of the neighbouring county families. The bag was brought upstairs each morning to her dressing room, where she took out the contents, mostly in the presence of her maid and Cytheria, who had the entree of the chamber at all hours, and attended there in the morning at a kind of reception on a small scale, which was held by Miss Aldclyffe of her namesake only. Here she read her letters before the glass, whilst undergoing the operation of being brushed and dressed. What woman can this be, I wonder, she said on the morning succeeding that of the last section. London, and it is the first time in my life I ever had a letter from that outlandish place, the north side of London. Cytheria had just come into her presence to learn if there was anything for herself, and on being thus addressed, walked up to Miss Aldclyffe's corner of the room to look at the curiosity which had raised such an exclamation. But the lady, having opened the envelope and read a few lines, put it quickly in her pocket, before Cytheria could reach her side. Oh, tis nothing, she said. She proceeded to make general remarks in a noticeably forced tone of sang Freud, from which she soon lapsed into silence. Not another word was said about the letter, she seemed very anxious to get her dressing done, and the room cleared. Thereupon Cytheria went away to the other window, and a few minutes later left the room to follow her own pursuits. It was late when Miss Aldclyffe descended to the breakfast table and then she seemed there to no purpose, tea, coffee, eggs, cutlets, and all their accessories, were left absolutely untasted. The next that was seen of her was when walking up and down the south terrace, and round the flower beds, her face was pale, and her tread was fitful, and she crumpled a letter in her hand. Dinner time came round as usual, she did not speak ten words or indeed seem conscious of the meal, for all that Miss Aldclyffe did in the way of eating, dinner might have been taken out as intact as it was taken in. In her own private apartment Miss Aldclyffe again pulled out the letter of the morning. One passage in it ran thus. Of course, being his wife, I could publish the fact, and compel him to acknowledge me at any moment, notwithstanding his threats, and reasonings that it will be better to wait. I have waited, and waited again and the time for such acknowledgement seems no nearer than at first. To show you how patiently I have waited I can tell you that not till a fortnight ago, when by stress of circumstances I had been driven to new lodgings, have I ever assumed my married name, solely on account of its having been his request all along that I should not do it. This writing to you, madam, is my first disobedience, and I am justified in it. A woman who is driven to visit her husband like a thief in the night and then sent away like a street dog left to get up, unbolt, unbar, and find her way out of the house as she best may is justified in doing anything. But should I demand of him a restitution of rights, there would be involved a publicity which I could not endure, and a noisy scandal flinging my name the length and breadth of the country. What I still prefer to any such violent means is that you reason with him privately, and compel him to bring me home to your parish in a decent and careful manner, in the way that would be adopted by any respectable man, whose wife had been living away from him for some time, by reason, say, of peculiar family circumstances which had caused disunion, but not enmity, and who at length was enabled to reinstate her in his house. You will, I know, oblige me in this, especially as knowledge of a peculiar transaction of your own, which took place some years ago has lately come to me in a singular way. I will not at present trouble you by describing how. It is enough, that I alone, of all people living, know all the sides of the story, those from whom I collected it having each only a partial knowledge which confuses them and points to nothing. One person knows of your early engagement and its sudden termination, another, of the reason of those strange meetings at inns and coffee houses, another, of what was sufficient to cause all this, and so on. I know what fits one in all the circumstances like a key, and shows them to be the natural outcrop of a rational though rather rash line of conduct for a young lady. You will at once perceive how it was that some at least of these things were revealed to me. This knowledge then, common to, 
and secretly treasured by us both, is the ground upon which I beg for your friendship and help, with a feeling that you will be too generous to refuse it to me. I may add that, as yet, my husband knows nothing of this, neither need he if you remember my request. A threat a flat stinging threat as delicately wrapped up in words as the woman could do it, a threat from a miserable unknown creature to an old clife, and not the least proud member of the family either a threat on his account oh, oh shall it be. Presently this humor of defiance vanished, and the members of her body became supple again, her proceedings proving that it was absolutely necessary to give way, old clife as she was. She wrote a short answer to Mrs. Manston, saying civilly that Mr. Manston's possession of such a near relation was a fact quite new to herself, and that she would see what could be done in such an unfortunate affair. November the 21st Manston received a message the next day requesting his attendance at the house punctually at 8 o'clock the ensuing evening. Miss Aldclyffe was brave and imperious, but with the purpose she had in view she could not look him in the face whilst daylight shone upon her. The steward was shown into the library. On entering it, he was immediately struck with the unusual gloom which pervaded the apartment. The fire was dead and dull, one lamp, and that a comparatively small one, was burning at the extreme end, leaving the main proportion of the lofty and somber room in an artificial twilight, scarcely powerful enough to render visible the titles of the folio and quarto volumes which were jammed into the lower tiers of the bookshelves. After keeping him waiting for more than twenty minutes Miss Aldclyffe knew that excellent recipe for taking the stiffness out of human flesh, and for extracting all prearrangement from human speech she entered the room. Manston sought her eye directly. The hue of her features was not discernible, but the calm glance she flung at him, from which all attempt at returning his scrutiny was absent, awoke him to the perception that probably his secret was by some means or other known to her, how it had become known he could not tell. She drew forth the letter, unfolded it, and held it up to him, letting it hang by one corner from between her finger and thumb, so that the light from the lamp, though remote, fell directly upon its surface. You know whose writing this is, she said. He saw the strokes plainly, instantly resolving to burn his ships and hazard all on an advance. My wife's, he said calmly. His quiet answer threw her off her balance. She had no more expected an answer than does a preacher when he exclaims from the pulpit, Do you feel your sin? She had clearly expected a sudden alarm. And why all this concealment? she said again, her voice rising as she vainly endeavoured to control her feelings, whatever they were. It doesn't follow that, because a man is married, he must tell every stranger of it, madam, he answered, just as calmly as before. Stranger well, perhaps not, but, Mr. Manston, why did you choose to conceal it, I ask again? I have a perfect right to ask this question, as you will perceive, if you consider the terms of my advertisement. I will tell you. There were two simple reasons. The first was this practical one, you advertised for an unmarried man, if you remember. Of course I remember. Well, an incident suggested to me that I should try for the situation. I was married, but, knowing that in getting an office where there is a restriction of this kind, leaving one's wife behind is always accepted as a fulfillment of the condition, I left her behind for a while. The other reason is, that these terms of yours afforded me a plausible excuse for escaping for a short time the company of a woman I had been mistaken in marrying. Mistaken what was she, the lady inquired. A third-rate actress, whom I met with during my stay in Liverpool last summer, where I had gone to fulfill a short engagement with an architect. Where did she come from? She is an American by birth, and I grew to dislike her when we had been married a week. She was ugly, I imagine. She is not an ugly woman by any means. Up to the ordinary standard. Quite up to the ordinary standard indeed, handsome. After a while we quarreled and separated. You did not ill-use her, of course, said Miss Aldclyffe, with a little sarcasm. I did not. But at any rate, you got thoroughly tired of her. Manston looked as if he began to think her questions out of place, however, he said quietly, I did get tired of her. 
I never told her so, but we separated, I to come here, bringing her with me as far as London and leaving her there in perfectly comfortable quarters, and though your advertisement expressed a single man, I have always intended to tell you the whole truth, and this was when I was going to tell it, when your satisfaction with my careful management of your affairs should have proved the risk to be a safe one to run. She bowed. Then I saw that you were good enough to be interested in my welfare to a greater extent than I could have anticipated or hoped, judging you by the frigidity of other employers, and this caused me to hesitate. I was vexed at the complication of affairs. So matters stood till three nights ago, I was then walking home from the pottery, and came up to the railway. The down train came along close to me, and there, sitting at a carriage window, I saw my wife. She had found out my address, and had thereupon determined to follow me here. I had not been home many minutes before she came in, next morning early she left again. Because you treated her so cavalierly. And as I suppose, wrote to you directly. That's the whole story of her, madam. Whatever were Manston's real feelings towards the lady who had received his explanation in these supercilious tones, they remained locked within him as within a casket of steel. Did your friends know of your marriage, Mr. Manston, she continued. Nobody at all, we kept it a secret for various reasons. It is true then that, as your wife tells me in this letter, she has not passed as Mrs. Manston till within these last few days. It is quite true, I was in receipt of a very small and uncertain income when we married, and so she continued playing at the theatre as before our marriage, and in her maiden name. Has she any friends? I have never heard that she has any in England. She came over here on some theatrical speculation, as one of a company who were going to do much, but who never did anything, and here she has remained. A pause ensued, which was terminated by Miss Aldclyffe. I understand, she said. Now, though I have no direct right to concern myself with your private affairs beyond those which arise from your misleading me and getting the office you hold. As to that, madam, he interrupted, rather hotly, as to coming here, I am vexed as much as you. Somebody, a member of the Institute of Architects who, I could never tell sent to my old address in London your advertisement cut from the paper, it was forwarded to me, I wanted to get away from Liverpool and it seemed as if this was put in my way on purpose, by some old friend or other. I answered the advertisement certainly, but I was not particularly anxious to come here, nor am I anxious to stay. Miss Aldclyffe descended from haughty superiority to womanly persuasion with a haste which was almost ludicrous. Indeed, the quo's ego of the whole lecture had been less the genuine menace of the imperious ruler of Knapwater than an artificial utterance to hide a failing heart. Now. Now, Mr. Manston, you wrong me, don't suppose I wish to be overbearing, or anything of the kind, and you will allow me to say this much, at any rate, that I have become interested in your wife, as well as in yourself. Certainly, madam, he said, slowly, like a man feeling his way in the dark. Manston was utterly at fault now. His previous experience of the effect of his form and features upon womankind and masse, had taught him to flatter himself that he could account by the same law of natural selection for the extraordinary interest Miss Aldclyffe had hitherto taken in him, as an unmarried man, an interest he did not at all object to, seeing that it kept him near Cytherea, and enabled him, a man of no wealth, to rule on the estate as if he were its lawful owner. Like Curious at his Sabine farm, he had counted it his glory not to possess gold himself, but to have power over her who did. But at this hint of the lady's wish to take his wife under her wing also, he was perplexed, could she have any sinister motive in doing so? But he did not allow himself to be troubled with these doubts, which only concerned his wife's happiness. She tells me, continued Miss Aldclyffe, how utterly alone in the world she stands, and that is an additional reason why I should sympathize with her. Instead, then, of requesting the favor of your retirement from the post, and dismissing your interests altogether, I will retain you as my steward still, on condition that you bring home your wife, and live with her respectably, in short, as if you loved her, you understand. 
I wish you to stay here if you grant that everything shall flow smoothly between yourself and her. The breast and shoulders of the steward rose, as if an expression of defiance was about to be poured forth, before it took form, he controlled himself and said, in his natural voice. My part of the performance shall be carried out, madam. And her anxiety to obtain a standing in the world ensures that hers will, replied Miss Aldclyffe. That will be satisfactory, then. After a few additional remarks, she gently signified that she wished to put an end to the interview. The steward took the hint and retired. He felt vexed and mortified, yet in walking homeward he was convinced that telling the whole truth as he had done, with the single exception of his love for Cytherea which he tried to hide even from himself, had never served him in better stead than it had done that night. Manston went to his desk and thought of Cytherea's beauty with the bitterest, wildest regret. After the lapse of a few minutes he calmed himself by a stoical effort, and wrote the subjoined letter to his wife. Knapwater. November. Dear Eunice I hope you reached London safely after your flighty visit to me. As I promised, I have thought over our conversation that night, and your wish that your coming here should be no longer delayed. After all, it was perfectly natural that you should have spoken unkindly as you did, ignorant as you were of the circumstances which bound me. So I have made arrangements to fetch you home at once. It is hardly worthwhile for you to attempt to bring with you any luggage you may have gathered about you beyond mere clothing. Dispose of superfluous things at a broker's, your bringing them would only make a talk in this parish, and lead people to believe we had long been keeping house separately. Will next Monday suit you for coming? You have nothing to do that can occupy you for more than a day or two, as far as I can see, and the remainder of this week will afford ample time. I can be in London the night before, and we will come down together by the midday train your very affectionate husband. Aeneas Manston Now, of course, I shall no longer write to you as Mrs. Rondley. The address on the envelope was MRS. Manston, Charles Square Hoxton London, N. He took the letter to the house, and it being too late for the country post, sent one of the stab lemon with it to Casterbridge, instead of troubling to go to Budmouth with it himself as heretofore. He had no longer any necessity to keep his condition a secret. From the 22nd to the 27th of November. But the next morning Manston found that he had been forgetful of another matter, in naming the following Monday to his wife for the journey. The fact was this. A letter had just come, reminding him that he had left the whole of the succeeding week open for an important business engagement with a neighboring land agent, at that gentleman's residence thirteen miles off. The particular day he had suggested to his wife, had, in the interim, been appropriated by his correspondent. The meeting could not now be put off. So he wrote again to his wife, stating that business, which could not be postponed, called him away from home on Monday, and would entirely prevent him coming all the way to fetch her on Sunday night as he had intended, but that he would meet her at the Carryford Road station with a conveyance when she arrived there in the evening. The next day came his wife's answer to his first letter, in which she said that she would be ready to be fetched at the time named. Having already written his second letter, which was by that time in her hands, he made no further reply. The week passed away. The steward had, in the meantime, let it become generally known in the village that he was a married man, and by a little judicious management, sound family reasons for his past secrecy upon the subject, which were floated as adjuncts to the story, were placidly received, they seemed so natural and justifiable to the unsophisticated minds of nine-tenths of his neighbors, that curiosity in the matter, beyond a strong curiosity to see the lady's face, was well nigh extinguished. X the events of a day and night. November the 28th. Until 10 p.m. Monday came, the day named for Mrs. Manston's journey from London to her husband's house, a day of singular and great events, influencing the present and future of nearly all the personages whose actions in a complex drama form the subject of this record. The proceedings of the steward demand the first notice. Whilst taking his breakfast on this particular morning, the clock pointing to eight, the horse and gig that was to take him to Chetlawood waiting ready at the door, 
Manston hurriedly cast his eyes down the column of Bradshaw which showed the details and duration of the selected train's journey. The inspection was carelessly made, the leaf being kept open by the aid of one hand, whilst the other still held his cup of coffee, much more carelessly than would have been the case had the expected newcomer been Cytheria Gray, instead of his lawful wife. He did not perceive, branching from the column down which his finger ran, a small twist, called a shunting line, inserted at a particular place, to imply that at that point the train was divided into two. By this oversight he understood that the arrival of his wife at Carry Ford Road Station would not be till late in the evening, by the second half of the train, containing the third-class passengers, and passing two hours and three quarters later than the previous one, by which the lady, as a second-class passenger, would really be brought. He then considered that there would be plenty of time for him to return from his day's engagement to meet this train. He finished his breakfast, gave proper and precise directions to his servant on the preparations that were to be made for the lady's reception, jumped into his gig, and drove off to Lord Clay Donfield's, at Chetla Wood. He went along by the front of Knapwater House. He could not help turning to look at what he knew to be the window of Cytheria's room. Whilst he looked, a hopeless expression of passionate love and sensuous anguish came upon his face and lingered there for a few seconds, then, as on previous occasions, it was resolutely repressed, and he trotted along the smooth white road, again endeavouring to banish all thought of the young girl whose beauty and grace had so enslaved him. Thus it was that when, in the evening of the same day, Mrs. Manston reached Carry Ford Road Station, her husband was still at Chetla Wood, ignorant of her arrival, and on looking up and down the platform, dreary with autumn gloom and wind, she could see no sign that any preparation whatever had been made for her reception and conduct home. The train went on. She waited, fidgeted with the handle of her umbrella, walked about, strained her eyes into the gloom of the chilly night, listened for wheels, tapped with her foot, and showed all the usual signs of annoyance and irritation, she was the more irritated in that this seemed a second and culminating instance of her husband's neglect the first having been shown in his not fetching her. Reflecting a while upon the course it would be best to take, in order to secure a passage to nap water, she decided to leave all her luggage, except a dressing bag, in the cloakroom, and walk to her husband's house, as she had done on her first visit. She asked one of the porters if he could find a lad to go with her and carry her bag he offered to do it himself. The porter was a good-tempered, shallow-minded, ignorant man. Mrs. Manston, being apparently in very gloomy spirits, would probably have preferred walking beside him without saying a word, but her companion would not allow silence to continue between them for a longer period than two or three minutes together. He had volunteered several remarks upon her arrival, chiefly to the effect that it was very unfortunate Mr. Manston had not come to the station for her when she suddenly asked him concerning the inhabitants of the parish. He told her categorically the names of the chief first the chief possessors of property, then of brains, then of good looks. As first among the latter he mentioned Miss Cytheria Gray. After getting him to describe her appearance as completely as lay in his power, she wormed out of him the statement that everybody had been saying before Mrs. Manston's existence was heard of how well the handsome Mr. Manston and the beautiful Miss Gray were suited for each other as man and wife, and that Miss Aldclyffe was the only one in the parish who took no interest in bringing about the match. He rather liked her you think. The porter began to think he had been too explicit, and hastened to correct the error. Oh no, he don't care a bit about her, ma'am, he said solemnly. Not more than he does about me. Not a bit. Then that must be little indeed, Mrs. Manston murmured. She stood still, as if reflecting upon the painful neglect her words had recalled to her mind, then, with a sudden impulse, turned round and walked petulantly a few steps back again in the direction of the station. The porter stood still and looked surprised. I'll go back again, yes, indeed, I'll go back again, she said plaintively. Then she paused and looked anxiously up and down the deserted road. No, I mustn't go back now, she continued, in a tone of resignation. Seeing that the porter was watching her, she turned about and came on as before, giving vent to a slight laugh. It was a laugh full of character, 
the low forced laugh which seeks to hide the painful perception of a humiliating position under the mask of indifference. Altogether her conduct had shown her to be what in fact she was, a weak, though a calculating woman, one clever to conceive, weak to execute, one whose best laid schemes were forever liable to be frustrated by the ineradicable blight of vacillation at the critical hour of action. Oh, if I had only known that all this was going to happen she murmured again, as they paced along upon the rustling leaves. What did you say, ma'am, said the porter. Oh. Nothing particular, we are getting near the old manor house by this time, I imagine. Very near now, ma'am. They soon reached Manston's residence, round which the wind blew mournfully and chill. Passing under the detached gateway, they entered the porch. The porter stepped forward, knocked heavily, and waited. Nobody came. Mrs. Manston then advanced to the door and gave a different series of wrappings less forcible, but more sustained. There was not a movement of any kind inside, not a ray of light visible, nothing but the echo of her own knocks through the passages, and the dry scratching of the withered leaves blown about her feet upon the floor of the porch. The steward, of course, was not at home. Mrs. Cricket, not expecting that anybody would arrive till the time of the later train, had set the place in order, laid the supper table, and then locked the door, to go into the village and converse with her friends. Is there an inn in the village, said Mrs. Manston, after the fourth and loudest rapping upon the iron-studded old door had resulted only in the fourth and loudest echo from the passages inside. Yes, ma'am. Who keeps it? Farmer Springrove. I will go there tonight, she said decisively. It is too cold, and altogether too bad, for a woman to wait in the open road on anybody's account, gentle or simple. They went down the park and through the gate, into the village of Carry Ford. By the time they reached the three tranters, it was verging upon ten o'clock. There, on the spot where two months earlier in the season the sunny and lively group of villagers making cider under the trees had greeted Cytheria's eyes, was nothing now intelligible but a vast cloak of darkness, from which came the low suff of the elms, and the occasional creak of the swinging sign. They went to the door. Mrs. Manston shivering, but less from the cold, than from the dreariness of her emotions. Neglect is the coldest of winter winds. It so happened that Edward Springrove was expected to arrive from London either on that evening or the next, and at the sound of voices his father came to the door fully expecting to see him. A picture of disappointment seldom witnessed in a man's face was visible in old Mr. Springrove's, when he saw that the comer was a stranger. Mrs. Manston asked for a room, and one that had been prepared for Edward was immediately named as being ready for her, another being adaptable for Edward, should he come in. Without taking any refreshment, or entering any room downstairs, or even lifting her veil, she walked straight along the passage and up to her apartment, the chambermaid preceding her. If Mr. Manston comes tonight, she said, sitting on the bed as she had come in, and addressing the woman, Tell him I cannot see him. Yes, ma'am. The woman left the room, and Mrs. Manston locked the door. Before the servant had gone down more than two or three stairs, Mrs. Manston unfastened the door again, and held it ajar. Bring me some brandy, she said. The chambermaid went down to the bar and brought up the spirit in a tumbler. When she came into the room, Mrs. Manston had not removed a single article of apparel and was walking up and down, as if still quite undecided upon the course it was best to adopt. Outside the door, when it was closed upon her, the maid paused to listen for an instant. She heard Mrs. Manston talking to herself. This is welcome home, she said. From ten to half past eleven p.m. A strange concurrence of phenomena now confronts us. During the autumn in which the past scenes were enacted, Mr. Springrove had ploughed, harrowed, and cleaned a narrow and shaded piece of ground, lying at the back of his house, which for many years had been looked upon as irreclaimable waste. The couch grass extracted from the soil had been left to wither in the sun, afterwards it was raked together, lighted in the customary way, and now lay smoldering in a large heap in the middle of the plot. It had been kindled three days previous to Mrs. Manston's arrival, and one or two villagers, 
of a more cautious and less sanguine temperament than Springgrove, had suggested that the fire was almost too near the back of the house for its continuance to be unattended with risk, for though no danger could be apprehended whilst the air remained moderately still, a brisk breeze blowing towards the house might possibly carry a spark across. I, that's true enough, said Springgrove. I must look round before going to bed and see that everything's safe, but to tell the truth I am anxious to get the rubbish burned up before the rain comes to wash it into ground again. As to carrying the couch into the back field to burn, and bringing it back again, why, tis more than the ashes would be worth. Well, that's very true, said the neighbors, and passed on. Two or three times during the first evening after the heap was lit, he went to the back door to take a survey. Before bolting and barring up for the night, he made a final and more careful examination. The slowly smoking pile showed not the slightest signs of activity. Springgrove's perfectly sound conclusion was, that as long as the heap was not stirred, and the wind continued in the quarter it blew from then, the couch would not flame, and that there could be no shadow of danger to anything, even a combustible substance, though it were no more than a yard off. The next morning the burning couch was discovered in precisely the same state as when he had gone to bed the preceding night. The heap smoked in the same manner the whole of that day, at bedtime the farmer looked towards it, but less carefully than on the first night. The morning and the whole of the third day still saw the heap in its old smoldering condition, indeed, the smoke was less, and there seemed a probability that it might have to be rekindled on the morrow. After admitting Mrs. Manston to his house in the evening, and hearing her retire, Mr. Springrove returned to the front door to listen for a sound of his son, and inquired concerning him of the railway porter, who sat for a while in the kitchen. The porter had not noticed young Mr. Springrove get out of the train, at which intelligence the old man concluded that he would probably not see his son till the next day, as Edward had hitherto made a point of coming by the train which had brought Mrs. Manston. Half an hour later the porter left the inn, Springgrove at the same time going to the door to listen again an instant, then he walked round and in at the back of the house. The farmer glanced at the heap casually and indifferently in passing, two nights of safety seemed to ensure the third, and he was about to bolt and bar as usual, when the idea struck him that there was just a possibility of his son's return by the latest train, unlikely as it was that he would be so delayed. The old man thereupon left the door unfastened, looked to his usual matters indoors, and went to bed, it being then half past ten o'clock. Farmers and horticulturists well know that it is in the nature of a heap of couch grass, when kindled in calm weather, to smolder for many days, and even weeks, until the whole mass is reduced to a powdery charcoal ash, displaying the while scarcely a sign of combustion beyond the volcano-like smoke from its summit, but the continuance of this quiet process is throughout its length at the mercy of one particular whim of nature, that is, a sudden breeze, by which the heap is liable to be fanned into a flame so brisk as to consume the whole in an hour or two. Had the farmer narrowly watched the pile when he went to close the door, he would have seen, besides the familiar twine of smoke from its summit, a quivering of the air around the mass, showing that a considerable heat had arisen inside. As the railway porter turned the corner of the row of houses adjoining the three tranters, a brisk new wind greeted his face and spread past him into the village. He walked along the high road till he came to a gate, about three hundred yards from the inn. Over the gate could be discerned the situation of the building he had just quitted. He carelessly turned his head in passing, and saw behind him a clear red glow indicating the position of the couch heap, a glow without a flame, increasing and diminishing in brightness as the breeze quickened or fell, like the coal of a newly lighted cigar. If those cottages had been his, he thought, he should not care to have a fire so near them as that and the wind rising. But the cottages not being his, he went on his way to the station, where he was about to resume duty for the night. The road was now quite deserted, till four o'clock the next morning, when the carters would go by to the stables there was little probability of any human being passing the three tranters in. By eleven, everybody in the house was asleep. It truly seemed as if the treacherous element knew there had arisen a grand opportunity for devastation. At a quarter past eleven a slight stealthy crackle made itself heard amid the increasing moans of the night wind, the heap glowed brighter still, 
and burst into a flame, the flame sank, another breeze entered it, sustained it, and it grew to be first continuous and weak, then continuous and strong. At twenty minutes past eleven a blast of wind carried an airy bit of ignited fern several yards forward, in a direction parallel to the houses and in, and there deposited it on the ground. Five minutes later another puff of wind carried a similar piece to a distance of five and twenty yards, where it also was dropped softly on the ground. Still the wind did not blow in the direction of the houses, and even now to a casual observer they would have appeared safe. But nature does few things directly. A minute later yet, an ignited fragment fell upon the straw covering of a long thatched heap or grave of mangle wurzel, lying in a direction at right angles to the house and down toward the hedge. There the fragment faded to darkness. A short time subsequent to this, after many intermediate deposits and seemingly baffled attempts, another fragment fell on the mangle wurzel grave, and continued to glow, the glow was increased by the wind, the straw caught fire and burst into flame. It was inevitable that the flame should run along the ridge of the thatch towards a piggery at the end. Yet had the piggery been tiled, the time-honored hostel would even now at this last moment have been safe, but it was constructed as piggeries are mostly constructed, of wood and thatch. The hurdles and straw roof of the frail erection became ignited in their turn, and abutting as the shed did on the back of the inn, flamed up to the eaves of the main roof in less than thirty seconds. Half past eleven to twelve p.m. A hazardous length of time elapsed before the inmates of the three tranters knew of their danger. When at length the discovery was made, the rush was a rush for bare life. A man's voice calling, then screams, then loud stamping and shouts were heard. Mr. Springrove ran out first. Two minutes later appeared the ostler and chambermaid, who were man and wife. The inn, as has been stated, was a quaint old building, and as inflammable as a beehive, it overhung the base at the level of the first floor, and again overhung at the eaves which were finished with heavy oak barge boards, every atom in its substance, every feature in its construction, favored the fire. The forked flames, lurid and smoky, became nearly lost to view, bursting forth again with a bound and loud crackle, increased tenfold in power and brightness. The crackling grew sharper. Long quivering shadows began to be flung from the stately trees at the end of the house, the square outline of the church tower, on the other side of the way, which had hitherto been a dark mass against a sky comparatively light, now began to appear as a light object against a sky of darkness, and even the narrow surface of the flagstaff at the top could be seen in its dark surrounding, brought out from its obscurity by the rays from the dancing light. Shouts and other noises increased in loudness and frequency. The lapse of ten minutes brought most of the inhabitants of that end of the village into the street, followed in a short time by the rector. Mr. Ronham. Casting a hasty glance up and down, he beckoned to one or two of the men, and vanished again. In a short time wheels were heard, and Mr. Ronham and the men reappeared, with the garden engine, the only one in the village, except that at Knapwater House. After some little trouble the hose was connected with a tank in the old stable yard, and the puny instrument began to play. Several seemed paralyzed at first, and stood transfixed their rigid faces looking like red-hot iron in the glaring light. In the confusion a woman cried, ring the bells backwards and three or four of the old and superstitious entered the belfry and jangled them indescribably. Some were only half-dressed, and, to add to the horror, among them was Clerk Cricket, running up and down with a face streaming with blood, ghastly and pitiful to see, his excitement being so great that he had not the slightest conception of how, when, or where he came by the wound. The crowd was now busy at work, and tried to save a little of the furniture of the inn. The only room they could enter was the parlor, from which they managed to bring out the bureau, a few chairs, some old silver candlesticks, and half a dozen light articles, but these were all. Fiery mats of thatch slid off the roof and fell into the road with a deadened thud, whilst white flakes of straw and wood ash were flying in the wind like feathers. At the same time two of the cottages adjoining, upon which a little water had been brought to play from the rector's engine, were seen to be on fire. The attenuated spurt of water was as nothing upon the heated and dry surface of the thatched roof, the fire prevailed without a minute's hindrance, and dived through to the rafters. 
suddenly arose a cry, Where's Mr. Springrove? He had vanished from the spot by the churchyard wall, where he had been standing a few minutes earlier. I fancy he's gone inside, said a voice. Madness and folly what can he save, said another. Good God, find him help here. A wild rush was made at the door, which had fallen to, and in defiance of the scorching flame that burst forth, three men forced themselves through it. Immediately inside the threshold they found the object of their search lying senseless on the floor of the passage. To bring him out and lay him on a bank was the work of an instant, a basin of cold water was dashed in his face, and he began to recover consciousness, but very slowly. He had been saved by a miracle. No sooner were his preservers out of the building than the window frames lit up as if by magic with deep and waving fringes of flames. Simultaneously, the joints of the boards forming the front door started into view as glowing bars of fire, a star of red light penetrated the center, gradually increasing in size till the flames rushed forth. Then the staircase fell. Everybody is out safe, said a voice. Yes, thank God said three or four others. Oh, we forgot that a stranger came I think she is safe. I hope she is, said the weak voice of someone coming up from behind. It was the chambermaids. Springgrove at that moment aroused himself, he staggered to his feet, and threw his hands up wildly. Everybody, no no the lady who came by train, Mrs. Manston I tried to fetch her out, but I fell. An exclamation of horror burst from the crowd, it was caused partly by this disclosure of Springgrove, more by the added perception which followed his words. An average interval of about three minutes had elapsed between one intensely fierce gust of wind and the next, and now another poured over them, the roof swayed, and a moment afterwards fell in with a crash, pulling the gable after it, and thrusting outwards the front wall of woodwork, which fell into the road with a rumbling echo, a cloud of black dust, myriads of sparks, and a great outburst of flame followed the uproar of the fall. Who is she? What is she? burst from every lip again and again, incoherently, and without leaving a sufficient pause for a reply, had a reply been volunteered. The autumn wind, tameless, and swift, and proud, still blew upon the dying old house, which was constructed so entirely of combustible materials that it burnt almost as fiercely as a corn rick. The heat in the road increased, and now for an instant at the height of the conflagration all stood still, and gazed silently awestruck and helpless, in the presence of so irresistible an enemy. Then, with minds full of the tragedy unfolded to them, they rushed forward again with the obtuse directness of waves, to their labor of saving goods from the houses adjoining, which it was evident were all doomed to destruction. The minutes passed by. The three tranters in sank into a mere heap of red-hot charcoal, the fire pushed its way down the row as the church clock opposite slowly struck the hour of midnight and the bewildered chimes, scarcely heard amid the crackling of the flames, wandered through the wayward air of the old hundred and thirteenth psalm. 9 to 11 p.m. Manston mounted his gig and set out from Chetlawood that evening in no very enviable frame of mind. The thought of domestic life in Knapwater Old House, with the now eclipsed wife of the past, was more than disagreeable, was positively distasteful to him. Yet he knew that the influential position, which, from whatever fortunate cause, he held on Miss Aldclyffe's manor, would never again fall to his lot on any other, and he tacitly assented to this dilemma, hoping that some consolation or other would soon suggest itself to him, married as he was, he was near Cytherea. He occasionally looked at his watch as he drove along the lanes, timing the pace of his horse by the hour, that he might reach Carryford Road Station just soon enough to meet the last London train. He soon began to notice in the sky a slight yellow halo, near the horizon. It rapidly increased, it changed color, and grew redder, then the glare visibly brightened and dimmed at intervals, showing that its origin was affected by the strong wind prevailing. Manston reined in his horse on the summit of a hill, and considered. It is a rickyard on fire, he thought, no house could produce such a raging flame so suddenly. He trotted on again attempting to particularize the local features in the neighborhood of the fire, but this it was too dark to do, and the excessive winding of the roads misled him as to its direction, 
not being an old inhabitant of the district, or a countryman used to forming such judgments, whilst the brilliancy of the light shortened its real remoteness to an apparent distance of not more than half, it seemed so near that he again stopped his horse, this time to listen, but he could hear. No sound. Entering now a narrow valley, the sides of which obscured the sky to an angle of perhaps thirty or forty degrees above the mathematical horizon, he was obliged to suspend his judgment till he was in possession of further knowledge, having however assumed in the interim, that the fire was somewhere between Carryford Road Station and the village. The self-same glare had just arrested the eyes of another man. He was at that minute gliding along several miles to the east of the steward's position, but nearing the same point as that to which Manston tended. The younger Edward Springrove was returning from London to his father's house by the identical train which the steward was expecting to bring his wife, the truth being that Edward's lateness was owing to the simplest of all causes, his temporary want of money, which led him to make a slow journey for the sake of travelling at third-class fare. Springrove had received Cytheria's bitter and admonitory letter, and he was clearly awakened to a perception of the false position in which he had placed himself by keeping silence at Budmouth on his long engagement. An increasing reluctance to put an end to those few days of ecstasy with Cytheria had overruled his conscience, and tied his tongue till speaking was too late. Why did I do it? How could I dream of loving her, he asked himself as he walked by day, as he tossed on his bed by night, miserable folly. An impressionable heart had for years perhaps as many as six or seven years been distracting him, by unconsciously setting itself to yearn for somebody wanting, he scarcely knew whom. Echoes of himself, though rarely, he now and then found. Sometimes they were men, sometimes women, his cousin Adelaide being one of these, for in spite of a fashion which pervades the whole community at the present day the habit of exclaiming that woman is not undeveloped man, but diverse, the fact remains that, after all, women are mankind and that in many of the sentiments of life the difference of sex is but a difference of degree. But the indefinable helpmate to the remoter sides of himself still continued invisible. He grew older, and concluded that the ideas, or rather emotions, which possessed him on the subject, were probably too unreal ever to be found embodied in the flesh of a woman. Thereupon, he developed a plan of satisfying his dreams by wandering away to the heroines of poetical imagination, and took no further thought on the earthly realization of his formless desire, in more homely matters satisfying himself with his cousin. Cytheria appeared in the sky, his heart started up and spoke. Tis she, and here. Lo I unclothe and clear. My wish is cloudy character. Some women kindle emotions so rapidly in a man's heart that the judgment cannot keep pace with its rise, and finds, on comprehending the situation, that faithfulness to the old love is already treachery to the new. Such women are not necessarily the greatest of their sex, but there are very few of them. Cytheria was one. On receiving the letter from her he had taken to thinking over these things, and had not answered it at all. But hungry generations soon tread down the muser in a city. At length he thought of the strong necessity of living. After a dreary search, the negligence of which was ultimately overcome by mere conscientiousness, he obtained a situation as assistant to an architect in the neighborhood of Charing Cross, the duties would not begin till after the lapse of a month. He could not at first decide whither he should go to spend the intervening time, but in the midst of his reasonings he found himself on the road homeward, impelled by a secret and unowned hope of getting a last glimpse of Cytheria there. Midnight it was a quarter to twelve when Manston drove into the station yard. The train was punctual, and the bell, announcing its arrival, rang as he crossed the booking office to go out upon the platform. The porter who had accompanied Mrs. Manston to carry Ford, and had returned to the station on his night duty, recognized the steward as he entered, and immediately came towards him. M.R.S. Manston came by the nine o'clock train, sir, he said. The steward gave vent to an expression of vexation. Her luggage is here, sir, the porter said. Put it up behind me in the gig if it is not too much, said Manston. Directly this train is in and gone, sir. The man vanished and crossed the line to meet the entering train. Where is that fire? Manston said to the booking clerk. 
Before the clerk could speak, another man ran in and answered the question without having heard it. Half Carry Ford is burnt down, or will be he exclaimed. You can't see the flames from this station on account of the trees, but step on the bridge tis tremendous. He also crossed the line to assist at the entry of the train, which came in the next minute. The steward stood in the office. One passenger alighted, gave up his ticket, and crossed the room in front of Manston, a young man with a black bag and umbrella in his hand. He passed out of the door, down the steps, and struck out into the darkness. Who was that young man, said Manston, when the porter had returned? The young man, by a kind of magnetism, had drawn the steward's thoughts after him. He's an architect. My own old profession. I could have sworn it by the cut of him, Manston murmured. What's his name, he said again. Springgrove Farmer Springgrove's son, Edward. Farmer Springgrove's son, Edward, the steward repeated to himself, and considered a matter to which the words had painfully recalled his mind. The matter was Miss Aldclyffe's mention of the young man as Cytheria's lover, which, indeed, had scarcely ever been absent from his thoughts. But for the existence of my wife that man might have been my rival, he pondered, following the porter, who had now come back to him, into the luggage room. And whilst the man was carrying out and putting in one box, which was sufficiently portable for the gig, Manston still thought, as his eyes watched the process. But for my wife, Springgrove might have been my rival. He examined the lamps of his gig, carefully laid out the reins, mounted the seat and drove along the turnpike road towards Knapwater Park. The exact locality of the fire was plain to him as he neared home. He soon could hear the shout of men, the flapping of the flames, the crackling of burning wood, and could smell the smoke from the conflagration. Of a sudden, a few yards ahead, within the compass of the rays from the right-hand lamp, burst forward the figure of a man. Having been walking in darkness the newcomer raised his hands to his eyes, on approaching nearer, to screen them from the glare of the reflector. Manston saw that he was one of the villagers, a small farmer originally, who had drunk himself down to a day laborer and reputed poacher. Hoy cried Manston, aloud, that the man might step aside out of the way. Is that Mr. Manston? said the man. Yes. Somebody ha come to carry Ford, and the rest of it may concern you, sir. Well, well. Did you expect Mrs. Manston tonight, sir? Yes, unfortunately she's come, I know, and asleep long before this time, I suppose. The laborer leant his elbow upon the shaft of the gig and turned his face, pale and sweating from his late work at the fire, up to Manston's. Yes, she did come, he said. I beg pardon, sir, but I should be glad of of. What? Glad of a trifle for Bringen yet the news. Not a farthing I didn't want your news. I knew she was come. Won't you give me a shillin', sir? Certainly not. Then will you lend me a shillin', sir? I be tired out, and don't know what to do. If I don't pay you back some day I'll be dd. The devil is so cheated that perdition isn't worth a penny as a security. Oh. Let me go on, said Manston. Thy wife is dead, that's the rest o' oh, the news, said the laborer slowly. He waited for a reply, none came. She went to the three tranters, because she couldn't get into the house, the burnin' roof fell in upon her before she could be called up, and she's a cinder, as thou lt be some day. That will do, let me drive on, said the steward calmly. Expectation of a concussion may be so intense that its failure strikes the brain with more force than its fulfillment. The laborer sank back into the ditch. Such a cushy could not realize the possibility of such an unmoved David as this. Manston drove hastily to the turning of the road, tied his horse, and ran on foot to the site of the fire. The stagnation caused by the awful accident had been passed through, and all hands were helping to remove from the remaining cottage what furniture they could lay hold of, the thatch of the roofs being already on fire. The Knapwater fire engine had arrived on the spot, but it was small, and ineffectual. A group was collected round the rector, 
who in a coat which had become bespattered, scorched and torn in his exertions, was directing on one hand the proceedings relative to the removal of goods into the church, and with the other was pointing out the spot on which it was most desirable that the puny engines at their disposal should be made to play. Every tongue was instantly silent at the sight of Manston's pale and clear countenance, which contrasted strangely with the grimy and streaming faces of the toiling villagers. Was she burnt? he said in a firm though husky voice, and stepping into the illuminated area. The rector came to him, and took him aside. Is she burnt? repeated Manston. She is dead, but thank God, she was spared the horrid agony of burning, the rector said solemnly, the roof and gable fell in upon her, and crushed her. Instant death must have followed. Why was she here? said Manston. From what we can hurriedly collect, it seems that she found the door of your house locked, and concluded that you had retired, the fact being that your servant, Mrs. Cricket, had gone out to supper. She then came back to the inn and went to bed. Where's the landlord? said Manston. Mr. Springrove came up, walking feebly, and wrapped in a cloak, and corroborated the evidence given by the rector. Did she look ill, or annoyed, when she came, said the steward. I can't say. I didn't see, but I think. What do you think? She was much put out about something. My not meeting her, naturally, murmured the other, lost in reverie. He turned his back on Springrove and the rector, and retired from the shining light. Everything had been done that could be done with the limited means at their disposal. The whole row of houses was destroyed, and each presented itself as one stage of a series, progressing from smoking ruins at the end where the inn had stood, to a partly flaming mass glowing as none but wood embers will glow at the other. A feature in the decline of town fires was noticeably absent here steam. There was present what is not observable in town's incandescence. The heat, and the smarting effect upon their eyes of the strong smoke from the burning oak and deal, had at last driven the villagers back from the road in front of the houses, and they now stood in groups in the churchyard, the surface of which, raised by the interments of generations, stood four or five feet above the level of the road, and almost even with the top of the low wall dividing one from the other. The headstones stood forth whitely against the dark grass and yews, their brightness being repeated on the white smock frocks of some of the laborers, and in a mellower, ruddier form on their faces and hands, on those of the grinning gargoyles, and on other salient stonework of the weather-beaten church in the background. The rector had decided that, under the distressing circumstances of the case, there would be no sacrilege in placing in the church, for the night, the pieces of furniture and utensils which had been saved from the several houses. There was no other place of safety for them, and they accordingly were gathered there. Half past twelve to one a.m. Manston, when he retired to meditate, had walked round the churchyard, and now entered the open door of the building. He mechanically pursued his way round the piers into his own seat in the north aisle. The lower atmosphere of this spot was shaded by its own wall from the shine which streamed in over the window sills on the same side. The only light burning inside the church was a small tallow candle, standing in the font, in the opposite aisle of the building to that in which Manston had sat down, and near where the furniture was piled. The candle's mild rays were overpowered by the ruddier light from the ruins, making the weak flame to appear like the moon by day. Sitting there he saw Farmer Springrove enter the door, followed by his son Edward, still carrying his traveling bag in his hand. They were speaking of the sad death of Mrs. Manston, but the subject was relinquished for that of the houses burnt. This row of houses, running from the inn eastward, had been built under the following circumstances. Fifty years before this date, the spot upon which the cottages afterwards stood was a blank strip, along the side of the village street, difficult to cultivate, on account of the outcrop thereon of a large bed of flints called locally a lanch or lanchet. The Aldclyffe then in possession of the estate conceived the idea that a row of cottages would be an improvement to the spot, and accordingly granted leases of portions to several respectable inhabitants. Each lessee was to be subject to the payment of a merely nominal rent for the whole term of lives, on condition that he built his own cottage, and delivered it up intact at the end of the term. Those who had built had, one by one, 
relinquished their indentures, either by sale or barter, to Farmer Springgrove's father. New lives were added in some cases, by payment of a sum to the lord of the manor, etc., and all the leases were now held by the farmer himself, as one of the chief provisions for his old age. The steward had become interested in the following conversation. Try not to be so depressed, father, they are all injured. The words came from Edward in an anxious tone. You mistake, Edward, they are not injured, returned the old man gloomily. Not, the son asked. Not one said the farmer. In the helmet fire office, surely. They were insured there every one. Six months ago the office, which had been raising the premiums on thatched premises higher for some years, gave up insuring them altogether, as two or three other fire offices had done previously, on account, they said, of the uncertainty and greatness of the risk of thatch undetached. Ever since then I have been continually intending to go to another office, but have never gone. Who expects a fire? Do you remember the terms of the leases, said Edward, still more uneasily. No, not particularly, said his father absently. Where are they? In the bureau there, that's why I tried to save it first, among other things. Well, we must see to that at once. What do you want? The key. They went into the south aisle, took the candle from the font, and then proceeded to open the bureau, which had been placed in a corner under the gallery. Both leant over upon the flap, Edward holding the candle, whilst his father took the pieces of parchment from one of the drawers, and spread the first out before him. You read it, Ted. I can't see without my glasses. This one will be sufficient. The terms of all are the same. Edward took the parchment, and read quickly and indistinctly for some time, then aloud and slowly as follows. And the said John Springrove for himself his heirs executors and administrators doth covenant and agree with the said Gerald Felcourt Aldclyffe his heirs and assigns that he the said John Springrove his heirs and assigns during the said term shall pay unto the said Gerald Felcourt Aldclyffe his heirs and assigns the clear yearly rent of ten shillings and sixpence at the several times here and before appointed for the payment thereof respectively. And also shall and at all times during the said term well and sufficiently repair and keep the said cottage or dwelling house and all other the premises and all houses or buildings erected or to be erected thereupon in good and proper repair in every respect without exception and the said premises in such good repair upon the determination of this demise shall yield up unto the said Gerald Felcourt Aldclyffe his heirs and assigns. They closed the bureau and turned towards the door of the church without speaking. Manston also had come forward out of the gloom. Notwithstanding the farmer's own troubles, an instinctive respect and generous sense of sympathy with the steward for his awful loss caused the old man to step aside, that Manston might pass out without speaking to them if he chose to do so. Who is he? whispered Edward to his father, as Manston approached. M. R. Manston, the steward. Manston came near, and passed down the aisle on the side of the younger man. Their faces came almost close together, one large flame, which still lingered upon the ruins outside, threw long dancing shadows of each across the nave till they bent upwards against the aisle wall, and also illuminated their eyes, as each met those of the other. Edward had learnt, by a letter from home, of the steward's passion for Cytherea, and his mysterious repression of it afterwards explained by his marriage. That marriage was now not. Edward realized the man's newly acquired freedom, and felt an instinctive enmity towards him he would hardly own to himself why. The steward, too, knew Cytherea's attachment to Edward, and looked keenly and inscrutably at him. 1 to 2 a.m. Manston went homeward alone, his heart full of strange emotions. Entering the house, and dismissing the woman to her own home, he at once proceeded upstairs to his bedroom. Reasoning worldliness, especially when allied with sensuousness, cannot repress on some extreme occasions the human instinct to pour out the soul to some being or personality, who in frigid moments is dismissed with the title of chance, or at most law. Manston was selfishly and inhumanly, but honestly and unutterably, thankful for the recent catastrophe. Beside his bed, for that first time during a period of nearly twenty years, 
he fell down upon his knees in a passionate outburst of feeling. Many minutes passed before he arose. He walked to the window, and then seemed to remember for the first time that some action on his part was necessary in connection with the sad circumstance of the night. Leaving the house at once, he went to the scene of the fire, arriving there in time to hear the rector making an arrangement with a certain number of men to watch the spot till morning. The ashes were still red-hot and flaming. Manston found that nothing could be done towards searching them at that hour of the night. He turned homeward again, in the company of the rector, who had considerately persuaded him to retire from the scene for a while, and promised that as soon as a man could live amid the embers of the three tranters in, they should be carefully searched for the remains of his unfortunate wife. Manston then went indoors, to wait for morning. 11 The Events of Five Days November the 29th The search began at dawn, but a quarter past nine o'clock came without bringing any result. Manston ate a little breakfast, and crossed the hollow of the park which intervened between the old and modern manor houses, to ask for an interview with Miss Aldclyffe. He met her midway. She was about to pay him a visit of condolence, and to place every man on the estate at his disposal, that the search for any relic of his dead and destroyed wife might not be delayed an instant. He accompanied her back to the house. At first they conversed as if the death of the poor woman was an event which the husband must of necessity deeply lament, and when all under this head that social form seemed to require had been uttered, they spoke of the material damage done, and of the steps which had better be taken to remedy it. It was not till both were shut inside her private room that she spoke to him in her blunt and cynical manner. A certain newness of bearing in him, peculiar to the present morning, had hitherto forbidden her this tone, the demeanor of the subject of her favoritism had altered, she could not tell in what way. He was entirely a changed man. Are you really sorry for your poor wife, Mr. Manston, she said. Well, I am, he answered shortly but only as for any human being who has met with a violent death. He confessed it for she was not a good woman, he added. I should be sorry to say such a thing now the poor creature is dead, Miss Aldclyffe returned reproachfully. Why, he asked. Why should I praise her if she doesn't deserve it? I say exactly what I have often admired Stern for saying in one of his letters that neither reason nor scripture asks us to speak nothing but good of the dead. And now, Madam, he continued, after a short interval of thought, I may, perhaps, hope that you will assist me, or rather not thwart me, in endeavouring to win the love of a young lady living about you, one in whom I am much interested already. Cytherea. Yes, Cytherea. You have been loving Cytherea all the while. Yes. Surprise was a preface to much agitation in her, which caused her to rise from her seat and paced to the side of the room. The steward quietly looked on and added, I have been loving and still love her. She came close up to him, wistfully contemplating his face, one hand moving indecisively at her side. And your secret marriage was, then, the true and only reason for that backwardness regarding the courtship of Cytherea, which, they tell me, has been the talk of the village, not your indifference to her attractions. Her voice had a tone of conviction in it, as well as of inquiry, but none of jealousy. Yes, he said, and not a dishonorable one. What held me back was just that one thing a sense of morality that perhaps, madam, you did not give me credit for. The latter words were spoken with a mean and tone of pride. Miss Aldclyffe preserved silence. And now, he went on, I may as well say a word in vindication of my conduct lately at the risk, too, of offending you. My actual motive in submitting to your order that I should send for my late wife, and live with her, was not the mercenary policy of wishing to retain an office which brings me greater comforts than any I have enjoyed before, but this unquenchable passion for Cytherea. Though I saw the weakness, folly and even wickedness of it continually, it still forced me to try to continue near her, even as the husband of another woman. He waited for her to speak she did not. There's a great obstacle to my making any way in winning Miss Gray's love, he went on. Yes, Edward Springrove, she said quietly. I know it, I did once want to see them married, they have had a slight quarrel, 
and it will soon be made up again, unless she spoke as if she had only half attended to Manston's last statement. He is already engaged to be married to somebody else, said the steward. Who said she, you mean to his cousin at Peak Hill, that's nothing to help us, he's now come home to break it off. He must not break it off, said Manston, firmly and calmly. His tone attracted her, startled her. Recovering herself, she said haughtily, Well, that's your affair, not mine. Though my wish has been to see her your wife, I can't do anything dishonorable to bring about such a result. But it must be made your affair, he said in a hard, steady voice, looking into her eyes as if he saw there the whole panorama of her past. One of the most difficult things to portray by written words is that peculiar mixture of moods expressed in a woman's countenance when, after having been sedulously engaged in establishing another's position, she suddenly suspects him of undermining her own. It was thus that Miss Aldclyffe looked at the steward. You know something of me, she faltered. I know all, he said. Then curse that wife of yours she wrote and said she wouldn't tell you she burst out. Couldn't she keep her word for a day? She reflected and then said, but no more as to a stranger, I will not yield. I have committed no crime. I yielded to her threats in a moment of weakness, though I felt inclined to defy her at the time, it was chiefly because I was mystified as to how she got to know of it. Who I will put up with threats no more. Oh, can you threaten me? she added softly, as if she had for the moment forgotten to whom she had been speaking. My love must be made your affair, he repeated, without taking his eyes from her. An agony, which was not the agony of being discovered in a secret, obstructed her utterance for a time. How can you turn upon me so when I schemed to get you here schemed that you might win her till I found you were married? Oh, how can you oh? Oh she wept and the weeping of such a nature was as harrowing as the weeping of a man. Your getting me here was bad policy as to your secret the most absurd thing in the world, he said, not heeding her distress. I knew all, except the identity of the individual, long ago. Directly I found that my coming here was a contrived thing, and not a matter of chance, it fixed my attention upon you at once. All that was required was the mere spark of life to make of a bundle of perceptions an organic whole. Policy, how can you talk of policy? Think, do think, and how can you threaten me when you know you know that I would befriend you readily without a threat? Yes, yes, I think you would, he said more kindly, but your indifference for so many, many years has made me doubt it. No, not indifference t'was enforced silence. My father lived. He took her hand and held it gently. Now listen, he said, more quietly and humanly, when she had become calmer, Spring Grove must marry the woman he's engaged to. You may make him, but only in one way. Well, but don't speak sternly, Aeneas. Do you know that his father has not been particularly thriving for the last two or three years? I have heard something of it, once or twice, though his rents have been promptly paid, haven't they? Oh yes, and do you know the terms of the leases of the houses which are burnt, he said, explaining to her that by those terms she might compel him even to rebuild every house. The case is the clearest case of fire by negligence that I have ever known, in addition to that, he continued. I don't want them rebuilt, you know it was intended by my father, directly they fell in, to clear the site for a new entrance to the park. Yes, but that doesn't affect the position which is that Farmer Spring Grove is in your power to an extent which is very serious for him. I won't do it tis a conspiracy. Won't you for me, he said eagerly. Miss Aldclyffe changed color. I don't threaten now, I implore, he said. Because you might threaten if you chose, she mournfully answered. But why be so when your marriage with her was my own pet idea long before it was yours? What must I do? Scarcely anything, simply this. When I have seen old Mr. Springgrove, which I shall do in a day or two, and told him that he will be expected to rebuild the houses, do you see the young man? See him yourself, in order that the proposals made may not appear to be anything more than an impulse of your own. 
you or he will bring up the subject of the houses. To rebuild them would be a matter of at least six hundred pounds, and he will almost surely say that we are hard in insisting upon the extreme letter of the leases. Then tell him that scarcely can you yourself think of compelling an old tenant like his father to any such painful extreme there shall be no compulsion to build, simply a surrender of the leases. Then speak feelingly of his cousin, as a woman whom you respect and love, and whose secret you have learned to be that she is heart-sick with hope deferred. Beg him to marry her, his betrothed and your friend, as some return for your consideration towards his father. Don't suggest too early a day for their marriage, or he will suspect you of some motive beyond womanly sympathy. Coax him to make a promise to her that she shall be his wife at the end of a twelve-month, and get him, on assenting to this, to write to Cytherea, entirely renouncing her. She has already asked him to do that. So much the better in telling her, too, that he is about to fulfill his long-standing promise to marry his cousin. If you think it worthwhile, you may say Cytherea was not indisposed to think of me before she knew I was married. I have at home a note she wrote me the first evening I saw her, which looks rather warm, and which I could show you. Trust me, he will give her up. When he is married to Adelaide Hinton, Cytherea will be induced to marry me perhaps before, a woman's pride is soon wounded. And hadn't I better write to Mr. Needleton, and inquire more particularly what's the law upon the houses? Oh no, there's no hurry for that. We know well enough how the case stands quite well enough to talk in general terms about it. And I want the pressure to be put upon young Springgrove before he goes away from home again. She looked at him furtively, long, and sadly, as after speaking he became lost in thought, his eyes listlessly tracing the pattern of the carpet. Yes, yes, she will be mine, he whispered, careless of Cytherea Aldclyffe's presence. At last he raised his eyes inquiringly. I will do my best, Aeneas, she answered. Talibus incusat. Manston then left the house, and again went towards the blackened ruins, where men were still raking and probing. From November the 29th to December the 2nd. The smoldering remnants of the three Tranters and seemed to promise that, even when the searchers should light upon the remains of the unfortunate Mrs. Manston, very little would be discoverable. Consisting so largely of the charcoal and ashes of hard dry oak and chestnut, intermingled with thatch, the interior of the heap was one glowing mass of embers, which, on being stirred about, emitted sparks and flame long after it was dead and black on the outside. It was persistently hoped, however, that some traces of the body would survive the effect of the hot coals, and after a search pursued uninterruptedly for thirty hours, under the direction of Manston himself, enough was found to set at rest any doubts of her fate. The melancholy gleanings consisted of her watch, bunch of keys, a few coins, and two charred and blackened bones. Two days later the official inquiry into the cause of her death was held at the Rising Sun Inn, before Mr. Floyd, the coroner, and a jury of the chief inhabitants of the district. The little tavern the only remaining one in the village was crowded to excess by the neighboring peasantry as well as their richer employers, all who could by any possibility obtain an hour's release from their duties being present as listeners. The jury viewed the sad and infinitesimal remains, which were folded in a white cambric cloth, and laid in the middle of a well-finished coffin lined with white silk by Manston's order, which stood in an adjoining room, the bulk of the coffin being completely filled in with carefully arranged flowers and evergreens also the steward's own doing. Abraham Brown, of Hoxton, London an old white-headed man, without the ruddiness which makes white hairs so pleasing was sworn, and deposed that he kept a lodging house at an address he named. On a Saturday evening less than a month before the fire, a lady came to him, with very little luggage, and took the front room on the second floor. He did not inquire where she came from, as she paid a week in advance, but she gave her name as Mrs. Manston, referring him, if he wished for any guarantee of her respectability, to Mr. Manston, Knapwater Park. Here she lived for three weeks, rarely going out. She slept away from her lodgings one night during the time. At the end of that time, on the 28th of November, she left his house in a four-wheeled cab, about 12 o'clock in the day, telling the driver to take her to the Waterloo station. 
she paid all her lodging expenses, and not having given notice the full week previous to her going away, offered to pay for the next, but he only took half. She wore a thick black veil, and grey waterproof cloak, when she left him, and her luggage was two boxes, one of plain deal, with black japanned clamps, the other sewn up in canvas. Joseph Chinney, porter at the Carry Ford Road station, deposed that he saw Mrs. Manston, dressed as the last witness had described, get out of a second-class carriage on the night of the 28th. She stood beside him whilst her luggage was taken from the van. The luggage, consisting of the clamp deal box and another covered with canvas, was placed in the cloak room. She seemed at a loss at finding nobody there to meet her. She asked him for some person to accompany her, and carry her bag to Mr. Manston's house, Knapwater Park. He was just off duty at that time, and offered to go himself. The witness here repeated the conversation he had had with Mrs. Manston during their walk, and testified to having left her at the door of the three Tranters Inn, Mr. Manston's house being closed. Next, Farmer Springgrove was called. A murmur of surprise and commiseration passed round the crowded room when he stepped forward. The events of the few preceding days had so worked upon his nervously thoughtful nature that the blue orbits of his eyes, and the mere spot of scarlet to which the ruddiness of his cheeks had contracted, seemed the result of a heavy sickness. A perfect silence pervaded the assembly when he spoke. His statement was that he received Mrs. Manston at the threshold, and asked her to enter the parlour. She would not do so, and stood in the passage whilst the maid went upstairs to see that the room was in order. The maid came down to the middle landing of the staircase, when Mrs. Manston followed her up to the room. He did not speak ten words with her altogether. Afterwards, whilst he was standing at the door listening for his son Edward's return, he saw her light extinguished, having first caught sight of her shadow moving about the room. The coroner, did her shadow appear to be that of a woman undressing? Springgrove, I cannot say, as I didn't take particular notice. It moved backwards and forwards, she might have been undressing or merely pacing up and down the room. Mrs. Fittler, the ostler's wife and chambermaid, said that she preceded Mrs. Manston into the room, put down the candle, and went out. Mrs. Manston scarcely spoke to her, except to ask her to bring a little brandy. Witness went and fetched it from the bar, brought it up, and put it on the dressing table. The coroner, had Mrs. Manston begun to undress, when you came back? No, sir, she was sitting on the bed, with everything on, as when she came in. Did she begin to undress before you left? Not exactly before I had left, but when I had closed the door, and was on the landing I heard her boot drop on the floor, as it does sometimes when pulled off. Had her face appeared worn and sleepy? I cannot say as her bonnet and veil were still on when I left for she seemed rather shy and ashamed to be seen at the three tranters at all. And did you hear or see any more of her? No more, sir. Mrs. Cricket, temporary servant to Mr. Manston, said that in accordance with Mr. Manston's orders, everything had been made comfortable in the house for Mrs. Manston's expected return on Monday night. Mr. Manston told her that himself and Mrs. Manston would be home late, not till between eleven and twelve o'clock and that supper was to be ready. Not expecting Mrs. Manston so early, she had gone out on a very important errand to Mrs. Leet the postmistress. Mr. Manston deposed that in looking down the columns of Bradshaw he had mistaken the time of the train's arrival, and hence was not at the station when she came. The broken watch produced was his wife's he knew it by a scratch on the inner plate, and by other signs. The bunch of keys belonged to her two of them fitted the locks of her two boxes. Mr. Flux, agent to Lord Clay Donfield at Chetlawood, said that Mr. Manston had pleaded as his excuse for leaving him rather early in the evening after their day's business had been settled, that he was going to meet his wife at Carry Ford Road Station, where she was coming by the last train that night. The surgeon said that the remains were those of a human being. The small fragment seemed a portion of one of the lumbar vertebrae the other the head of the O.S. femoris but they were both so far gone that it was impossible to say definitely whether they belonged to the body of a male or female. There was no moral doubt that they were a woman's. 
he did not believe that death resulted from burning by fire. He thought she was crushed by the fall of the west gable, which being of wood, as well as the floor, burnt after it had fallen, and consumed the body with it. Two or three additional witnesses gave unimportant testimony. The coroner summed up, and the jury without hesitation found that the deceased Mrs. Manston came by her death accidentally through the burning of the three tranters in December the 2nd afternoon. When Mr. Springrove came from the door of the rising sun at the end of the inquiry, Manston walked by his side as far as the stile to the park, a distance of about a stone's throw. Ah, Mr. Springrove, this is a sad affair for everybody concerned. Everybody, said the old farmer, with deep sadness, tis quite a misery to me. I hardly know how I shall live through each day as it breaks. I think of the words, in the morning thou shalt say, would God it were even and at even thou shalt say, would God it were morning for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. His voice became broken. Ah true. I read Deuteronomy myself, said Manston. But my losses as nothing to yours, the farmer continued. Nothing, but I can commiserate you. I should be worse than unfeeling if I didn't, although my own affliction is of so sad and solemn a kind. Indeed my own loss makes me more keenly alive to yours, different in nature as it is. What sum do you think would be required of me to put the houses in place again? I have roughly thought six or seven hundred pounds. If the letter of the law is to be acted up to, said the old man, with more agitation in his voice. Yes, exactly. Do you know enough of Miss Aldclyffe's mind to give me an idea of how she means to treat me? Well, I am afraid I must tell you that though I know very little of her mind as a rule, in this matter I believe she will be rather peremptory, she might share to the extent of a sixth or an eighth perhaps, in consideration of her getting new lamps for old but I should hardly think more. The steward stepped upon the stile, and Mr. Springrove went along the road with a bowed head and heavy footsteps towards his niece's cottage, in which, rather against the wish of Edward, they had temporarily taken refuge. The additional weight of this knowledge soon made itself perceptible. Though indoors with Edward or Adelaide nearly the whole of the afternoon, nothing more than monosyllabic replies could be drawn from him. Edward continually discovered him looking fixedly at the wall or floor, quite unconscious of another's presence. At supper he ate just as usual, but quite mechanically, and with the same abstraction. December the 3rd The next morning he was in no better spirits. Afternoon came, his son was alarmed, and managed to draw from him an account of the conversation with the steward. Nonsense, he knows nothing about it, said Edward vehemently. I'll see Miss Aldclyffe myself. Now promise me, father, that you'll not believe till I come back, and tell you to believe it, that Miss Aldclyffe will do any such unjust thing. Edward started at once for Knapwater House. He strode rapidly along the high road, till he reached a wicket where a footpath allowed of a short cut to the mansion. Here he leant down upon the bars for a few minutes, meditating as to the best manner of opening his speech and surveying the scene before him in that absent mood which takes cognizance of little things without being conscious of them at the time, though they appear in the eye afterwards as vivid impressions. It was a yellow, lustrous, late autumn day, one of those days of the quarter when morning and evening seem to meet together without the intervention of a noon. The clear yellow sunlight had tempted forth Miss Aldclyffe herself, who was at this same time taking a walk in the direction of the village. As Springgrove lingered he heard behind the plantation a woman's dress brushing along amid the prickly husks and leaves which had fallen into the path from the boughs of the chestnut trees. In another minute she stood in front of him. He answered her casual greeting respectfully, and was about to request a few minutes' conversation with her, when she directly addressed him on the subject of the fire. It is a sad misfortune for your father, she said, and I hear that he has lately let his insurances expire. He has, madam, and you are probably aware that either by the general terms of his holding, or the same coupled with the origin of the fire, the disaster may involve the necessity of his rebuilding the whole row of houses, or else of becoming a debtor to the estate, to the extent of some hundreds of pounds. She assented. 
I have been thinking of it, she went on, and then repeated in substance the words put into her mouth by the steward. Some disturbance of thought might have been fancied as taking place in Springrove's mind during her statement, but before she had reached the end, his eyes were clear, and directed upon her. I don't accept your conditions of release, he said. They are not conditions exactly. Well, whatever they are not, they are very uncalled for remarks. Not at all the houses have been burnt by your family's negligence. I don't refer to the houses you have of course the best of all rights to speak of that matter, but you, a stranger to me comparatively, have no right at all to volunteer opinions and wishes upon a very delicate subject, which concerns no living beings but Miss Gray, Miss Hinton, and myself. Miss Aldclyffe, like a good many others in her position, had plainly not realized that a son of her tenant and inferior could have become an educated man, who had learned to feel his individuality, to view society from a bohemian standpoint, far outside the farming grade in Carry Ford Parish, and that hence he had all a developed man's unorthodox opinion about the subordination of classes. And fully conscious of the labyrinth into which he had wandered between his wish to behave honorably in the dilemma of his engagement to his cousin Adelaide and the intensity of his love for Cytherea, Springgrove was additionally sensitive to any allusion to the case. He had spoken to Miss Aldclyffe with considerable warmth. And Miss Aldclyffe was not a woman likely to be far behind any second person in warming to a mood of defiance. It seemed as if she were prepared to put up with a cold refusal, but that her haughtiness resented a criticism of her conduct ending in a rebuke. By this, Manston's discreditable object, which had been made hers by compulsion only, was now adopted by choice. She flung herself into the work. A fiery man in such a case would have relinquished persuasion and tried palpable force. A fiery woman added unscrupulousness and evolved daring strategy, and in her obstinacy, and to sustain herself as mistress, she descended to an action the meanness of which haunted her conscience to her dying hour. I don't quite see, Mr. Springrove, she said that I am altogether what you are pleased to call a stranger. I have known your family, at any rate, for a good many years, and I know Miss Gray particularly well, and her state of mind with regard to this matter. Perplexed love makes us credulous and curious as old women. Edward was willing, he owned it to himself, to get at Cytherea's state of mind, even through so dangerous a medium. A letter I received from her he said, with assumed coldness, tells me clearly enough what Miss Gray's mind is. You think she still loves you? Oh yes, of course you do all men are like that. I have reason to. He could feign no further than the first speech. I should be interested in knowing what reason, she said, with sarcastic archness. Edward felt he was allowing her to do, in fractional parts, what he rebelled against when regarding it as a whole but the fact that his antagonist had the presence of a queen, and features only in the early evening of their beauty, was not without its influence upon a keenly conscious man. Her bearing had charmed him into toleration, as Mary Stuart's charmed the indignant Puritan visitors. He again answered her honestly. The best of reasons the tone of her letter. Pooh, Mr. Springrove. Not at all. Miss Aldclyffe Miss Gray desired that we should be strangers to each other for the simple practical reason that intimacy could only make wretched complications worse, not from lack of love love is only suppressed. Don't you know yet, that in thus putting aside a man, a woman's pity for the pain she inflicts gives her a kindness of tone which is often mistaken for suppressed love, said Miss Aldclyffe, with soft insidiousness. This was a translation of the ambiguity of Cytherea's tone which he had certainly never thought of, and he was too ingenuous not to own it. I had never thought of it, he said. And don't believe it. Not unless there was some other evidence to support the view. She paused a minute and then began hesitatingly. My intention was what I did not dream of owning to you my intention was to try to induce you to fulfill your promise to Miss Hinton not solely on her account and yours though partly. I love Cytherea Gray with all my soul, and I want to see her happy even more than I do you. I did not mean to drag her name into the affair at all, but I am driven to say that she wrote that letter of dismissal to you for it was a most pronounced dismissal not on account of your engagement. 
she is old enough to know that engagements can be broken as easily as they can be made. She wrote it because she loved another man, very suddenly, and not with any idea or hope of marrying him, but nonetheless deeply. Who? M. R. Manston. Good I can't listen to you for an instant, madam, why, she hadn't seen him. She had, he came here the day before she wrote to you, and I could prove to you, if it were worthwhile, that on that day she went voluntarily to his house, though not artfully or blamably, stayed for two hours playing and singing, that no sooner did she leave him than she went straight home, and wrote the letter saying she should not see you again, entirely because she had seen him and fallen desperately in love with him a perfectly natural thing for a young girl to do, considering that he's the handsomest man in the county. Why else should she not have written to you before? Because I was such a because she did not know of the connection between me and my cousin until then. I must think she did. On what ground? On the strong ground of my having told her so, distinctly, the very first day she came to live with me. Well, what do you seek to impress upon me after all? This that the day Miss Gray wrote to me, saying it was better that we should part, coincided with the day she had seen a certain man. A remarkably handsome and talented man. Yes, I admit that. And that it coincided with the hour just subsequent to her seeing him. Yes, just when she had seen him. And been to his house alone with him. It is nothing. And stayed there playing and singing with him. Admit that, too, he said an accident might have caused it. And at the same instant that she wrote your dismissal she wrote a letter referring to a secret appointment with him. Never, by God, madam never. What do you say, sir? Never. She sneered. There's no accounting for beliefs, and the whole history is a very trivial matter, but I am resolved to prove that a lady's word is truthful, though upon a matter which concerns neither you nor herself. You shall learn that she did write him a letter concerning an assignation that is, if Mr. Manston still has it, and will be considerate enough to lend it me. But besides, continued Edward, a married man to do what would cause a young girl to write a note of the kind you mention. She flushed a little. That I don't know anything about, she stammered. But Cytheria didn't, of course, dream any more than I did, or others in the parish, that he was married. Of course she didn't. And I have reason to believe that he told her of the fact directly afterwards, that she might not compromise herself, or allow him to. It is notorious that he struggled honestly and hard against her attractions, and succeeded in hiding his feelings, if not in quenching them. We'll hope that he did. But circumstances are changed now. Very greatly changed, he murmured abstractedly. You must remember, she added more suasively, that Miss Gray has a perfect right to do what she likes with her own her heart, that is to say. Her descent from irritation was caused by perceiving that Edward's faith was really disturbed by her strong assertions, and it gratified her. Edward's thoughts flew to his father, and the object of his interview with her. Tongue fencing was utterly distasteful to him. I will not trouble you by remaining longer, madam, he remarked, gloomily. Our conversation has ended sadly for me. Don't think so, she said, and don't be mistaken. I am older than you are, many years older, and I know many things. Full of miserable doubt, and bitterly regretting that he had raised his father's expectations by anticipations impossible of fulfillment, Edward slowly went his way into the village, and approached his cousin's house. The farmer was at the door looking eagerly for him. He had been waiting there for more than half an hour. His eye kindled quickly. Well, Ted, what does she say, he asked, in the intensely sanguine tones which fall sadly upon a listener's ear, because, antecedently, they raise pictures of inevitable disappointment for the speaker, in some direction or another. Nothing for us to be alarmed at, said Edward, with a forced cheerfulness. But must we rebuild? It seems we must father. The old man's eyes swept the horizon, then he turned to go in, without making another observation. All light seemed extinguished in him again. When Edward went in he found his father with the bureau open, 
unfolding the leases with a shaking hand, folding them up again without reading them, then putting them in their niche only to remove them again. Adelaide was in the room. She said thoughtfully to Edward, as she watched the farmer. I hope it won't kill poor uncle, Edward. What should we do if anything were to happen to him? He is the only near relative you and I have in the world. It was perfectly true, and somehow Edward felt more bound up with her after that remark. She continued, and he was only saying so hopefully the day before the fire, that he wouldn't for the world let anyone else give me away to you when we are married. For the first time a conscientious doubt arose in Edward's mind as to the justice of the course he was pursuing in resolving to refuse the alternative offered by Miss Aldclyffe. Could it be selfishness as well as independence? How much he had thought of his own heart, how little he had thought of his father's peace of mind. The old man did not speak again till supper time, when he began asking his son an endless number of hypothetical questions on what might induce Miss Aldclyffe to listen to kinder terms speaking of her now not as an unfair woman, but as a lachesis or fate whose course it behoved nobody to condemn. In his earnestness he once turned his eyes on Edward's face, their expression was woeful, the pupils were dilated and strange in aspect. If she will only agree to that he reiterated for the hundredth time, increasing the sadness of his listeners. An aristocratic knocking came to the door, and Jane entered with a letter, addressed. M. R. Edward Springrove. Jr. Charles from Knapp Waterhouse brought it, she said. Miss Aldclyffe's writing, said Mr. Springrove, before Edward had recognized it himself. Now it is all right, she's going to make an offer, she doesn't want the houses there, not she, they are going to make that the way into the park. Edward opened the seal and glanced at the inside. He said, with a supreme effort of self-command. It is only directed by Miss Aldclyffe, and refers to nothing connected with the fire. I wonder at her taking the trouble to send it tonight. His father looked absently at him and turned away again. Shortly afterwards they retired for the night. Alone in his bedroom Edward opened and read what he had not dared to refer to in their presence. The envelope contained another envelope in Cytheria's handwriting, addressed to Manston, ESQ, Old Manor House. Inside this was the note she had written to the steward after her detention in his house by the thunderstorm. Knapwater House September th. I find I cannot meet you at seven o'clock by the waterfall as I promised. The emotion I felt made me forgetful of realities. C. Gray Miss Aldclyffe had not written a line, and, by the unvarying rule observable when words are not an absolute necessity, her silence seemed ten times as convincing as any expression of opinion could have been. He then, step by step, recalled all the conversation on the subject of Cytheria's feelings that had passed between himself and Miss Aldclyffe in the afternoon, and by a confusion of thought, natural enough under the trying experience, concluded that because the lady was truthful in her portraiture of effects, she must necessarily be right in her assumption of causes. That is, he was convinced that Cytheria the hitherto believed faithful Cytheria had, at any rate, looked with something more than indifference upon the extremely handsome face and form of Manston. Did he blame her, as guilty of the impropriety of allowing herself to love the newcomer in the face of his not being free to return her love? No, never for a moment did he doubt that all had occurred in her old, innocent, impulsive way, that her heart was gone before she knew it before she knew anything beyond his existence, of the man to whom it had flown. Perhaps the very note enclosed to him was the result of first reflection. Manston he would unhesitatingly have called a scoundrel, but for one strikingly redeeming fact. It had been patent to the whole parish, and had come to Edward's own knowledge by that indirect channel, that Manston, as a married man, conscientiously avoided Cytheria after those first few days of his arrival during which her irresistibly beautiful and fatal glances had rested upon him his upon her. Taking from his coat a creased and pocket-worn envelope containing Cytheria's letter to himself, Springrove opened it and read it through. He was upbraided therein, and he was dismissed. It bore the date of the letter sent to Manston, and by containing within it the phrase, All the day long I have been thinking, 
afforded justifiable ground for assuming that it was written subsequently to the other and in Edward's sight far sweeter one to the steward. But though he accused her of fickleness, he would not doubt the genuineness, in its kind, of her partiality for him at Budmouth. It was a short and shallow feeling not perfect love. Love is not love. Which alters when it alteration finds. But it was not flirtation, a feeling had been born in her and had died. It would be well for his peace of mind if his love for her could flit away so softly, and leave so few traces behind. Miss Aldclyffe had shown herself desperately concerned in the whole matter by the alacrity with which she had obtained the letter from Manston, and her labours to induce himself to marry his cousin. Taken in connection with her apparent interest in, if not love for, Cytheria, her eagerness, too, could only be accounted for on the ground that Cytheria indeed loved the steward. December the 4th. Edward passed the night he scarcely knew how, tossing feverishly from side to side, the blood throbbing in his temples, and singing in his ears. Before the day began to break he dressed himself. On going out upon the landing he found his father's bedroom door already open. Edward concluded that the old man had risen softly, as was his wont, and gone out into the fields to start the laborers. But neither of the outer doors was unfastened. He entered the front room, and found it empty. Then animated by a new idea, he went round to the little back parlor, in which the few wrecks saved from the fire were deposited, and looked in at the door. Here, near the window, the shutters of which had been opened halfway, he saw his father leaning on the bureau, his elbows resting on the flap, his body nearly doubled, his hands clasping his forehead. Beside him were ghostly-looking square folds of parchment the leases of the houses destroyed. His father looked up when Edward entered, and wearily spoke to the young man as his face came into the faint light. Edward, why did you get up so early? I was uneasy, and could not sleep. The farmer turned again to the leases on the bureau, and seemed to become lost in reflection. In a minute or two, without lifting his eyes, he said. This is more than we can bear, Ted more than we can bear Ted, this will kill me. Not the loss only the sense of my neglect about the insurance and everything. Borrow I never will. Tis all misery now. God help us all misery now. Edward did not answer, continuing to look fixedly at the dreary daylight outside. Ted, the farmer went on, this upset of be and burnt out oh home makes me very nervous and doubtful about everything. There's this troubles me besides our livin' here with your cousin, and fillin' up her house. It must be very awkward for her. But she says she doesn't mind. Have you said anything to her lately about when you are going to marry her? Nothing at all lately. Well, perhaps you may as well, now we are so mixed in together. You know, no time has ever been mentioned to her at all, first or last, and I think it right that now. Since she has waited so patiently and so long you are almost called upon to say you are ready. It would simplify matters very much, if you were to walk up to church wi her one of these mornings, get the thing done, and go on live and here as we are. If you don't I must get a house all the sooner. It would lighten my mind, too, about the two little freeholds over the hill not a morsel apiece, divided as they were between her mother and me, but a tidy bit tied together again. Just think about it, will ya, Ted? He stopped from exhaustion produced by the intense concentration of his mind upon the weary subject, and looked anxiously at his son. Yes, I will, said Edward. But I am going to see her of the great house this morning, the farmer went on, his thoughts reverting to the old subject. I must know the rights of the matter, the when and the where. I don't like seeing her, but I'd rather talk to her than the steward. I wonder what she'll say to me. The younger man knew exactly what she would say. If his father asked her what he was to do, and when, she would simply refer him to Manston, her character was not that of a woman who shrank from a proposition she had once laid down. If his father were to say to her that his son had at last resolved to marry his cousin within the year, and had given her a promise to that effect, she would say, M. R. Springrove, the houses are burnt, we'll let them go trouble no more about them. His mind was already made up. He said calmly, Father, 
when you are talking to Miss Aldclyffe, mention to her that I have asked Adelaide if she is willing to marry me next Christmas. She is interested in my union with Adelaide, and the news will be welcome to her. And yet she can be iron with reference to me and her property, the farmer murmured. Very well, Ted, I'll tell her. December the 5th Of the many contradictory particulars constituting a woman's heart, two had shown their vigorous contrast in Cytheria's bosom just at this time. It was a dark morning, the morning after old Mr. Springrove's visit to Miss Aldclyffe, which had terminated as Edward had intended. Having risen an hour earlier than was usual with her, Cytheria sat at the window of an elegant little sitting room on the ground floor, which had been appropriated to her by the kindness or whim of Miss Aldclyffe, that she might not be driven into that lady's presence against her will. She leant with her face on her hand, looking out into the gloomy grey air. A yellow glimmer from the flapping flame of the newly lit fire fluttered on one side of her face and neck like a butterfly about to settle there, contrasting warmly with the other side of the same fair face, which received from the window the faint cold morning light, so weak that her shadow from the fire had a distinct outline on the window shutter in spite of it. There the shadow danced like a demon, blue and grim. The contradiction alluded to was that in spite of the decisive mood which two months earlier in the year had caused her to write a peremptory and final letter to Edward, she was now hoping for some answer other than the only possible one a man who, as she held, did not love her wildly, could send to such a communication. For a lover who did love wildly, she had left one little loophole in her otherwise straightforward epistle. Why she expected the letter on some morning of this particular week was, that hearing of his return to carry Ford, she fondly assumed that he meant to ask for an interview before he left. Hence it was, too, that for the last few days, she had not been able to keep in bed later than the time of the postman's arrival. The clock pointed to half past seven. She saw the postman emerge from beneath the bare boughs of the park trees, come through the wicket, dive through the shrubbery, reappear on the lawn, stalk across it without reference to paths as country postmen do and come to the porch. She heard him fling the bag down on the seat, and turn away towards the village, without hindering himself for a single pace. Then the butler opened the door, took up the bag, brought it in, and carried it up the staircase to place it on the slab by Miss Aldclyffe's dressing room door. The whole proceeding had been depicted by sounds. She had a presentiment that her letter was in the bag at last. She thought then in diminishing pulsations of confidence, he asks to see me perhaps he asks to see me, I hope he asks to see me. A quarter to eight, Miss Aldclyffe's bell rather earlier than usual. She must have heard the post bag brought, said the maiden, as, tired of the chilly prospect outside, she turned to the fire, and drew imaginative pictures of her future therein. A tap came to the door, and the lady's maid entered. Miss Aldclyffe is awake, she said, and she asked if you were moving yet, Miss. I'll run up to her, said Cytheria, and flitted off with the utterance of the words. Very fortunate this, she thought, I shall see what is in the bag this morning all the sooner. She took it up from the side table, went into Miss Aldclyffe's bedroom, pulled up the blinds, and looked round upon the lady in bed calculating the minutes that must elapse before she looked at her letters. Well, darling, how are you? I am glad you have come in to see me, said Miss Aldclyffe. You can unlock the bag this morning, child, if you like, she continued, yawning factitiously. Strange Cytheria thought, it seems as if she knew there was likely to be a letter for me. From her bed Miss Aldclyffe watched the girl's face as she tremblingly opened the post bag and found there an envelope addressed to her in Edward's handwriting, one he had written the day before, after the decision he had come to on an impartial, and on that account torturing, survey of his own, his father's, his cousin Adelaide's, and what he believed to be Cytheria's, position. The haughty mistress's soul sickened remorsefully within her when she saw suddenly appear upon the speaking countenance of the young lady before her a wan desolate look of agony. The master sentences of Edward's letter were these, You speak truly. That we never meet again is the wisest and only proper course. That I regret the past as much as you do yourself, it is hardly necessary for me to say. End of Part 1